This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on February 28, 2006. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Sixth London Edition by Charles Darwin. Chapter 7. Miscellaneous Objections to the Theory of Natural Selection. Longevity. Modifications not necessarily simultaneous. Modifications apparently of no direct service progressive development, characters of small functional importance, the most constant, supposed incompetence of natural selection to account for the incipient stages of useful structures, causes which interfere with the acquisition through natural selection of useful structures, gradations of structure with changed functions, widely different organs in members of the same class, developed from one and the same source, reasons for disbelieving in great and abrupt modifications. I will devote this chapter to the consideration of various miscellaneous objections which have been advanced against my own views, as some of the previous discussions may thus be made clearer. But it would be useless to discuss all of them as many have been made by writers who have not taken the trouble to understand the subject. Thus a distinguished German naturalist has asserted that the weakest part of my theory is that I consider all organic beings as imperfect. What I have really said is that all are not as perfect as they might have been in relation to their conditions, and this is shown to be the case by so many native forms in many quarters of the world having yielded their places to intruding foreigners. Nor can organic beings, even if they were at any one time perfectly adapted to their conditions of life, have remained so when their conditions changed, unless they themselves likewise changed and no one will dispute that the physical conditions of each country, as well as the number and kinds of its inhabitants, have undergone many mutations. A critic has lately insisted, with some parade of mathematical accuracy, that longevity is a great advantage to all species, so that he who believes in natural selection must arrange his genealogical tree in such a manner that all the descendants have longer lives than their progenitors. Cannot our critics conceive that a biennial plant or one of the lower animals might range into a cold climate and perish there every winter, and yet, owing to advantages gained through natural selection, survive from year to year by means of its seeds or ova? Mr. E. Ray Lancaster has recently discussed this subject, and he concludes, as far as its extreme complexity allows him to form a judgment, that longevity is generally related to the standard of each species in the scale of organization, as well as to the amount of expenditure in reproduction and in general activity. And these conditions have, it is probable, been largely determined through natural selection. It has been argued that, as none of the animals and plants of Egypt, of which we know anything, have changed during the last three or four thousand years, so probably have none in any part of the world. But, as Mr. G. H. Lewis has remarked, this line of argument proves too much, for the ancient domestic races figured on the Egyptian monuments or embalmed are closely similar or even identical with those now living. Yet all naturalists admit that such races have been produced through the modification of their original types. The many animals which have remained unchanged since the commencement of the glacial period would have been an incomparably stronger case, for these have been exposed to great changes of climate and have migrated over great distances, whereas in Egypt, during the last several thousand years, the conditions of life, as far as we know, have remained absolutely uniform. The fact of little or no modification having been effected since the glacial period would have been of some avail against those who believe in an innate and necessary law of development, 
but it is powerless against the doctrine of natural selection, or the survival of the fittest, which implies that when variations or individual differences of a beneficial nature happen to arise, these will be preserved, but this will be effected only under certain favorable circumstances. The celebrated paleontologist Braun, at the close of his German translation of this work, asks how, on the principle of natural selection, can a variety live side by side with the parent species. If both have become fitted for slightly different habitats of life or conditions, they might live together, and if we lay on one side polymorphic species, in which the variability seems to be of a peculiar nature, and all mere temporary variations such as size, albinism, etc., the more permanent varieties are generally found, as far as I can discover, inhabiting distinct stations, such as highland or lowland, dry or moist districts. Moreover, in the case of animals which wander much about and cross freely, their varieties seem to be generally confined to distinct regions. Braun also insists that the distinct species never differ from each other in single characters, but in many parts, and he asks how it always comes that many parts of the organization should have been modified at the same time through variation and natural selection. But there is no necessity for supposing that all the parts of any being have been simultaneously modified. The most striking modifications, excellently adapted for some purpose, might, as was formerly remarked, be acquired by successive variations, if slight, first in one part and then in another, and, as they would be transmitted all together, they would appear to us as if they had been simultaneously developed. The best answer, however, to the above objection is afforded by those domestic races which have been modified, chiefly through man's power of selection, for some natural purpose. Look at the race and dray horse, or at the greyhound and mastiff. Their whole frames and even their mental characteristics have been modified. But if we could trace each step in the history of their transformation, and the latter steps can be traced, we should not see great and simultaneous changes, but first one part and then another, slightly modified and improved. Even when selection has been applied by man to some one character alone, of which our cultivated plants offer the best instances, it will invariably be found that, although this one part, whether it be flower, fruit, or leaves, has been greatly changed, almost all the other parts have been slightly modified. This may be attributed partly to the principle of correlated growth, and partly to so-called spontaneous variation. A much more serious objection has been urged by Braun, and recently by Broca, namely that many characters appear to be of no service whatsoever to their possessors, and therefore cannot have been influenced through natural selection. Braun adduces the length of the ears and tails of the different species of hares and mice, the complex folds of enamel in the teeth of many animals, and a multitude of analogous cases. With respect to plants, this subject has been discussed by Negley in an admirable essay. He admits that natural selection has affected much, but he insists that the families of plants differ chiefly from each other in morphological characters, which appear to be quite unimportant for the welfare of the species. He consequently believes in an innate tendency towards progressive and more perfect development. He specifies the arrangement of the cells in the tissues, and of the leaves on the axis, as cases in which natural selection could not have acted. To these may be added the numerical divisions in the parts of the flower, the position of the alveoles, the shape of the seed, when not of any use for dissemination, etc. There is much force in the above objection. Nevertheless, we ought in the first place to be extremely cautious in pretending to decide what structures now are, or have formerly been, of use to each species. In the second place, it should always be borne in mind that 
When one part is modified, so will be other parts, though certainly dimly seen causes such as increased or diminished flow of nutriment to a part, mutual pressure, an early developed part affecting one subsequently developed, and so forth, as well as through other causes which lead to the many mysterious cases of correlation, which we do not in the least understand. These agencies may be all grouped together, for the sake of brevity, under the expression of the laws of growth. In the third place, we have to allow for the direct and definite action of changed conditions of life, and for so-called spontaneous variations, in which the nature of the conditions apparently plays quite a subordinate part. Bud variations, such as the appearance of a moss rose on a common rose, or of a nectarine on a peach tree, offer good instances of spontaneous variations. But even in these cases, if we bear in mind the power of a minute drop of poison in producing complex galls, we ought not to feel too sure that the above variations are not the effect of some local change in the nature of the sap due to some change in the conditions. There must be some efficient cause for each slight individual difference, as well as for the more strongly marked variations which occasionally arise. And if the unknown cause were to act persistently, it is almost certain that all the individuals of the species would be similarly modified. In the earlier editions of this work I underrated as it now seems probable, the frequency and importance of modifications due to spontaneous variability. But it is impossible to attribute to this cause the innumerable structures which are so well adapted to the habits of life of each species. I can no more believe in this than that the well-adapted form of a racehorse or greyhound, which before the principle of selection by man was well understood, excited so much surprise in the minds of older naturalists, can thus be explained. It may be worth while to illustrate some of the foregoing remarks. With respect to the assumed inutility of various plants and organs, it is hardly necessary to observe that even in the higher and best-known animals many structures exist, which are so highly developed that no one doubts that they are of importance, yet their use has not been, or has only recently been, ascertained. As Braun gives the length of the ears and tail in the several species of mice as instances, though trifling ones, of differences in structure which can be of no special use, I may mention that, according to Dr. Schobel, the external ears of the common mouse are supplied in an extraordinary manner with nerves, so that they no doubt serve as tactile organs. Hence the length of the ears can hardly be quite unimportant. We shall also presently see that the tail is a highly useful prehensile organ to some of the species, and its use would be much influenced by its length. With respect to plants, to which, on account of Negley's essay, I shall confine myself in the following remarks, it will be admitted that the flowers of the orchids present a multitude of curious structures, which a few years ago would have been considered as mere morphological differences without any special function, but are now known to be of the highest importance for the fertilization of the species through the aid of insects and would probably have been gained through natural selection. No one until lately could have imagined that in dimorphic and trimorphic plants the different lengths of the stamens and pistils and their arrangement could have been of any service, but now we know this to be the case. In certain whole groups of plants the ovules stand erect, and in others they are suspended and within the same ovarium of some few plants one ovule holds the former, and a second ovule the latter position. These positions seem at first purely morphological, or of no physiological signification, 
but Dr. Hooker informs me that within the same ovarium the upper ovules alone in some cases, and in others the lower ones alone, are fertilized, and he suggests that this probably depends on the direction in which pollen tubes enter the ovarium. If so, the position of the ovules, even when one is erect and the other suspended within the same ovarium, would follow the selection of any slight deviations in position which favored their fertilization and the production of seed. Several plants belonging to distinct orders habitually produce flowers of two kinds, the one open of the ordinary structure, the other closed and imperfect. These two kinds of flowers sometimes differ wonderfully in structure, yet may be seen to graduate into each other on the same plant. The ordinary and open flowers can be intercrossed, and the benefits which certainly are derived from this process are thus secured. The closed and imperfect flowers are, however, manifestly of high importance, as they yield with the utmost safety a large stock of seed, with the expenditure of wonderfully little pollen. The two kinds of flowers often differ much, as just stated, in structure. The petals in the imperfect flowers almost always consist of mere rudiments. The pollen grains are reduced in diameter. In Ononis columnae, five of the alternative stamens are rudimentary, and in some species of viola, three stamens are in this state two retaining their proper function, but being of very small size. In six out of thirty of the closed flowers in an Indian violet, name unknown, for the plants have never produced with me perfect flowers, the sepals are reduced from the normal number of five to three. In one section of the Malfigaceae, the closed flowers, according to A. de Jussieu, are still further modified, for the five stamens which stand opposite to the sepals are all aborted, a sixth stamen standing opposite to a petal being alone developed, and this stamen is not present in the ordinary flowers of this species. The style is aborted, and the ovaria are reduced from three to two. Now, although natural selection may well have the power to prevent some of the flowers from expanding, and to reduce the amount of pollen when rendered by the closure of the flowers superfluous, yet hardly any of the above special modifications can have been thus determined, but must have followed from the laws of growth, according to the functional inactivity of parts during the progress of the reduction of the pollen and the closure of the flowers. It is so necessary to appreciate the important effects of the laws of growth that I will give some additional cases of another kind, namely of differences in the same part or organ due to differences in relative position on the same plant. In the Spanish chestnut, and in certain fir trees, the angles of divergence of the leaves differ, according to Schott, in the nearly horizontal and the upright branches. In the common rue, and some other plants, one flower, usually the central or terminal one, opens first, and has five sepals and petals, and five divisions to the ovarium, while all the other flowers on the plant are tetramerous. In the British adoxa, the uppermost flower generally has two calyx lobes, with the other organs tetramerous while the surrounding flowers generally have three calyx lobes, and the other organs pentamerous. In many compositae and umbifiliae, and some other plants, the circumferential flowers have their corollas much more developed than those of the center, and this seems often connected with the abortion of the reproductive organs. It is a mere curious fact, previously referred to, that the echines, or seeds of the circumference and center, sometimes differ greatly in form, color, and other characters. In Carthamus, and in some other compositae, in the central achines alone are furnished with apopus, and in the hyrosis the same head yields achines of three different forms. In certain umbelliferae, 
The exterior seeds, according to Tausch, are orthospermous, and the central one, coleospermous, and this is a character which was considered by de Candolle to be in other species of the highest systematic importance. Professor Braun mentions a fumariaceous genus, in which the flowers in the lower part of their spike bear oval, ribbed, or one-seeded nutlets, and in the upper part of the spike, lanceolate, two-valved, and two-seeded silix. In these several cases, with the exception of the well-developed ray florets, which are of service in making the flowers conspicuous to insects, natural selection cannot, as far as we can judge, have come into play, or only in a quite subordinate manner. All these modifications follow from the relative position and interaction of the parts, and it can hardly be doubted that if all the flowers and leaves on the same plant had been subjected to the same external and internal condition as are the flowers and leaves in certain positions, all would have been modified in the same manner. In numerous other cases we find modifications of structure which are considered by botanists to be generally of a highly important nature, affecting only some of the flowers of the same plant, or occurring on distinct plants which grow together under the same conditions. As these variations seem of no special use to the plants, they cannot have been influenced by natural selection. Of their cause we are quite ignorant, we cannot even attribute them, as in the last class of cases, to any proximate agency, such as relative position. I will give only a few instances. It is so common to observe on the same plant, flowers indifferently tetramerous, pentamerous, etc., that I need not give examples. But as numerical variations are comparatively rare when the parts are few, I may mention that, according to de Candolle, the flowers of Papaver bractetum offer either two sepals with four petals, which is the common type with poppies, or three sepals with six petals. The manner in which the petals are folded on the bud is in most groups of very constant morphological character but Professor Asa Gray states that with some species of mimulus, the estivation is almost as frequently that of the renanthidae as of the antirinidae, to which the latter tribe the genus belongs. August saint gives the following cases. The genus Xanthaxilon belongs to a division of the Rutaceae with a single ovary, but in some species flowers may be found on the same plant, and even in the same panicle, with either one or two ovaries. In Helianthium, the capsule has been described as unilocular or trilocular, and in H. mutabile, une lame pluie ou mal large s'attend entre le pericarpe et la placenta. In the flowers of Soparnia officinalis, Dr. Masters has observed instances of both marginal and free central placentation. Lastly, saint found toward the southern extreme of the range of Gomphia oleiformis, two forms which he did not at first doubt were distinct species, but he subsequently saw them growing on the same bush, and adds, Voilà, donc dans un même individu, des loges et un style qui se rachèchement, tantôt à son axe ventriculé et tantôt à une gynobus. We thus see that with most plants many morphological changes may be attributed to the laws of growth and the interaction of parts, independently of natural selection. But with respect to Nageli's doctrine of an innate tendency toward perfection or progressive development, can it be said, in the case of these strongly pronounced variations, that the plants have been caught in the act of progressing toward a higher state of development? On the contrary, I should infer from the mere fact of the parts in question, differing or varying greatly on the same plant, that such modifications were of extremely small importance to the plants themselves, of whatever importance they may generally be to us for our classifications. 
the acquisition of a useless part can hardly be said to raise an organism in the natural scale, and in the case of the imperfect closed flowers above described, if any new principle has to be invoked, it must be one of retrogression rather than of progression, and so it must be with many parasitic and degraded animals. We are ignorant of the exciting cause of the above specified modifications, but if the unknown were to act almost uniformly for a length of time, we may infer that the result would be almost uniform, and in this case all the individuals of the species would be modified in the same manner. From the fact of the above characters being unimportant for the welfare of the species, any slight variations which occurred in them would not have been accumulated and augmented through natural selection. A structure which has been developed through long-continued selection, when it ceases to be of service to a species, generally becomes variable, as we see with rudimentary organs, for it will no longer be regulated by this same power of selection. But when, from the nature of the organism and of the condition, modifications have been induced which are unimportant for the welfare of the species, they may be, and apparently often have been, transmitted in nearly the same state to numerous, otherwise modified descendants. It cannot have been of much importance to the greater number of mammals, birds, or reptiles, whether they were clothed with hair, feathers, or scales, Yet hair has been transmitted to almost all mammals, feathers to all birds, and scales to all true reptiles. A structure, whatever it may be, which is common to many allied forms, is ranked by us as of high systematic importance, and consequently is often assumed to be of high vital importance to the species. Thus, as I am inclined to believe, morphological differences which we consider as important, such as the arrangement of the leaves, the divisions of the flower, or of the ovarium, the positions of the ovules, etc., first appeared in many cases as fluctuating variations, which sooner or later became constant through the nature of the organism and of the surrounding conditions, as well as through the intercrossing of distinct individuals, but not through natural selection. For as these morphological characters do not affect the welfare of the species, any slight deviations in them would not have been governed or accumulated through this latter agency. It is a strange result which we thus arrive at, namely that characters of slight vital importance to the species are the most important to the systematist, but, as we shall hereinafter see when we treat of the genetic principle of classification, this is by no means so paradoxical as it may at first appear. Although we have no good evidence of the existence in organic beings of an innate tendency towards progressive development, yet this necessarily follows, as I have attempted to show in the fourth chapter, through the continued action of natural selection. For the best definition which has ever been given of a high standard of organization is the degree to which the parts have been specialized or differentiated, and natural selection tends towards this end inasmuch as the parts are thus enabled to perform their functions more efficiently. A distinguished zoologist, Mr. St. George Minvart, has recently collected all the objections which have ever been advanced by myself and others against the theory of natural selection, as propounded by Mr. Wallace and myself, and has illustrated them with admirable art and force. When thus marshaled, they make a formidable array, and it forms no part of Mr. Minbart's plan to give the various facets and considerations opposed to its conclusions, no slight effort of reason and memory is left to the reader, who may wish to weigh the evidence on both sides. When discussing special cases, Mr. Minvart passes over the effects of the increased use and disuse of parts, which I have always maintained to be highly important, and have treated my variation under domestication at greater length than, as I believe, any other writer. 
He likewise often assumes that I attribute nothing to variation, independently of natural selection, whereas in the work just referred to I have collected a greater number of well-established cases than can be found in any other work known to me. My judgment may not be trustworthy, but after reading with care Mr. Minvart's book, and after comparing each section with what I have said on the same head, I never before felt so strongly convinced of the general truth of the conclusions here arrived at, subject, of course, in so intricate a subject, to much partial error. All Mr. Minvart's objections will be, or have been, considered in the present volume. The one new point which appears to have struck many readers is that natural selection is incompetent to account for the incipient stages of useful structures. This subject is intimately connected with that of the gradation of the characters, often accompanied by a change of function, for instance the conversion of a swim bladder into lungs, points of which were discussed in the last chapter under two headings. Nevertheless, I will here consider in some detail several of the causes advanced by Mr. Minvart, selecting those which are the most illustrative, as want of space prevents me from considering all. The giraffe, by its lofty structure, much elongated neck, forelegs, head, and tongue, has its whole frame beautifully adapted for browsing on the higher branches of trees. It can thus obtain food beyond the reach of the other ungulata, or hoofed animals, inhabiting the same country, and this must be a great advantage to it during dearths. The Niata cattle in South America show us how a small difference in structure may make during such periods a great difference in preserving an animal's life. These cattle can browse as well as others on grass, but from the projection of the lower jaw they cannot, during the often recurrent droughts, browse on the twigs of trees, reeds, etc., to which food the common cattle and horses are often driven, so that at these times the niatas perish, if not well fed by their owners. Before coming to Mr. Minvart's objections, it may be well to explain once again how natural selection will act in all ordinary cases. Man has modified some of his animals, without necessarily having attended to special points of structure, but simply preserving and breeding from the fleetest animals, as with the racehorse and the greyhound, or as with the gamecock by breeding from the victorious birds. So under nature, with the nescient giraffe, the individuals which were the highest browsers, and were able during dearths to reach even an inch or two above the others, will often have been preserved, for they will have roamed over the whole country in search of food. That the individuals of the same species often differ slightly in the relative lengths of all their parts, may be seen in many works of natural history, in which careful measurements are given. These slight proportional differences, due to the laws of growth and variation, are not of the slightest use or importance to most species, but it will have been otherwise with the nascent giraffe, considering its probable habits of life, for those individuals which had some one part or several parts of their bodies rather more elongated than usual, would generally have survived. These will have intercrossed and left offspring, either inheriting the same bodily peculiarities, or with a tendency to vary again in the same manner, while the individuals less favored in the same respects will have been the most liable to perish. We see here that there is no need to separate single pairs, as man does when he methodically improves a breed. Natural selection will preserve and thus separate all the superior individuals, allowing them freely to intercross, and will destroy all the inferior individuals. By this process, long continued, which exactly corresponds to what I have called unconscious selection by man, combined no doubt in a more important manner with the inherited effects of the increased use of parts, it seems to me almost certain that an ordinary hoofed quadruped 
might be converted into a giraffe. To this conclusion, Mr. Minvart brings forward two objections. One is that the increased size of the body would obviously require an increased supply of food, and he considers it as very problematical whether the disadvantages thence arising would not, in times of scarcity, more than counterbalance the advantages. But as the giraffe actually does exist in large numbers in Africa, and as some of the largest antelopes in the world, taller than an ox, abound there, why should we doubt that, as far as size is concerned, intermediate gradations could formerly have existed there, subjected as now to severe dearths? Assuredly, the being able to reach, at each stage of increased size, to a supply of food left untouched by other hoofed quadrupeds of the country, would have been of some advantage to the nascent giraffe. Nor must we overlook the fact that increasing bulk would act as little protection against almost all beasts of prey, excepting the lion, and against this animal, its tall neck, and the taller the better, would, as Mr. Chauncey Wright has remarked, serve as a watch-tower. It is from this cause, as Sir S. Baker remarks, that no animal is more difficult to stalk than the giraffe. This animal also uses its long neck as a means of offense or defense, by violently swinging its head around with stump-like horns. The preservation of each species can rarely be determined by any one advantage, but by the union of all, great and small. Mr. Minvard then asks, and this is his second objection, if natural selection be so potent, and if high browsing be so great an advantage, why has not any other hoofed quadruped acquired a long neck and a lofty stature besides the giraffe, and, to a lesser degree, the camel, guanaco, and macrochenia? Or, again, why has not any member of the group acquired a long proboscis? With respect to South Africa, which was formerly inhabited by numerous herds of the giraffe, the answer is not difficult, and can be best given by an illustration. In every meadow in England in which trees grow, we see the lower branches trimmed or planed to an exact level by the browsing of the horses or cattle, and what advantage would it be, for instance, to sheep, if kept there, to acquire slightly longer necks? In every district some kind of animal will almost certainly be able to browse higher than the others, and it is almost equally certain that this one kind alone could have had its neck elongated for this purpose, through natural selection and the effects of increased use. In South America the competition for browsing on the higher branches of the acacias and other trees must be between giraffe and giraffe, and not with the other ungulate animals. Why, in other quarters of the world, various animals belonging to this same order have not acquired either an elongated neck or a proboscis, cannot be distinctly answered. But it is as unreasonable to expect a distinct answer to such a question as why some event in the history of mankind did not occur in one country while it did in another. We are ignorant with respect to the conditions which determine the numbers and range of each species, and we cannot even conjecture what changes of structure would be favorable to its increase in some new country. We can, however, see in a general manner that various causes might have interfered with the development of a long neck or proboscis. To reach the foliage at a considerable height without climbing, for which hoofed animals are singularly ill-constructed, implies greatly increased bulk of body, and we know that some areas support singularly few large quadrupeds, for instance South America, though it is so luxuriant, while South Africa abounds with them to an unparalleled degree. Why this should be, so we do not know nor why the later tertiary periods should have been so much more favorable for their existence than the present time. Whatever the causes may have been, we can see that certain districts and times would have been much more favorable than others for the development of so large a quadruped as the giraffe. 
In order that an animal should acquire some structures specially and largely developed, it is almost indispensable that several other parts should be modified and co-adapted. Although every part of the body varies slightly, it does not follow that the necessary parts should always vary in the right direction and to the right degree. With the different species of our domesticated animals, we know that the parts vary in a different manner and degree, and that some species are more variable than others. Even if the fitting variations did arise, it does not follow that natural selection would be able to act on them and produce a structure which apparently would be beneficial to the species. For instance, if the number of individuals existing in a country is determined chiefly through destruction by beasts of prey, by external or internal parasites, etc., as seems often to be the case, then natural selection will be able to do little, or it will be greatly retarded in modifying any particular structure for obtaining food. Lastly, natural selection is a slow process, and the same favorable conditions must long endure in order that any market effect should thus be produced. Except by assigning such general and vague reasons, we cannot explain why, in many quarters of the world, hoofed quadrupeds have not acquired much elongated necks or other means for browsing on higher branches of trees. Objections of the same nature as the foregoing have been advanced by many writers. In each case, various causes, besides the general ones just indicated, have probably interfered with the acquisition through natural selection of structures, which it is thought would be beneficial to certain species. One writer asks, why has not the ostrich acquired the power of flight? But a moment's reflection will show that an enormous supply of food would be necessary to give this bird of the desert force to move its huge body through the air. Oceanic islands are inhabited by bats and seals, but by no terrestrial mammals. Yet, as some of these bats are peculiar species, they must have long inhabited their present homes. Therefore, Sir C. Lyell asks, and assigns through certain reasons in answer, why have not seals and bats given birth on such islands to forms fitted to live on the land? But seals would necessarily be first converted into terrestrial carnivorous animals of considerable size, and bats into terrestrial insectivorous animals. For the former there would be no prey. For the bats, ground insects would serve as food, but these would already be largely preyed upon by the reptiles or birds, which first colonize and abound on most oceanic islands. Gradations of structure, with each stage beneficial to a changing species, will be favored only under certain peculiar conditions. A strictly terrestrial animal, by occasionally hunting for food in shallow water, than in streams or lakes, might at last be converted into an animal so thoroughly aquatic as to brave the open ocean. But seals would not find on oceanic islands the conditions favorable to their gradual reconversion into a terrestrial form. Bats, as formerly shown, probably acquired their wings by at first gliding through the air from tree to tree, like the so-called flying squirrels, for the sake of escaping from their enemies, or for avoiding falls. But when the power of true flight had once been acquired, it would never be reconverted back, at least for the above purposes, into the less efficient power of gliding through the air. Bats might indeed, like many birds, have had their wings greatly reduced in size or completely lost through disuse, but in this case it would be necessary that they should first have acquired the power of running quickly on the ground, by the aid of their hind legs alone, so as to compete with the birds and other ground animals, and for such a change a bat seems singularly ill-fitted. These conjectural remarks have been made merely to show that a transition of structure, with each step beneficial, is a highly complex affair, and there is nothing strange in a transition not having occurred in any particular case. 
Lately, more than one writer has asked why have some animals had their mental powers more highly developed than others, as such development would be advantageous to all. Why have not apes acquired the intellectual powers of man? Various causes could be assigned, but as they are conjectural and their relative probability cannot be weighed, it would be useless to give them. A definite answer to the latter question ought not to be expected, seeing that one can solve the simpler problem, why of two races of savages has one risen higher in the scale of civilization than the other, and this apparently implies increased brain power. We will return to Mr. Minvart's other objections. Insects often resemble, for the sake of protection, various objects, such as green or decayed leaves, dead twigs, bits of lichen, flowers, spines, excrement of birds, and living insects. But to this latter point I shall hereafter recur. The resemblance is often wonderfully close, and is not confined to color, but extends to form and even to the manner in which the insects hold themselves. The caterpillars, which project motionless like dead twigs from the bushes on which they feed, offer an excellent instance of a resemblance of this kind. The cases of this imitation of such objects as the excrement of birds are rare and exceptional. On this head Mr. Minvart remarks, as according to Mr. Darwin's theory, there is a constant tendency to indefinite variation, and as the minute incipient variations will be in all directions, they must tend to neutralize each other, and, at first, to form such unstable modifications that it is difficult, if not impossible, to see how such indefinite oscillations of infinitesimal beginnings can ever build up a sufficiently appreciable resemblance to a leaf, bamboo, or other object, for natural selection to seize upon and perpetuate. But in all the foregoing cases the insects in their original state no doubt presented some rude and accidental resemblance to an object commonly found in the stations frequented by them. Nor is this at all improbable, considering the almost infinite number of surrounding objects, and the diversity in form and color of the hosts of insects which exist. As some rude resemblance is necessary for the first start, we can understand how it is that the larger and higher animals do not, with the exception, as far as I know, of one fish, resemble, for the sake of protection, special objects, but only the surface which commonly surrounds them, and this chiefly in color. Assuming that an insect originally happened to resemble in some degree a dead twig or decayed leaf, and that it varied slightly in many ways, then all the variations which rendered the insect at all more like any such object, and thus favored its escape, would be preserved, while other variations would be neglected and ultimately lost, or, if they rendered the insect at all less like the imitated object, they would be eliminated. There would indeed be force in Mr. Minvart's objection if we were to attempt to account for the above resemblances independently of natural selection through mere fluctuating variability, but as the case stands, there is none. Nor can I see any force in Mr. Minvart's difficulty with respect to the last touches of perfection in the mimicry as is the case given by Mr. Wallace, of a walking-stick insect, Ceroxylus lacerus, which resembles a stick grown over by a creeping moss, or Jungermania. So close was this resemblance that a native dyak maintained that the foliaceous excrescences were really moss. Insects are preyed upon by birds and other enemies, whose sight is probably sharper than ours, and every grade in resemblance which added an insect to escape notice or detection would tend toward its preservation, and the more perfect the resemblance, so much the better for the insect. Considering the nature of the differences between the species in the group which includes the above Cerasylus, there is nothing improbable in this insect having varied in the irregularities on its surface, and in these having become more or less green-colored. 
for in every group the characters which differ in the several species are the most apt to vary, while the genetic characters, or those common to all the species, are the most constant. The Greenland whale is one of the most wonderful animals in the world, and the baleen, or whalebone, one of its greatest peculiarities. The baleen consists of a row on each side of the upper jaw of about three hundred plates, or laminae, which would stand close together transversely to the longer axis of the mouth. Within the main row there are some subsidiary rows. The extremities and inner margins of all the plates are frayed into stiff bristles, which clothe the whole gigantic palate, and serve to strain or sift the water, and thus to secure the minute prey on which these great animals subsist. The middle and longest lamina in the Greenland whale is ten, twelve, or even fifteen feet in length, but in the different species of cetaceans there are gradations in length, the middle lamina being in one species, according to Scoresby, four feet, in another three, in another eighteen inches, and in the Balanoptera rostara only about nine inches in length. The quality of the whalebone also differs in the different species. With respect to the baleen, Mr. Minvert remarks that if it had once attained such a size and development as to be at all useful, then its preservation and augmentation within serviceable limits would be promoted by natural selection alone. But how to obtain the beginning of such a useful development? In answer, it may be asked, why should not the early progenitors of the whales with baleen have possessed a mouth constructed something like the lamellated beak of a duck? Ducks, like whales, subsist by sifting the mud and water, and the family has sometimes been called criblators or sifters. I hope that I may not be misconstrued into saying that the progenitors of whales did actually possess mouths lamellated like the beak of a duck. I wish only to show that this is not incredible, and that the immense plates of baleen in the Greenland whale might have been developed from such lamellae by finely graduated steps, each of service to its possessor. The beak of a shoveler duck, Spatula clypeta, is a more beautiful and complex structure than the mouth of a whale. The upper mandible is furnished on one side, in the specimen examined by me, with a row or comb formed of 188 thin elastic lamellae, obliquely beveled so as to be pointed and placed transversely to the longer axis of the mouth. They arise from the palate, and are attached by a flexible membrane to the sides of the mandible. Those standing toward the middle are the longest, being about one-third of an inch in length, and they project fourteen one-hundredths of an inch beneath the edge. At their bases there is a short subsidiary row of obliquely transverse lamellae. In these several respects they resemble the plates of baleen in the mouth of a whale, but towards the extremity of the beak they differ much, as they project inward instead of straight downward. The entire head of the shoveler, though incomparably less bulky, is about one-eighteenth the length of the head of a moderately large Balanoptera rostora, in which species the baleen is only nine inches long, so that if we were to make the head of the shoveler as long as that of the Balanoptera, the laminae would be six inches in length, that is, two-thirds the length of the baleen in this species of whale. The lower mandible of the shoveler duck is furnished with lamellae of equal length with those above, but finer, and in being thus furnished it differs conspicuously from the lower jaw of a whale, which is destitute of baleen. On the other hand, the extremities of these lower lamellae are frayed into fine bristly points, so that they thus curiously resemble the plates of baleen. In the genus Prion, a member of the distinct family of the petrels, the upper mandible alone is furnished with lamellae, which are well developed and project beneath the margin, so that the beak of this bird resembles in this respect the mouth of a whale. 
From the highly developed structure of the shoveler's beak we may proceed, as I have learned from information and specimens sent to me by Mr. Salvin, without any great break as far as fitness for sifting is concerned, through the beak of Merganta armata, and in some respects through that of the Aix sponsa, to the beak of the common duck. In this latter species the lamellae are much coarser than in the shoveler, and are firmly attached to the sides of the mandible. They are only about fifty in number on each side, and do not project at all beneath the margin. They are square-tipped, and are edged with translucent, hardish tissue, as if for crushing food. The edges of the lower mandible are crossed by numerous fine ridges, which project very little. Although the beak is thus very inferior as a sifter to that of the shoveler, yet this bird, as every one knows, constantly uses it for that purpose. There are other species, as I heard from Mr. Salvin, in which the lamellae are considerably less developed than in the common duck, but I do not know whether they use their beaks for sifting the water. Turning to another group in the same family, in the Egyptian goose, Chinalopex, the beak closely resembles that of the modern duck, but the lamellae are not so numerous, nor so distinct from each other, nor do they project so much inward. Yet this goose, as I am informed by Mr. E. Bartlett, uses its bill like a duck by throwing the water out at the corners. Its chief food, however, is grass, which it crops like the common goose. In this latter bird the lamellae of the upper mandible are much coarser than in the common duck, almost confluent, about twenty-seven in number on each side, and terminating upward in teeth-like knobs. The palate is also covered with hard, rounded knobs. The edges of the lower mandible are serrated with teeth much more prominent, coarser, and sharper than in the duck. The common goose does not sift the water, but uses its beak exclusively for tearing or cutting herbage, for which purpose it is so well fitted that it can crop grass closer than almost any other animal. There are other species of geese, as I hear from Mr. Bartlett, in which the lamellae are less developed than in the common goose. We thus see that a member of the duck family, with a beak constructed like that of a common goose and adapted solely for grazing, or even a member with a beak having less well-developed lamellae, might be converted by small changes into a species like the Egyptian goose this into one like the common duck, and lastly into one like the shoveler, provided with a beak almost exclusively adapted for sifting the water, for this bird would hardly use any part of its beak except the hooked tip for seizing or tearing solid food. The beak of a goose, as I may add, might also be converted by small changes into one provided with prominent recurved teeth, like those of the merganser, a member of the same family, serving for the widely different purpose of securing live fish. Returning to the whales, Hyperodon bidens is destitute of true teeth in an efficient condition, but its palate is roughened, according to Lacipidae, with small, unequal, hard points of horn. There is therefore nothing improbable in supposing that some early cetacean form was provided with similar points of horn on the palate, but rather more regularly placed, and which, like the knobs on the beak of the goose, aided it in seizing or tearing its food. If so, it will hardly be denied that the points might have been converted through variation and natural selection into lamellae, as well developed as that of the Egyptian goose, in which case they would have been used both for seizing objects and for sifting the water, then into lamellae like those of the domestic duck, and so onward until they became as well constructed as those of the shoveler, in which case they would have served exclusively as a sifting apparatus. From this stage, in which the lamellae would be two-thirds the length of the plates of baleen in the Belenoptera rostara, gradations, which may be observed in still existing cetaceans, lead us onward to the enormous plates of baleen in the Greenland whale. 
nor is there the least reason to doubt that each step in this scale might have been as serviceable to certain ancient cetaceans, with the functions of the parts slowly changing during the progress of development, as are the gradations in the beaks of the differing existing members of the duck family. We should bear in mind that each species of duck is subjected to a severe struggle for existence, and that the structure of every part of its frame must be well adapted to its conditions of life. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. The Pleuronecidae, or flatfish, are remarkable for their asymmetrical bodies. They rest on one side, in the greater number of species on the left, but in some on the right side, and occasionally reversed adult specimens occur. The lower, or resting surface, resembles, at first sight, the ventral surface of an ordinary fish. It is of white color, less developed in many ways than on the upper side, with the lateral fins often of smaller size. But the eyes offer the most remarkable peculiarity, for they are both placed on the upper side of the head. During early youth, however, they stand opposite to each other, and the whole body is then symmetrical, with both sides equally colored. Soon the eye proper to the lower side begins to glide slowly round the head to the upper side, but does not pass right through the skull, as was formerly thought to be the case. It is obvious that unless the lower eye did this travel round, it could not be used by the fish while lying in its habitual position on one side. The lower eye would also have been liable to be abraded by the sandy bottom. That the Pleuronecidae are remarkably adapted by their flattened and asymmetrical structure for their habits of life is manifest from several species, such as soles, flounder, etc., being excessively common. The chief advantages thus gained seem to be protection from their enemies, and facility for feeding on the ground. The different members, however, of the family present, as Schiote remarks, a long series of forms exhibiting a gradual transition, from Hippoglossus pingius, which does not in any considerable degree alter the shape in which it leaves the ovum, to the souls, which are entirely thrown off to one side. Mr. Minvart has taken up this case, and remarks that a sudden, spontaneous transformation in the position of the eyes is hardly conceivable, in which I quite agree with him. He then adds, if the transit were gradual, then how such transit of one eye of a minute fraction of the journey toward the other side of the head could benefit the individual is indeed far from clear. It seems even that such an incipient transformation must rather have been injurious. But he might have found an answer to his objection in the excellent observations published in 1867 by Malm. The Pleuronecidae, while very young and still symmetrical, with their eyes standing on opposite sides of the head, cannot long retain a vertical position, owing to the excessive depth of their bodies, the small size of their lateral fins, and to their being destitute of a swim-bladder. Hence, soon growing tired, they fall to the bottom, on one side. While thus at rest, they often twist, as Mom observed, the lower eye upward, to see above them, and they do so so vigorously that the eye is pressed hard against the upper part of the orbit. The forehead between the eyes consequently becomes, as could plainly be seen, temporarily contracted in breadth. On one occasion, Mom saw a young fish raise and depress the lower eye through an angular distance of about seventy degrees. We should remember that the skull at this early age is cartilaginous and flexible, and so it readily yields to muscular action. It is also known with the higher animals, even after early youth, 
that the skull yields and is altered in shape, if the skin or muscles be permanently contracted through diseases or some accident. With long-eared rabbits, if one ear flops forward and downward, its weight drags forward all the bones of the skull on the same side, of which I have given a figure. Malm states that the newly hatched young of perches, salmon, and several other symmetrical fishes have the habit of occasionally resting on one side at the bottom, and he has observed that they often then strain their lower eyes so as to look upward, and their skulls are thus rendered rather crooked. These fishes, however, are soon able to hold themselves in a vertical position, and no permanent effect is thus produced. With the Pleuricidae, on the other hand, the older they grow, the more habitually they rest on one side, owing to the increasing flatness of their bodies, and a permanent effect is thus produced at the form of the head, and on the position of the eyes. Judging from analogy, the tendency to distortion would no doubt be increased through the principle of inheritance. Schiote believes, in opposition to some other naturalists, that the Pleuronicidae are not quite symmetrical even in the embryo, and if this be so, we could understand how it is that certain species, while young, habitually fall over and rest on the left side, and other species on the right side. Malm adds, in confirmation of the above view, that the adult Trachypterus arcturus, which is not a member of the Pleuronicidae, rests on the left side at the bottom, and swims diagonally through the water, and this fish, of the two sides of its head, are said to be somewhat dissimilar. Our great authority on fishes, Dr. Gunther, concludes his abstract of Malm's paper by remarking that the author gives a very simple explanation of the abnormal condition of the pleurocentinoids. We thus see that the first stages of the transit of the eye from one side of the head to the other, which Mr. Minvart considers would be injurious, may be attributed to the habit, no doubt beneficial to the individual and to the species, of endeavouring to look upward with both eyes, while resting on one side at the bottom. We may also attribute to the inherited effects of use the fact of the mouth in several kinds of flatfish being bent toward the lower surface, with the jawbones stronger and more effective on this, the eyeless side of the head, than on the other, for the sake, as Dr. Tronquayar supposes, of feeding with ease on the ground. Disuse, on the other hand, will account for less developed conditions of the whole inferior half of the body, including the lateral fins, though Yarrow thinks that the reduced size of these fins is advantageous to the fish as there is so much less room for the action than with the larger fins above. Perhaps the lesser number of teeth in the proportion of four to seven in the upper halves of the two jaws of the pliasse to twenty-five to thirty in the lower halves may likewise be accounted for by disuse. From the colorless state of the ventral surface of many fishes, and from many other animals, we may reasonably suppose that the absence of color in flatfish on the side, whether it be right or left, which is undermost, is due to the exclusion of light. But it cannot be supposed that the peculiar speckled appearance of the upper side of the sole is so like the sandy bed of the sea, or the power in some species, as recently shown by Pouchet, of changing their color in accordance with the surrounding surface, or the presence of bony tubercles in the upper side of the turbo, are due to the action of the light. Here natural selection has probably come into play, as well as in adapting the general shape of the body of these fishes, and many other peculiarities, to their habits of life. We should keep in mind, as I have before insisted, that the inherited effects of the increased use of parts, and perhaps of their disuse, will be strengthened by natural selection. For all spontaneous variations in the right direction will be thus preserved, as will those individuals which inherit in the highest degree the effects of the increased beneficial use of any part. 
how much to attribute in each particular case to the effects of use, and how much to natural selection, it seems impossible to decide. I may give another instance of a structure which apparently owes its origin exclusively to use or habit. The extremity of the tail in some American monkeys has been converted into a wonderfully perfect prehensile organ, and serves as a fifth hand. A reviewer, who agrees with Mr. Minvart in every detail, remarks on this structure. It is impossible to believe that in any number of ages the first slight incipient tendency to grasp could preserve the lives of the individuals possessing it, or favor their chance of having and of rearing offspring. But there is no necessity for any such belief. Habit, and this almost implies that some benefit of great or small is thus derived, would in all probability suffice for the work. Brehm saw the young of an African monkey, Cersopithecus, clinging to the under surface of their mother by their hands, and at the same time they hooked their little tails round that of their mother. Professor Henslow kept in confinement some harvest mice, Mus Messorius, which do not possess a structurally prehensive tail, but he frequently observed that they curled their tails round the branches of a bush placed in the cage, and thus aided themselves in climbing. I have received an analogous account from Dr. Gunther, who has seen a mouse thus suspend itself. If the harvest mouse had been more strictly arboreal, it would perhaps have had its tail rendered structurally prehensile as is the case with some members of the same order. Why Cersopithecus, considering its habits while young, has not become thus provided, it would be difficult to say. It is, however, possible that the long tail of this monkey may be more of service to it as a balancing organ in making its prodigious leaps than as a prehensile organ. The mammary glands are common to the whole class of mammals, and are indispensable for their existence. They must, therefore, have been developed at an extremely remote period, and we can know nothing positively about their manner of development. Mr. Minvard asks, Is it conceivable that the young of any animal was ever saved from destruction by accidentally sucking a drop of scarcely nutritious fluid from an accidentally hypertrophied cutaceous gland of its mother, and even if one were so, what chance was there of the perpetuation of such a variation? But the case is not here put fairly. It is admitted by most evolutionists that mammals are descended from a marsupial form, and if so, the mammary glands will have at first developed within the marsupial sac. In the case of fish, Hippocampus, the eggs are hatched, and the young are reared for a time within a sack of this nature, and an American naturalist, Mr. Lockwood, believes from what he has seen of the development of the young that they are nourished by a secretion from the cutaneous glands of the sack. Now, with the early progenitors of mammals, almost before they deserve to be thus designated, is it not at least possible that the young might have been similarly nourished? And in this case, the individuals which secreted a fluid in some degree or manner the most nutritious, so as to partake of the nature of milk, would in the long run have reared a larger number of well-nourished offspring than would the individuals which secreted a poorer fluid, and thus the cutaneous glands, which are the homologues of the mammary glands, would have been improved or rendered more effective. It accords with the widely extended principle of specialization that the glands over a certain space of the sac should have become more highly developed than the remainder, and that they would then have formed a breast, but at first without a nipple, as we see in the ornithorhynchus at the base of the mammalian series. Through what agency the glands over a certain space become more highly specialized than the others, I will not pretend to decide. Whether in part through compensation of growth, the effects of youth, or natural selection. 
The development of the mammary glands would have been of no service, and could not have been effected through natural selection, unless the young at the same time were able to partake of the secretion. There is no greater difficulty in understanding how young mammals have instinctively learned to suck the breast, than in understanding how unhatched chickens have learned to break the eggshell by tapping against it with their specially adapted beaks, or how a few hours after leaving the shell they have learned to pick up grains of food. In such cases the most probable solution seems to be that the habit was at first acquired by practice at a more advanced age, and afterwards transmitted to the offspring at an earlier age. But the young kangaroo is said not to suck, only to cling to the nipple of its mother, who has the power of injecting milk into the mouth of her helpless half-formed offspring. On this head Mr. Minvart remarks, did no special provision exist? The young one must infallibly be choked up by the intrusion of the milk into the windpipe. But there is a special provision. The larynx is so elongated that it arises up into the posterior end of the nasal passage, and is thus enabled to give free entrance to the air for the lungs, while the milk passes harmlessly on each side of this elongated larynx, and so safely attains the gullet behind it. Mr. Minvard then asks how did natural selection remove in the adult kangaroo, and in most other mammals, on the assumption that they are descended from a marsupial form, this at least perfectly innocent and harmless structure. It may be suggested in answer that the voice, which is certainly of high importance to many mammals, could hardly have been used with full force as long as the larynx entered the nasal passage, and Professor Flower has suggested to me that this structure would have greatly interfered with an animal swallowing solid food. We will now turn for a short space to the lower divisions of the animal kingdom. The echinodermata, starfishes, sea urchins, etc., are furnished with remarkable organs called pedicellariae, which consist, when well developed, of a tridactyl forceps, that is, of one formed of three serrated arms, neatly fitting together and placed on the summit of a flexible stem moved by muscles. These forceps can seize and firmly hold of any object, and Alexander Agassiz has seen an echinus or sea urchin rapidly passing particles of excrement from forceps to forceps down certain lines of its body, in order that its shell should not be fouled. But there is no doubt that, besides removing dirt of all kinds, they subserve other functions, and one of these, apparently, is defense. With respect to these organs, Mr. Minvart, as on so many previous occasions, asks, what would be the utility of the first rudimentary beginnings of such structures, and how could such incipient buddings ever have preserved the life of a single echinus? He adds, not even the sudden development of the snapping action would have been beneficial without the freely movable stalk nor could the latter have been efficient without the snapping jaws. Yet no minute, nearly indefinite variations could have simultaneously evolved these complex coordinations of structure. To deny this seems to do no less than to affirm a startling paradox. Paradoxical as this may appear to Mr. Minvart, tridactyl forcepses, immovably fixed at the base but capable of a snapping action, certainly do exist on some starfishes, and this is intelligible if they serve, at least in part, as a means of defense. Mr. Agassiz, to whose great kindness I am indebted for much information on the subject, informs me that there are other starfishes in which one of the three arms of the forceps is reduced to a support for the other two, and again other genera in which the third arm is completely lost. In Echinosis the shell is described by M. Perrier as bearing two kinds of pedicularii, one resembling that of Echinus, and the other those of Spatangus and in such cases are always interesting as affording the means of apparently sudden transitions through the abortion of one of the two states of an organ. 
With respect to the steps by which these curious organs have evolved, Mr. Agassiz infers from his own researches and those of Mr. Muller that both in starfishes and sea urchins the pedicillary have undoubtedly been looked at as modified spines. This must be inferred from their manner of development in the individual, as well as from a long and perfect series of gradations in different species and genera, from simple granules to ordinary spines to perfect tridactyl pedicillary. This gradation extends even to the manner in which ordinary spines and the pedicillary, with their supporting calcareous rods, are articulated to the shell. In certain genera of starfishes, the very combinations needed to show that the pedicillary are only modified branching spines may be found. Thus we have fixed spines with three equidistant, serrated, movable branches articulated to near their bases, and higher up on the same spine three other movable branches. Now when the latter arise from the summit of a spine, they form in fact a rude tridactyl pedicillary, and as such may be seen on the same spine together with the three lower branches. In this case the identity in nature between the arms of the pedicillary and the movable branches of a spine is unmistakable. It is generally admitted that the ordinary spines serve as a protection, and if so there can be no reason to doubt that those furnished with serrated and movable branches likewise serve for the same purpose, and they would thus serve still more effectively as soon as by meeting together they acted as a prehensile or snapping apparatus. Thus every gradation, from an ordinary fixed spine to a fixed pedicillary, would be of service. In certain genera of starfishes, these organs, instead of being fixed or borne on an immovable support, are placed at the summit of a flexible and muscular, though short, stem, and in this case they probably subserve some additional function besides defense. In the sea urchins, the steps can be followed by which a fixed spine becomes articulated to the shell, and is thus rendered movable. I wish I had space here to give a fuller abstract of Mr. Agassiz's interesting observations on the development of the pedicillary. All possible gradations, as he adds, may likewise be found between the pedicillary of the starfishes and the hooks of the ophiularians, another group of the echinodermata, and again between the pedicillary of sea urchins and the anchors of the holothurae, also belonging to the same great class. Certain compound animals, or zoophytes as they have been termed, namely the polyzoa, are provided with curious organs called avicularia. These differ much in structure in the different species. In their most perfect condition they curiously resemble the head and beak of a vulture in miniature, seated on the neck and capable of movement, as is likewise the lower jaw or mandible. In one species observed by me, all the avicularia on the same branch often moved simultaneously backwards and forwards, with the lower jaw widely open, through an angle of about ninety degrees, in the course of five seconds, and their movement caused the whole polyzoary to tremble. When the jaws are touched with a needle, they seize it so firmly that the branch can thus be shaken. Mr. Minvar deduces this case, chiefly on account of the supposed difficulty of organs, namely the avicularia of the polyzoa and the pedicillary of the echinodermata, which he considers as essentially similar, having been developed through natural selection in widely distinct divisions of the animal kingdom. But as far as the structure is concerned, I can see no similarity between tridactyle pedicillary and avicularia. The latter resembles somewhat more closely the chelae or pincers of crustaceans, and Mr. Minvard might have adduced with equal appropriateness this resemblance as a special difficulty, or even their resemblance to the head and beak of a bird. 
The avicularia are believed by Mr. Busk, Dr. Smith, and Dr. Nietzsche, naturalists who have carefully studied this group, to be homologous with the zooids and their cells which composite the zoophyte. The movable lip or lid of the cell corresponding with the lower and movable mandible of the avicularium. Mr. Busk, however, does not know of any gradations now existing between a zooid and an apicularium. It is therefore impossible to conjecture by what serviceable gradations the one could have been converted into the other, but it by no means follows from this that such gradations have not existed. As the chelae of crustaceans resemble in some degree the avicularia of polyzoa, both serving as pincers, it may be worth while to show that with the former a long series of serviceable gradations still exists. In the first and simplest stage, the terminal segment of the limb shuts down either on the square summit of the broad penultimate segment, or against the whole side, and is thus enabled to catch hold of an object. But the limb still serves as an organ of locomotion. We next find one corner of the broad penultimate segment slightly prominent, sometimes furnished with irregular teeth, and against these the terminal segment shuts down. But an increase in the size of this projection, with its shape as well as that of the terminal segment slightly modified and improved, the pincers are rendered more and more perfect, until at last we have an instrument as efficient as the chelae of a lobster and all these gradations can actually be traced. Besides the avicularia, the polyzoa possess curious organs called the brocula. These generally consist of long bristles, capable of movement and easily excited. In one species examined by me, the vibrocula were slightly curved and serrated along the outer margin, and all of them on the same polyzoary often moved simultaneously, so that, acting like long oars, they swept a branch rapidly across the object glass of my microscope. When a branch was placed on the face, the vibracula became entangled, and they made violent efforts to free themselves. They are supposed to serve as a defense, and may be seen, as Mr. Busk remarks, to sweep slowly and carefully over the surface of the polyzoary, removing what might be noxious to the delicate inhabitants of the cells when their tentacula are protruded. The avicularia, like the vibracula, probably serve for defense, but they also catch and kill small living animals, which it is believed are afterwards swept by the currents within the reach of the tentacula of the zooids. Some species are provided with avicularia and vibracula, some with avicularia alone, and a few with vibracula alone. It is not easy to imagine two objects more widely different in appearance than a bristle or vibraculum and an avicularium like the head of a bird, yet they are almost certainly homologous, and have been developed from the same common source, namely a zooid with its cell. Hence we can understand how it is that these organs gradate in some cases, as I am informed by Mr. Busk, into each other. Thus, with the avicularia of some species of lepralia, the movable mandible is so much produced and is so like that of a bristle that the presence of the upper or fixed beak alone serves to determine its avicularian nature. The vibracula may have been directly developed from the lips of the cells, without having passed through the avicularian stage, but it seems more probable that they have passed through this stage, as during the early stages of the transformation the other parts of the cell, with the included zooid, could hardly have disappeared at once. In many cases the vibracula have a grooved support at the base, which seems to represent the fixed beak though this support in some species is quite absent. This view of the development of the vibracula, if trustworthy, is interesting, for supposing that all the species provided with avicularia had become extinct, 
no one with the most vivid imagination would ever have thought that the vibracula had originally existed as a part of an organ resembling a bird's head, or an irregular box or hood. It is interesting to see two such widely different organs developed from a common origin, and as the movable lip of the cell serves as a protection of the zooid, there is no difficulty in believing that all the gradations, by which the lip became converted first into the lower mandible of an avicularium, and then into an elongated bristle, likewise served as a protection in different ways and under different circumstances. In the vegetable kingdom, Mr. Minvart only alludes to two cases, namely the structure of the flowers of orchids and the movements of climbing plants. With respect to the former, he says, the explanation of their origin is deemed thoroughly unsatisfactory, utterly insufficient to explain the incipient, infinitesimal beginnings of structures which are of utility only when they are considerably developed. As I have fully treated this subject in another work, I will here give only a few details, on one alone of the most striking peculiarities of the flowers of orchids, namely their pollinia. A pollinum, when highly developed, consists of a mass of pollen grains affixed to an elastic footstalk or caudicle, and this to a little mass of extremely viscid matter. The pollinia are by this means transported by insects from one flower to the stigma of another. In some orchids there is no caudicle to the pollen masses, and the grains are merely tied together by fine threads but as these are not confined to orchids, they need not here be considered. Yet I may mention that at the base of the Orcanidus series, in Cyberspatium, we can see how the threads were probably first developed. In other orchids the threads cohere at one end of the pollen masses, and this forms the first or nascent trace of a claudicle. This is the origin of the claudicle, even when of considerable length and highly developed, we have good evidence in the aborted pollen grains which can sometimes be detected embedded within the central and solid parts. With respect to the second chief peculiarity, namely the little mass of viscid matter attached to the end of the claudicle, a long series of gradations can be specified, each of plain service to the plant. In most flowers belonging to other orders, the stigma secretes a little viscid matter. Now, in certain orchids, similar viscid matter is secreted, but in much larger quantities by one alone of the three stigmas. And this stigma, perhaps in consequence of the copious secretion, is rendered sterile. When an insect visits a flower of this kind, it rubs off some of the viscid matter, and thus at the same time drags away some of the pollen grains. From this simple condition, which differs but little from that of a multitude of common flowers, there are endless gradations to species in which the pollen mass terminates in a very short free claudicle, to others in which the claudicle becomes firmly attached to the viscid matter, which the sterile stigmata itself much modified. In this latter case, we have a pollinium in its most highly developed and perfect condition. He who will carefully examine the flowers of orchids for himself will not deny the existence of the above series of gradations, from a mass of pollen grains merely tied together by threads, with the stigmata differing but little from that of the ordinary flowers, to a highly complex pollinium, admirably adapted for transportal by insects. Nor will he deny that all the gradations in the several species are admirably adapted in relation to the general structure of each flower for its fertilization by different insects. In this, and almost every other case, the inquiry must be pushed further backwards, and it must be asked, how did the stigma of an ordinary flower become viscid? But, as we do not know the full history of any one group of beings, it is as useless to ask as it is hopeless to attempt answering such questions. We will now turn to climbing plants. 
These can be arranged in a long series, from those which simply twine round the support, to those which I have called leaf climbers, and to those provided with tendrils. In these two latter cases the stems have generally, but not always, lost the power of twining, though they retain the power of revolving, which the tendrils likewise possess. The gradations from leaf-climbers to tendril-bearers are wonderfully close, and certain plants may be differently placed in either class. But in ascending the series from simple twiners to leaf-climbers, an important quality is added, namely sensitiveness to a touch, by means of the footstalks of the leaves of the flowers, or these modified and converted into tendrils, are excited to bend round and clasp the touching object. He who will read my memoir on these plants will, I think, admit that all the gradations in function and structure between simple twiners and tendril-bearers are in each case beneficial in a high degree to the species. For instance, it is clearly a great advantage to a twining plant to become a leaf-climber and it is probable that every twiner which possessed leaves with long footstalks would have been developed into a leaf-climber, if the footstalks had possessed in any slight degree the requisite sensitiveness to a touch. As twining is the simplest means of ascending a support, and forms the basis of our series, it may naturally be asked, how did plants acquire this power in an incipient degree? afterwards to be improved and increased through natural selection. The power of twining depends, firstly, on the stems, while young being extremely flexible, but this is a character common to many plants which are not climbers, and secondly, on their continually bending to all points of the compass, one after another in succession in the same order. By this movement, the stems are inclined to all sides, and are made to move round and round. As soon as the lower part of a stem strikes against any object and is stopped, the upper part still goes on bending and revolving, and thus necessarily twines round and up the support. The revolving movement ceases after the early growth of each shoot, as in many widely separated families of plants, single species and single genera possess the power of revolving, and have thus become twiners. They must have independently acquired it, and cannot have inherited it from a common progenitor. Hence I was led to predict that some slight tendency to a movement of this kind would be found to be far from uncommon with plants which did not climb and that this had afforded the basis for natural selection to work on and improve. When I made this prediction, I knew of only one imperfect case, namely of the young flower pendicles of a morianda, which revolved slightly and irregularly, like the stems of twining plants, but without making any use of this habit. Soon afterwards, Fritz Muller discovered that the young stems of Alisma and of a linum, plants which do not climb and are widely separated in the natural system, revolved plainly, though irregularly, and he states that he has reason to suspect that this occurs with some other plants. These slight movements appear to be of no service to the plants in question. Anyhow, they are not of the least use in the way of climbing, which is the point that concerns us. Nevertheless, we can see that if the stems of these plants had been flexible, and if under the conditions to which they are exposed it had profited them to ascend to a height, then the habit of unsightly and irregularly revolving might have been increased and utilized through natural selection, until they had become converted into well-developed twining species. With respect to the sensitiveness of the footstalks of the leaves and flowers and of the tendrils, nearly the same remarks are applicable as in the case of the revolving movements of twining plants. As a vast number of species belonging to widely distinct groups are endowed with this kind of sensitiveness, it ought to be found in a nascent condition in many plants which have not become climbers. This is the case. 
I observed that the young flower pentacles of the above morandia curved themselves a little towards the side which was touched. Morin found in several species of oxalis that the leaves and their footstalks moved, especially after exposure to a hot sun, when they were gently and repeatedly touched, or when the plant was shaken. I repeated these observations on some other species of oxalis with the same result. In some of them the movement was distinct, but was best seen in the young leaves. In others it was extremely slight. But it is a more important fact that, according to the high authority of Hofmeister, the young shoots and leaves of all plants move after being shaken, and with climbing plants it is, as we know, only during the early stages of growth that the footstalks and tendrils are sensitive. It is scarcely possible that the above slight movements, due to a touch or shake in the young and growing organs of plants, can be of any functional importance to them. But plants possess, in obedience to various stimuli, powers of movement which are of manifest importance to them. For instance, towards, and more rarely from, the light, in opposition to, and more rarely in the direction of, the attraction of gravity, when the nerves and muscles of an animal are excited by galvanism, or by the absorption of strychnine, the consequent movements may be called an incidental result, for the nerves and muscles have not been rendered specially sensitive to these stimuli. So, with plants, it appears that, from having the power of movement in obedience to certain stimuli, they are excited in an incidental manner by a touch or by being shaken. Hence, there is no great difficulty in admitting that, in the case of leaf-climbers and tendril-bearers, it is this tendency which has been taken advantage of and increased through natural selection. It is, however, probable, from reasons which I have assigned in my memoir, that this will have occurred only with plants which had already acquired the power of revolving, and had thus become twiners. I have already endeavoured to explain how plants become twiners, namely by the increase of a tendency to slight and irregular revolving movements, which were at first of no use to them. This movement, as well as that due to a touch or a shake being the incidental result of the power of moving, gained for other and beneficial purposes. Whether during the gradual development of climbing plants natural selection has been aided by the inherent effects of use, I will not pretend to decide. But we know that certain periodical movements, for instance the so-called sleep of plants, are governed by habit. I have now considered enough, perhaps more than enough, of the cases selected with care by a skilful naturalist to prove that natural selection is incompetent to account for the incipient changes of useful structures, and I have shown, as I hope, that there is no great difficulty on this head. A good opportunity has thus been afforded for enlarging a little on gradations of structure, often associated with strange functions, an important subject which was not treated at sufficient length in former editions of this work. I will now briefly recapitulate the foregoing cases. With the giraffe, the continued preservation of the individuals of some extinct high-reaching ruminant, which had the longest necks, legs, etc., and could browse a little above the average height, and the continued destruction of those who could not browse so high, would have sufficed for the production of this remarkable quadruped. But the prolonged use of all the parts, together with inheritance, will have aided in an important manner in their coordination. With the many insects which imitate various objects, there is no improbability in the belief that an accidental resemblance to some common object was in each case the foundation for the preservation of slight variations which made the resemblance at all closer, and this will have been carried on as long as the insect continued to vary, and as long as a more and more perfect resemblance led to its escape from sharp-sighted enemies. 
In certain species of whales there is a tendency to the formation of irregular little points of horn on the palate, and it seems to be quite within the scope of natural selection to preserve all favorable variations, until the points were converted first into lamellated knobs or teeth, like those on the beak of a goose, then into short lamellae, like those of the domestic ducks, and then into lamellae as perfect as those of the shoveler duck, and finally into the gigantic plates of baleen, as in the mouth of the Greenland whale. In the family of these ducks, the lamellae are first used as teeth, then partly as teeth, then partly as a sifting apparatus, and at last almost exclusively for this latter purpose. With such structures as the above lamellae of horn or whalebone, habit or use can have done little or nothing, as far as we can judge, toward their development. On the other hand, the transportal of the lower eye of a flat fish to the upper side of the head, and the formation of a prehensile tail, may be attributed almost wholly to continued use, together with inheritance. With respect to the mammae of the higher animals, the most probable conjecture is that primordially the cutaneous glands over the whole surface of a marsupial sac secreted a nutritious fluid, and that these glands were improved in function through natural selection, and concentrated into a confined area, in which case they would have formed a mamma. There is no more difficulty in understanding how the branched spines of some ancient echinoderm, which served as a defense, became developed through natural selection into tridactyl pediculae than in understanding the development of the pincers of crustaceans, through slight serviceable modifications in the ultimate and penultimate segments of a limb, which was at first used solely for locomotion. In the avicularia and vibracula of the polyzoa, we have organs widely different in appearance, developed from the same source, and with the vibracula we can understand how the successive gradations might have been of service. With the pollinia of orchids, the threads which originally served to tie together the pollen grains can be traced cohering into cauticles, and these steps can likewise be followed by which viscid matter, such as that secreted by the stigmas of ordinary flowers, and still subserving nearly but not quite the same purpose, became attached to the free ends of the cauticles, all these gradations being of manifest benefit to the plants in question. With respect to climbing plants, I need not repeat what has been so lately said. It has often been asked, if natural selection be so potent, why has not this or that structure been gained by certain species, to which it would apparently have been advantageous? But it is unreasonable to expect a precise answer to such questions, considering our ignorance of the past history of each species, and of the conditions which, at the present day, determine its numbers and range. In most cases only general reasons, but in some few cases special reasons can be assigned. Thus, to adapt a species to new habits of life, many coordinated modifications are almost indispensable, and it may often have happened that the requisite parts did not vary in the right manner, or to the right degree. Many species must have been prevented from increasing in numbers through destructive agencies, which stood in no relation to certain structures, which we imagine would have been gained through natural selection from appearing to us advantageous to the species. In this case, as the struggle for life did not depend on such structures, they could not have been acquired through natural selection. In many cases, Complex and long-enduring conditions, often of a peculiar nature, are necessary for the development of a structure, and the requisite conditions may seldom have concurred. The belief that any given structure, which we think, often erroneously, would have been beneficial to a species, would have been gained under all circumstances through natural selection. It is opposed to what we can understand of its manner of action. Mr. Minvart does not deny that natural selection has effected something, 
but he considers it as demonstrably insufficient to account for the phenomenon which I explain by its agency. His chief arguments have now been considered, and the others will hereafter be considered. They seem to me to partake little of the character of demonstration, and to have little weight in comparison with those in favor of the power of natural selection, aided by the other agencies often specified. I am bound to add that some of the facts and arguments here used by me have been advanced for the same purpose in an able article lately published in the Medical Chirurgical Review. At the present day almost all naturalists admit evolution under some form. Mr. Minvard believes that species change through an internal force or tendency about which it is not pretended that anything is known. That species have a capacity for change will be admitted by all evolutionists, but there is no need, as it seems to me, to invoke any internal force beyond the tendency to ordinary variability, which, through the aid of selection, by man has given rise to many well-adapted domestic races, and which, through the aid of natural selection, would equally well give rise by graduated steps to natural races or species. The final result will generally have been, as already explained, an advance, but in some few cases a retrogression, an organization. Mr. Minvart is further inclined to believe, and some naturalists agree with him, that new species manifest themselves with suddenness and by modifications appearing at once. For instance, he supposes that the differences between the extinct three-toed hipparion and the horse arose suddenly. He thinks it difficult to believe that the wing of a bird was developed in any other way than by a completely sudden modification of a marked and important kind, and apparently he would extend the same view to the wings of bats and pterodactyls. This conclusion, which implies great breaks of discontinuity in the series, appears to me improbable in the highest degree. Everyone who believes in slow and gradual evolution will, of course, admit that specific changes may have been as abrupt and as great as any single variation, which we meet with under nature or even under domestication. But as species are more variable when domesticated or cultivated than under their natural conditions, it is not probable that such great and abrupt variations have often occurred under nature, as are known occasionally to arise under domestication. Of these latter variations, several may be attributed to reversion, and the characters which thus reappear were, it is probable, in many cases at first gained in a gradual manner. A still greater number must be called monstrosities, such as six-fingered men, porcupine men, ancon sheep, niata cattle, etc., and as they are widely different in character from natural species, they throw very little light on our subject. Excluding such cases of abrupt variations, the few which remain would at best constitute, if found in a state of nature, doubtful species, closely related to their parental types. My reasons for doubting whether natural species have changed as abruptly as have occasionally domestic races, and for entirely disbelieving that they have changed in the wonderful manner indicated by Mr. Minvart, are as follows. According to our experience, abrupt and strongly marked variations occur in our domesticated productions, singly and at rather long intervals of time. If such occurred under nature, they would be liable, as formerly explained, to be lost by accidental causes of destruction and by subsequent intercrossing, and so it is known to be under domestication, unless abrupt variations of this kind are specially preserved and separated by the care of man. Hence, in order that a new species should suddenly appear in the manner supposed by Mr. Minvart, it is almost necessary to believe, in opposition to all analogy, that several wonderfully changed individuals appeared simultaneously within the same district. 
This difficulty, as in the case of unconscious selection by man, is avoided on the theory of gradual evolution, through the preservation of a large number of individuals which varied more or less in any favorable direction, and of the destruction of a large number which varied in the opposite manner. That many species have been evolved in an extremely gradual manner, there can hardly be a doubt. The species, and even the genera, of many large natural families are so closely allied together that it is difficult to distinguish not a few of them. On every continent, in proceeding from north to south, from lowland to upland, etc., we meet with a host of closely related or representative species, as we are likely to do on certain distinct continents, which we have reason to believe were formerly connected. But in making these and the following remarks, I am compelled to allude to subjects hereinafter to be discussed. Look at the many outlying islands round a continent, and see how many of their inhabitants can be raised only to the rank of doubtful species. So it is that if we look to past times and compare the species which have just passed away with those still living within the same areas, or if we compare the fossil species embedded in the sub-stages of the same geological formation, it is indeed manifest that multitudes of species are related in the closest manner to other species that still exist, or have lately existed, and it will hardly be maintained that such species have been developed in an abrupt or sudden manner. Nor should it be forgotten, when we look to the special parts of allied species instead of to distinct species, that numerous and wonderfully fine gradations can be traced, connecting together widely different structures. Many large groups of facts are intelligible only on the principle that species have been evolved by very small steps. For instance, the fact that the species included in the larger genera are more closely related to each other and present a greater number of varieties than do the species in the smaller genera. The former are also grouped in little clusters, like varieties around species, and they present other analogies with varieties, as was shown in our second chapter. On this same principle, we can understand how it is that specific characters are more variable than generic characters, and how the parts which are developed in an extraordinary degree or manner are more variable than other parts of the same species. Many analogous facts, all pointing in the same direction, could be added. Although many species have almost certainly been produced by steps not greater than those separating fine varieties, yet it may be maintained that some have been developed in a different and abrupt manner. Such an admission, however, ought not to be made without strong evidence being assigned. The vague, and in some respects false analogies, as they have been shown to be by Mr. Chauncey Wright, which have been advanced in favor of this view, such as the sudden crystallization of inorganic substances, or the falling of a faceted spheroid from one facet to another, hardly deserve consideration. One class of facts, however, namely the sudden appearance of new and distinct forms of life in our geological formations, supports at first sight the belief in abrupt development. But the value of this evidence depends almost entirely on the perfection of the geological record in relation to periods remote in the history of the world. If the record is as fragmentary as many geologists strenuously assert, there is nothing strange in new forms appearing as if suddenly developed. Unless we admit transformations as prodigious as those advocated by Mr. Minvart, such as the sudden development of the wings of birds or bats, or the sudden conversion of a hyperion into a horse, hardly any light is thrown by the belief in abrupt modifications on the deficiency of connecting links in our geological formations. But against the belief in such abrupt changes, embryology enters a strong protest. 
It is notorious that the wings of bats and birds, and the legs of horses or other quadrupeds, are indistinguishable at an early embryonic period, and they become differentiated by insensibly fine steps. Embryological resemblances of all kinds can be accounted for, as we shall hereafter see, by the progenitors of our existing species having buried after early youth, and having transmitted their newly acquired characters to their offspring at a corresponding age. The embryo is thus left almost unaffected, and serves as a record of the past condition of the species. Hence it is that existing species, during the early stages of their development, so often resemble ancient and extinct forms belonging to the same class. On this view of the meaning of embryological resemblances, and indeed on any view, it is incredible that an animal should have undergone such momentous and abrupt transformations as those above indicated, and yet should not bear even a trace in its embryonic condition of any sudden modification, every detail in its structure being developed by insensibly fine steps. He who believes that some ancient form was transformed suddenly through an internal force or tendency into, for instance, one furnished with wings, will be almost compelled to assume, in opposition to all analogy, that many individuals varied simultaneously. It cannot be denied that such abrupt and great changes of structure are widely different from those which most species apparently have undergone. He will further be compelled to believe that many structures beautifully adapted to all the other parts of the same creature, and to the surrounding conditions, have been suddenly produced, and of such complex and wonderful co-adaptations he will not be able to assign a shadow of an explanation. He will be forced to admit that these great and sudden transformations have left no trace of their action on the embryo. To admit all this is, as it seems to me, to enter into the realms of miracle, and to leave those of science. So ends chapter 7, Miscellaneous Objections to the Theory of Natural Selection. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Gesine. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection Or The Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life Sixth London Edition by Charles Darwin Chapter 8 Part 1 Instinct Contents of this chapter include Instincts comparable with habits, but different in their origin Instincts graduated Aphides and ants Instincts variable Domestic instincts, their origin Natural instincts of the cuckoo, molothrus, ostrich and parasitic bees Slave-making ants Hive-bee, its cell-making instinct Changes of instinct and structure not necessarily simultaneous. Difficulties of the theory of natural selection of instincts. Neuter or sterile insects. Summary. Many instincts are so wonderful that their development will probably appear to the reader a difficulty sufficient to overthrow my whole theory. I may here premise that I have nothing to do with the origin of the mental powers, any more than I have with that of life itself. We are concerned only with the diversities of instinct and of the other mental faculties in animals of the same class. I will not attempt any definition of instinct. It would be easy to show that several distinct mental actions are commonly embraced by this term, but everyone understands what is meant when it is said that instinct impels the cuckoo to migrate and to lay her eggs in other birds' nests. 
an action which we ourselves require experience to enable us to perform, when performed by an animal, more especially by a very young one, without experience, and when performed by many individuals in the same way, without their knowing for what purpose it is performed, is usually said to be instinctive. But I could show that none of these characters are universal. A little dose of judgment or reason, as Pierre Huber expresses it, often comes into play, even with animals low in the scale of nature. Frederick Cuvier and several of the older metaphysicians have compared instinct with habit. This comparison gives, I think, an accurate notion of the frame of mind under which an instinctive action is performed, but not necessarily of its origin. How unconsciously many habitual actions are performed, indeed not rarely in direct opposition of our conscious will. Yet they may be modified by the will or reason. Habits easily become associated with other habits, with certain periods of time and states of the body. When once acquired, they often remain constant throughout life. Several other points of resemblance between instinct and habits could be pointed out. As in repeating a well-known song, so in instincts, one action follows another by a sort of rhythm. If a person be interrupted in a song, or in repeating anything by rote, he is generally forced to go back to recover the habitual train of thought. So P. Huber found it was with a caterpillar, which makes a very complicated hammock. For if he took a caterpillar which had completed its hammock up to, say, the sixth stage of construction, and put it into a hammock completed only to the third stage, the caterpillar simply reperformed the fourth, fifth, and sixth stages of construction. If, however, a caterpillar were taken out of a hammock made up, for instance, to the third stage, and were put into one finished up to the sixth stage, so that much of its work was already done for it, far from deriving any benefit from this, it was much embarrassed and, in order to complete its hammock, seemed forced to start from the third stage, where it had left off, and thus tried to complete the already finished work. If we suppose any habitual action to become inherited, and it can be shown that this does sometimes happen, then the resemblance between what originally was a habit and an instinct becomes so close as not to be distinguished. If Mozart, instead of playing the pianoforte at three years old with wonderfully little practice, had played a tune with no practice at all, he might truly be said to have done so instinctively. But it would be a serious error to suppose that the greater number of instincts have been acquired by habit in one generation, and then transmitted by inheritance to succeeding generations. It can be clearly shown that the most wonderful instincts with which we are acquainted, namely those of the hive-bee and of many ants, could not possibly have been acquired by habit. It will be universally admitted that instincts are as important as corporeal structures for the welfare of each species under its present conditions of life. Under changed conditions of life, it is at least possible that slight modifications of instinct may be profitable to a species. And if it can be shown that instincts do vary ever so little, then I can see no difficulty in natural selection preserving and continually accumulating variations of instinct to any extent that was profitable. It is thus, as I believe, that all the most complex and wonderful instincts have originated, as modifications of corporeal structure arise from, and are increased by, use or habit, and are diminished or lost by disuse so I do not doubt it has been with instincts. But I believe that the effects of habit are in many cases of subordinate importance to the effects of the natural selection of what may be called spontaneous variations of instincts, that is, of variations produced by the same unknown causes, which produce slight deviations of bodily structure. No complex instinct 
can possibly be produced through natural selection, except by the slow and gradual accumulation of numerous, slight yet profitable variations. Hence, as in the case of corporeal structures, we ought to find in nature not the actual transitional gradations by which each complex instinct has been acquired, for these could be found only in the lineal ancestors of each species, but we ought to find in the collateral lines of descent some evidence of such gradations, or we ought at least to be able to show that gradations of some kind are possible, and this we certainly can do. I have been surprised to find, making allowance for the instincts of animals having been but little observed, except in Europe and North America, and for no instinct being known among extinct species, how very generally gradations, leading to the most complex instincts, can be discovered. Changes of instinct may sometimes be facilitated by the same species having different instincts at different periods of life, or at different seasons of the year, or when placed under different circumstances, etc., in which case either the one or the other instinct might be preserved by natural selection. And such instances of diversity of instinct in the same species can be shown to occur in nature. Again, as in the case of corporeal structure, and conformably to my theory, the instinct of each species is good for itself, but has never, as far as we can judge, been produced for the exclusive good of others. One of the strongest instances of an animal apparently performing an action for the sole good of another with which I am acquainted is that of aphides voluntarily yielding, as was first observed by Huber, their sweet excretion to ants. They do so voluntarily, the following facts show. I removed all the ants from a group of about a dozen aphides on a dock plant, and prevented their attendance during several hours. After this interval, I felt sure that the aphides would want to excrete. I watched them for some time through a lens, but not one excreted. I then tickled and stroked them with the hair in the same manner, as well as I could, as the ants do with their antennae, but not one excreted. Afterwards I allowed an ant to visit them, and it immediately seemed, by its eager way of running about, to be well aware what a rich flock it had discovered. It then began to play with its antennae on the abdomen first of one aphis and then of another, and each, as soon as it felt the antennae, immediately lifted up its abdomen and excreted a limpid drop of sweet juice, which was eagerly devoured by the ant. Even the quite young aphides behaved in this manner, showing that the action was instinctive, and not the result of experience. It is certain, from the observations of Huber, that the aphides show no dislike to the ants. If the latter be not present, they are at last compelled to eject their excretion. But as the excretion is extremely viscid, it is no doubt a convenience to the aphides to have it removed. Therefore, probably they do not excrete solely for the good of the ants. Although there is no evidence that any animal performs an action for the exclusive good of another species, yet each tries to take advantage of the instincts of others, as each takes advantage of the weaker bodily structure of another species. So again, certain instincts cannot be considered as absolutely perfect. But as details on this and other such points are not indispensable, they may be here passed over. As some degree of variation in instincts under a state of nature, and the inheritance of such variations, are indispensable for the action of natural selection, as many instances as possible ought to be given, but want of space prevents me. I can only assert that instincts certainly do vary. For instance, the migratory instinct, both in extent and direction, and in its total loss. So it is with the nests of birds, which vary partly in dependence to the situations 
chosen, and on the nature and temperature of the country inhabited, but often from causes wholly unknown to us. Audubon has given several remarkable cases of differences in the nests of the same species in the northern and southern United States. Why, it has been asked, if instinct be variable, has it not granted to the bee the ability to use some other material when wax was deficient? But what other natural material could bees use? They will work, as I have seen, with wax hardened with vermilion or softened with lard. Andrew Knight observed that his bees, instead of laboriously collecting propolis, used a cement of wax and turpentine with which he had covered decorticated trees. It has lately been shown that bees, instead of searching for pollen, will gladly use a very different substance, namely oatmeal. Fear of any particular enemy is certainly an instinctive quality, as may be seen in nestling birds, though it is strengthened by experience and by the sight of fear of the same enemy in other animals. The fear of man is slowly acquired, as I have elsewhere shown, by the various animals which inhabit desert islands, and we see an instance of this even in England, in the greater wildness of all our large birds in comparison with our small birds, for the large birds have been most persecuted by man. We may safely attribute the greater wildness of our large birds to this cause, for in uninhabited islands large birds are not more fearful than small, and the magpie, so wary in England, is tame in Norway, as is the hooded crow in Egypt. That the mental qualities of animals of the same kind, born in a state of nature, very much, could be shown by many facts. Several cases could also be adduced of occasional and strange habits in wild animals, which, if advantageous to the species, might have given rise, through natural selection, to new instincts. But I am well aware that these general statements, without the facts in detail, can produce but a feeble effort on the reader's mind. I can only repeat my assurance that I do not speak without good evidence. Inherited Changes of Habit or Instinct in Domesticated Animals The possibility, or even probability, of inherited variations of instinct in a state of nature will be strengthened by briefly considering a few cases under domestication we shall thus be enabled to see the part which habit and the selection of so-called spontaneous variations have played in modifying the mental qualities of our domestic animals. It is notorious how much domestic animals vary in their mental qualities. With cats, for instance, one naturally takes to catching rats, and another mice, and these tendencies are known to be inherited. One cat, according to Mr. St. John, always brought home game birds, another hares or rabbits, and another hunted on marshy ground and almost nightly caught woodcocks or snipes. A number of curious and authentic instances could be given of various shades of disposition and taste, and likewise of the oddest tricks associated with certain frames of mind or periods of time but let us look to the familiar case of the breeds of dogs. It cannot be doubted that young pointers, I have myself seen striking instances, will sometimes point and even back other dogs the very first time that they are taken out. Retrieving is certainly in some degree inherited by retrievers, and the tendency to run round instead of at a flock of sheep by shepherd dogs. I cannot see that these actions, performed without experience by the young, and in nearly the same manner by each individual, performed with eager delight by each breed and without the end being known. For the young pointer can no more know that he points to aid his master than the white butterfly knows why she lays her eggs on the leaf of the cabbage. I cannot see that these actions differ essentially from true instincts. 
If we were to behold one kind of wolf, when young and without any training, as soon as it scented its prey, stand motionless like a statue, and then slowly crawl forward with a peculiar gait, and another kind of wolf rushing round instead of at a herd of deer, and driving them to a distant point, we should assuredly call these actions instinctive. Domestic instincts, as they may be called, are certainly far less fixed than natural instincts, but they have been acted on by far less vigorous selection, and have been transmitted for an incomparably shorter period under less fixed conditions of life. How strong these domestic instincts, habits, and dispositions are inherited, and how curiously they become mingled, is well shown when different breeds of dogs are crossed. Thus it is known that a cross with a bulldog has affected for many generations the courage and obstinacy of greyhounds, and a cross with a greyhound has given to the whole family of shepherd dogs a tendency to hunt hares. These domestic instincts, when thus tested by crossing, resemble natural instincts, which in a like manner become curiously blended together, and for a long period exhibit traces of the instincts of either parent. For example, Leroy describes a dog whose great-grandfather was a wolf, and this dog showed a trace of its wild parentage only in one way, by not coming in a straight line to his master when called. Domestic instincts are sometimes spoken of as actions which have become inherited solely from long-continued and compulsory habit, but this is not true. No one would ever have thought of teaching, or probably could have taught, the tumbler pigeon to tumble, an action which, as I have witnessed, is performed by young birds that have never seen a pigeon tumble. We may believe that some one pigeon showed a slight tendency to this strange habit, and that the long-continued selection of the best individuals in successive generations made tumblers what they are now. And near Glasgow there are house tumblers, as I hear from Mr. Brent, which cannot fly eighteen inches high without going head over heels. It may be doubted whether any one would have thought of training a dog to point, had not some one dog naturally shown a tendency in this line, and this is known occasionally to happen, as I once saw in a pure terrier. The act of pointing is probably, as many have thought, only the exaggerated pause of an animal preparing to spring on its prey. When the first tendency to point was once displayed, methodical selection and the inherited effects of compulsory training in each successive generation would soon complete the work. And unconscious selection is still in progress, as each man tries to procure, without intending to improve the breed, dogs which stand and hunt best. On the other hand, habit alone in some cases has sufficed. Hardly any animal is more difficult to tame than the young of the wild rabbit. Scarcely any animal is tamer than the young of the tame rabbit. But I can hardly suppose that domestic rabbits have often been selected for tameness alone, so that we must attribute at least the greater part of the inherited change from extreme wildness to extreme tameness to habit and long-continued close confinement. Natural instincts are lost under domestication. A remarkable instance of this is seen in those breeds of fowls which very rarely or ever become broody, that is, never wish to sit on their eggs. Familiarity alone prevents our seeing how largely and how permanently the minds of our domestic animals have been modified. It is scarcely possible to doubt that the love of man has become instinctive in the dog. All wolves, foxes, jackals, and species of the cat genus, when kept tame, are most eager to attack poultry, sheep, and pigs, and this tendency has been found incurable in dogs which have been brought home as puppies from countries such as Tierra del Fuego and Australia, 
where the savages do not keep these domestic animals. How rarely, on the other hand, do our civilized dogs, even when quite young, require to be taught not to attack poultry, sheep, and pigs. No doubt they occasionally make an attack, and are then beaten, and if not cured, they are destroyed, so that habit and some degree of selection have probably concurred in civilizing, by inheritance, our dogs. On the other hand, young chickens have lost wholly by habit that fear of the dog and cat, which no doubt was originally instinctive in them, for I am informed by Captain Hutton that the young chickens of the parent stock, the Gallus Bankiva, when reared in India under a hen, are at first excessively wild. So it is with young pheasants reared in England under a hen. It is not that chickens have lost all fear, but fear only of dogs and cats, for if the hen gives the danger chuckle, they will run, more especially young turkeys, from under her and conceal themselves in the surrounding grass or thickets, and this is evidently done for the instinctive purpose of allowing, as we see in wild ground birds, their mother to fly away. But this instinct retained by our chickens has become useless under domestication, for the mother hen has almost lost by disuse the power of flight. Hence we may conclude that under domestication instincts have been acquired, and natural instincts have been lost, partly by habit and partly by man selecting and accumulating, during successive generations, peculiar mental habits and actions, which at first appeared from what we must, in our ignorance, call an accident. In some cases compulsory habit alone has sufficed to produce inherited mental changes. In other cases compulsory habit has done nothing, and all has been the result of selection, pursued both methodically and unconsciously, but in most cases habit and selection have probably concurred. SPECIAL INSTINCTS We shall, perhaps, best understand how instincts in a state of nature have become modified by selection by considering a few cases. I will select only three, namely, the instinct which leads the cuckoo to lay her eggs in other birds' nests, the slave-making instinct of certain ants, and the cell-making power of the hive-bee. These two latter instincts have generally and justly been ranked by naturalists as the most wonderful of all known instincts. INSTINCTS OF THE CUCKOO it is supposed by some naturalists that the more immediate cause of the instinct of the cuckoo is that she lays her eggs not daily, but at intervals of two or three days, so that if she were to make her own nest and sit on her own eggs, those first laid would have to be left for some time unincubated, or there would be eggs and young birds of different ages in the same nest. If this were the case, the process of laying and hatching might be inconveniently long, more especially as she migrates at a very early period, and the first hatched young would probably have to be fed by the male alone. But the American cuckoo is in this predicament, for she makes her own nest and has eggs and young successively hatched all at the same time. It has been both asserted and denied that the American cuckoo occasionally lays her eggs in other birds' nests, but I have lately heard from Dr. Merrill of Iowa that he once found in Illinois a young cuckoo together with a young jay in the nest of a blue jay, Garrulus cristatus, and as both were nearly full feathered, there could be no mistake in their identification. I could also give several instances of various birds which have been known occasionally to lay their eggs in other birds' nests. Now let us suppose that the ancient progenitor of our European cuckoo had the habits of the American cuckoo, and that she occasionally laid an egg in another bird's nest. If the old bird profited by this occasional habit, through being enabled to emigrate earlier, 
or through any other cause, or if the young were made more vigorous by advantage being taken of the mistaken instinct of another species than when reared by their own mother, encumbered as she could hardly fail to be by having eggs and young of different ages at the same time, then the old birds or the fostered young would gain an advantage. And analogy would lead us to believe that the young thus reared would be apt to follow by inheritance the occasional and aberrant habit of their mother, and in their turn would be apt to lay their eggs in other birds' nests, and thus be more successful in rearing their young. By a continued process of this nature, I believe that the strange instinct of our cuckoo has been generated. It has also recently been ascertained on sufficient evidence by Adolf Müller that the cuckoo occasionally lays her eggs on the bare ground, sits on them, and feeds her young. This rare event is probably a case of reversion to the long-lost aboriginal instinct of nidification. It has been objected that I have not noticed other related instincts and adaptations of structure in the cuckoo, which are spoken of as necessarily coordinated. But in all cases, speculation of an instinct, known to us only in a single species, is useless, for we have hitherto had no facts to guide us. Until recently, the instincts of the European and of the non-parasitic American cuckoo alone were known. Now, owing to Mr. Ramsey's observations, we have learned something about three Australian species which lay their eggs in other birds' nests. The chief points to be referred to are three. First, that the common cuckoo, with rare exceptions, lays only one egg in a nest, so that the large and voracious young bird receives ample food. Secondly, that the eggs are remarkably small, not exceeding those of a skylark, a bird about one-fourth as large as the cuckoo. That the small size of the egg is a real case of adaptation we may infer from the fact of the non-parasitic American cuckoo lying full-sized eggs. Thirdly, that the young cuckoo, soon after birth, has the instinct, the strength, and a properly shaped back for ejecting its foster brothers, which then perish from cold and hunger. This has been boldly called a beneficent arrangement, in order that the young cuckoo may get sufficient food, and that its foster brothers may perish before they had acquired much feeling. Turning now to the Australian species, though these birds generally lay only one egg in a nest, it is not rare to find two and even three eggs in the same nest. In the bronze cuckoo, the eggs vary greatly in size, from eight to ten lines in length. Now, if it had been an advantage to this species to have laid eggs even smaller than those now laid, so as to have deceived certain foster parents, or, as is more probable, to have been hatched within a shorter period, for it is asserted that there is a relation between the size of eggs and the period of their incubation, then there is no difficulty in believing that a race or species might have been formed which would have laid smaller and smaller eggs, for these would have been more safely hatched and reared. Mr. Ramsey remarks that two of the Australian cuckoos, when they lay their eggs in an open nest, manifest a decided preference for nests containing eggs similar in colour to their own. The European species apparently manifests some tendency towards a similar instinct, but not rarely departs from it, as is shown by her laying her dull and pale-coloured eggs in the nest of the hedge warbler with bright greenish-blue eggs. Had our cuckoo invariably displayed the above instinct, it would assuredly have been added to those which it is assumed must all have been acquired together. The eggs of the Australian bronze cuckoo vary, according to Mr. Ramsay, to an extraordinary degree in colour, so that in this respect, as well as in size, natural selection might have secured and fixed any advantageous variation. 
in the case of the European cuckoo, the offspring of the foster parents are commonly ejected from the nest within three days after the cuckoo is hatched. And as the latter at this age is in a most helpless condition, Mr. Gould was formerly inclined to believe that the act of ejection was performed by the foster parents themselves. But he has now received a trustworthy account of a young cuckoo which was actually seen while still blind and not able even to hold up its own head in the act of ejecting its foster brothers. One of these was replaced in the nest by the observer and was again thrown out. With respect to the means by which this strange and odious instinct was acquired, if it were of great importance for the young cuckoo, as is probably the case, to receive as much food as possible soon after birth, I can see no special difficulty in its having gradually acquired, during successive generations, the blind desire, the strength and the structure necessary for the work of ejection, for those cuckoos which had such habits and structure best developed, would be the most securely reared. The first step towards the acquisition of the proper instinct might have been more unintentional restlessness on the part of the young bird, when somewhat advanced in age and strength, the habit having been afterwards improved and transmitted to an earlier age. I can see no more difficulty in this than in the unhatched young of other birds acquiring the instinct to break through their own shells, or than in young snakes acquiring in the upper jaws, as Owen has remarked, a transitory sharp tooth for cutting through the tough egg-shell. For if each part is liable to individual variations at all ages, and the variations tend to be inherited at a corresponding or earlier age, propositions which cannot be disputed, then the instincts and structure of the young could be slowly modified as surely as those of the adult, and both cases must stand or fall together with the whole theory of natural selection. Some species of the Molothrus, a widely distinct genus of American birds, allied to our starlings, have parasitic habits like those of the cuckoo, and the species present an interesting gradation in the perfection of their instincts. The sexes of Molothrus badius are stated by an excellent observer, Mr. Hudson, sometimes to live promiscuously together in flocks, and sometimes to pair. They either build a nest of their own, or seize on one belonging to some other bird, occasionally throwing out the nestlings of the stranger. They either lay their eggs in the nest thus appropriated, or oddly enough build one for themselves on the top of it. They usually sit on their own eggs and rear their own young, but Mr. Hudson says it is probable that they are occasionally parasitic, for he has seen the young of this species following old birds of a distinct kind and clamouring to be fed by them. The parasitic habits of another species of Molothrus, the M. bonariensis, are much more highly developed than those of the last, but are still far from perfect. This bird, as far as it is known, invariably lays its eggs in the nests of strangers, but it is remarkable that several together sometimes commence to build an irregular untidy nest of their own, placed in singular ill-adapted situations, as on the leaves of a large thistle. They never, however, as far as Mr. Hudson has ascertained, complete a nest for themselves. They often lay so many eggs, from fifteen to twenty, in the same foster nest that few or none can possibly be hatched. They have, moreover, the extraordinary habit of pecking holes in the eggs, whether of their own species or of their foster parents, which they find in the appropriated nests. They drop also many eggs on the bare ground, which are thus wasted. A third species, the M. pecoris, of North America, has acquired instincts as perfect as those of the cuckoo, for it never lays more than one egg in a foster nest, so that the young bird is securely reared. 
Mr. Hudson is a strong disbeliever in evolution, but he appears to have been so much struck by the imperfect instincts of the Molothras Bonariensis that he quotes my words and asks, Must we consider these habits not as especially endowed or created instincts, but as small consequences of one general law, namely transition? Various birds, as has already been remarked, occasionally lay their eggs in the nests of other birds. This habit is not very uncommon with the Gallinaceae, and throws some light on the singular instinct of the ostrich. In this family several hen birds unite, and lay first a few eggs in one nest, and then in another, and these are hatched by the males. This instinct may probably be accounted for by the fact of the hens laying a large number of eggs, but, as with the cuckoo, at intervals of two or three days. The instinct, however, of the American ostrich, as in the case of the Molothras bonariensis, has not as yet been perfected, for a surprising number of eggs lay strewed over the plains, so that in one day's hunting I picked up no less than twenty lost and wasted eggs. Many bees are parasitic, and regularly lay their eggs in the nests of other kinds of bees. This case is more remarkable than that of the cuckoo, for these bees have not only had their instincts, but their structure modified in accordance with their parasitic habits, for they do not possess the pollen-collecting apparatus which would have been indispensable if they had stored up food for their own young. Some species of Sphegidae, wasp-like insects, are likewise parasitic, and M. Faber has lately shown good reason for believing that, although the Tachytis nigra generally makes its own burrow, and stores it with paralyzed prey for its own larvae, yet that when this insect finds a burrow already made and stored by another sphex, it takes advantage of the prize and becomes for the occasion parasitic. In this case, as with that of the Molothras or Cuckoo, I can see no difficulty in natural selection making an occasional habit permanent, if of advantage to the species. And if the instinct whose nest and stored food are feloniously appropriated be not thus exterminated, This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Kurt Wong, New York, February 2007. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Sixth London Edition by Charles Darwin Chapter Number 8 Instinct Part 2 Slave-Making Instinct This remarkable instinct was first discovered in the Formica polyergis rufusens by Pierre Hubert, a better observer even than his celebrated father. This ant is absolutely dependent on its slaves. Without their aid, the species would certainly become extinct in a single year. The males and fertile females do no work of any kind, and the workers or sterile females, though most energetic and courageous in capturing slaves, do no other work. They are incapable of making their own nests, or of feeding their own larvae. When the old nest is found inconvenient and they have to migrate, it is the slaves which determine the migration, and actually carry their masters in their jaws. So utterly helpless are the masters, that when Hubert shut up thirty of them without a slave, but with plenty of the food which they like best, and with their larvae and pupae to stimulate them to work, they did nothing. They could not even feed themselves, and many perished of hunger. Hubert then introduced a single slave, F. Fusca, and she instantly set to work, fed and saved the survivors, made some cells and tended the larvae, and put all to rights. 
What can be more extraordinary than these well-ascertained facts? If we had not known of any other slave-making ant, it would have been hopeless to speculate how so wonderful an instinct could have been perfected. Another species, Formica sanguinea, was likewise first discovered by P. Hubert to be a slave-making ant. This species is found in the southern parts of England, and its habits have been attended to by Mr. F. Smith of the British Museum, to whom I am much indebted for information on this and other subjects. Although fully trusting to the statements of Hubert and Mr. Smith, I tried to approach the subject in a sceptical frame of mind, as any one may well be excused for doubting the existence of so extraordinary an instinct as that of making slaves. Hence, I will give the observations which I made in some little detail. I opened fourteen nests of F. sanguinea, and found a few slaves in all. Males and fertile females of the slave species F. fusca are found only in their own proper communities, and have never been observed in the nest of sanguinea. The slaves are black, and not above half the size of their red masters, so that the contrast in their appearance is great. When the nest is slightly disturbed, the slaves occasionally come out, and like their masters are much agitated and defend the nest. When the nest is much disturbed, and the larvae and pupae are exposed, the slaves work energetically together with their masters in carrying them away to a place of safety. Hence it is clear that the slaves feel quite at home. During the months of June and July, on three successive years, I watched for many hours several nests in Surrey and Sussex, and never saw a slave either leave or enter a nest. As, during these months, the slaves are very few in number, I thought that they might behave differently when more numerous, but Mr. Smith informs me that he has watched the nests at various hours during May, June, and August, both in Surrey and Hampshire, and has never seen the slaves, though present in large numbers in August, either leave or enter the nest. Hence, he considers them as strictly household slaves. The masters, on the other hand, may be constantly seen bringing in materials for the nest and food of all kinds. During the year 1860, however, in the month of July, I came across a community with an unusually large stock of slaves, and I observed a few slaves mingled with their masters leaving the nest and marching along the same road to a tall scotch fir tree, twenty-five yards distant, which they had ascended together, probably in search of aphids or cocci. According to Hubert, who had ample opportunities for observation, the slaves in Switzerland habitually work with their masters in making the nest, and they alone open and close the doors in the morning and evening. And, as Hubert expressly states, their principal office is to search for aphids, this difference in the usual habits of the masters and slaves in the two countries probably depends merely on the slaves being captured in greater numbers in Switzerland than in England. One day I fortunately witnessed a migration of F. sanguinea from one nest to another, and it was a most interesting spectacle to behold the masters carefully carrying their slaves in their jaws, instead of being carried by them as in the case of F. rufusens. Another day, my attention was struck by about a score of the slave-makers haunting the same spot, and evidently not in search of food. They approached, and were vigorously repulsed by an independent community of the slave species F. fusca, sometimes as many as three of these ants clinging to the legs of the slave-making F. sanguinea. The latter ruthlessly killed their small opponents, and carried their dead bodies as food to their nest, twenty-nine yards distant but they were prevented from getting any pupae to rear as slaves. I then dug up a small parcel of the pupae of F. fusca from another nest, and put them down on a bare spot near the place of combat. They were eagerly seized and carried off by the tyrants, who perhaps fancied that, after all, they had been victorious in their late combat. At the same time, I laid on the same place a small parcel of the pupae of another species, F. flava, with a few of these little yellow ants still clinging to the fragments of their nest. This species is sometimes, though rarely, made into slaves, and has been described by Mr. Smith. Although so small a species, it is very courageous, and I have seen it ferociously attack other ants. 
In one instance I found to my surprise an independent community of F. flava under a stone beneath a nest of the slave-making F. sanguinea, and when I had accidentally disturbed both nests, the little ants attacked their big neighbors with surprising courage. Now I was curious to ascertain whether F. sanguinea could distinguish the pupae of F. fusca, which they habitually make into slaves, from those of the little and furious F. flava, which they rarely capture and it was evident that they did at once distinguish them, for we have seen that they eagerly and instantly seized the pupae of F. fusca, whereas they were much terrified when they came across the pupae, or even the earth from the nest of F. flava, and quickly ran away. But in about a quarter of an hour, shortly after all the little yellow ants had crawled away, they took heart and carried off the pupae. One evening I visited another community of F. sanguinea, and found a number of these ants returning home and entering their nests, carrying the dead bodies of F. fusca, showing that it was not a migration, and numerous pupae. I traced a long file of ants burdened with booty for about forty yards back, to a very thick clump of heath, whence I saw the last individual of F. sanguinea emerge, carrying a pupa. But I was not able to find the desolated nest in the thick heath. The nest, however, must have been close at hand, for two or three individuals of F. fusca were rushing about in the greatest agitation, and one was perched motionless with his own pupa in its mouth on the top of a spray of heath, an image of despair over its ravaged home. Such are the facts, though they did not need confirmation by me in regard to the wonderful instinct of making slaves. Let it be observed what a contrast the instinctive habits of F. sanguinea present with those of the continental F. rufusins. The latter does not build its own nest, does not determine its own migrations, does not collect food for itself or its young, and cannot even feed itself. It is absolutely dependent on its numerous slaves. Formica sanguinea, on the other hand, possesses much fewer slaves, and in the early part of the summer extremely few. The masters determine when and where a new nest shall be formed, and when they migrate, the masters carry the slaves. Both in Switzerland and England the slaves seem to have the exclusive care of the larvae, and the masters alone go on slave-making expeditions. In Switzerland the slaves and masters work together, making and bringing materials for the nest. Both, but chiefly the slaves, tended milk, as it may be called, their aphids, and thus both collect food for the community. In England the masters alone usually leave the nest to collect building materials and food for themselves, their slaves, and larvae so that the masters in this country receive much less service from their slaves than they do in Switzerland. By what steps the instinct of F. sanguinea originated, I will not pretend to conjecture. But as ants which are not slave-makers will, as I have seen, carry off pupae of other species if scattered near their nests, it is possible that such pupae originally stored as food might become developed, and the foreign ants thus unintentionally reared would then follow their proper instincts and do what work they could. If their presence proved useful to the species which had seized them, it, if it were more advantageous to the species to capture workers than to procreate them, the habit of collecting pupae, originally for food, might by natural selection be strengthened and rendered permanent for the very different purpose of raising slaves. When the instinct was once acquired, if carried out to a much less extent even than our British F. sanguinea, which, as we have seen, is less aided by its slaves than the same species in Switzerland, natural selection might increase and modify the instinct, always supposing each modification to be of use to the species, until an ant was formed as abjectly dependent on its slaves as is the Formica rufescens. cell-making instinct of the hive-bee. I will not here enter on minute details on this subject, but will merely give an outline of the conclusions at which I have arrived. He must be a dull man who can examine the exquisite structure of a comb, so beautifully adapted to its end, without enthusiastic admiration. We hear from mathematicians that bees have practically solved a recondite problem and have made their cells of the proper shape to hold the greatest possible amount of honey with the least possible consumption of precious wax in their construction. 
it has been remarked that a skillful workman, with fitting tools and measures, would find it very difficult to make cells of wax of the true form, though this is effected by a crowd of bees working in a dark hive. Granting whatever instincts you please, it seems at first quite inconceivable how they can make all the necessary angles and planes, or even perceive when they are correctly made. But the difficulty is not nearly so great as it first appears. All this beautiful work can be shown, I think, to follow from a few simple instincts. I was led to investigate this subject by Mr. Waterhouse, who has shown that the form of the cells stands in close relation to the presence of adjoining cells, and the following view may, perhaps, be considered only as a modification of his theory. Let us look to the great principle of gradation, and see whether nature does not reveal to us her method of work. At one end of a short series we have humble bees, which use their old cocoons to hold honey, sometimes adding to them short tubes of wax, and likewise making separate and very irregular rounded cells of wax. At the other end of the series we have the cells of the hive bee, placed in a double layer. Each cell, as is well known, is an hexagonal prism, with the basal edges of its six sides beveled so as to join an inverted pyramid of three roms. These roms have certain angles, and the three which form the pyramidal base of a single cell on one side of the comb enter into the composition of the bases of three adjoining cells on the opposite side. In the series, between the extreme perfection of the cells of the hive bee and the simplicity of those of the humble bee, we have the cells of the Mexican Melipona domestica, carefully described and figured by Pierre Hubert. The Melipona itself is intermediate in structure between the hive and humble bee, but more nearly related to the latter. It forms a nearly regular waxen comb of cylindrical cells, in which the young are hatched, and, in addition, some large cells of wax for holding honey. These latter cells are nearly spherical, and of nearly equal sizes, and are aggregated into an irregular mass. But the important point to notice is, that these cells are always made at that degree of nearness to each other, that they would have intersected or broken into each other if the spheres had been completed. But this is never permitted the bees building perfectly flat walls of wax between the spheres which thus tend to intersect. Hence, each cell consists of an outer spherical portion, and of two, three, or more flat surfaces, according as the cell adjoins two, three, or more other cells. When one cell rests in three other cells, which, from the spheres, being nearly of the same size, is very frequently and necessarily the case, the three flat surfaces are united into a pyramid, and this pyramid, as Hubert has remarked, is manifestly a gross imitation of the three-sided pyramidal base of the cell of the hive bee. As in the cells of the hive bee, so here the three plane surfaces in any one cell necessarily enter into the construction of three adjoining cells. It is obvious that the melipona saves wax, and what is more important, labor, by this manner of building. For the flat walls between the adjoining cells are not double, but are of the same thickness as the outer spherical portions, and yet each flat portion forms a part of two cells. Reflecting on this case, it occurred to me that if the Melipona had made its spheres at some given distance from each other, and had made them of equal sizes, and had arranged them symmetrically in a double layer, the resulting structure would have been as perfect as the comb of the hive bee. Accordingly, I wrote to Professor Miller of Cambridge, and this geometer has kindly read over the following statement drawn up from his information, and tells me that it is strictly correct. If a number of equal spheres be described with their centers placed in two parallel layers, with the center of each sphere at the distance of radius times square root 2, or radius times 1.41421, or at some lesser distance, from the centers of the six surrounding spheres in the same layer, and at the same distance from the centers of the adjoining spheres in the other and parallel layer. Then, if planes of intersection between the several spheres in both layers be formed, there will be result a double layer of hexagonal prisms united together by pyramidal bases formed of three roms, and the roms and the sides of the hexagonal prisms will have every angle identically the same with the best measurements which have been made of the cells of the hive bee. But I hear from Professor Wyman who has made numerous careful measurements, that the accuracy of the workmanship of the bee has been greatly exaggerated, so much so 
that whatever the typical form of the cells may be, it is rarely, if ever, realized. Hence, we may safely conclude that, if we could slightly modify the instincts already possessed by the melipona, and in themselves not very wonderful, this bee would make a structure as wonderfully perfect as that of the hive bee. We must suppose the melipona to have the power of forming her cells truly spherical, and of equal sizes, and this would not be very surprising, seeing that she already does so to a certain extent, and seeing what perfectly cylindrical burrows many insects make in wood, apparently by turning around on a fixed point. We must suppose the melipona to arrange her cells in level layers, as she already does her cylindrical cells, and we must further suppose, and this is the greatest difficulty, that she can somehow judge accurately at what distance to stand from her fellow laborers when several are making their spheres. But she is already so far enabled to judge of a distance, that she always describes her spheres so as to intersect to a certain extent, and then she unites the points of intersection by perfectly flat surfaces. By such modifications of instincts which in themselves are not very wonderful, hardly more wonderful than those which guide a bird to make its nest, I believe that the hive bee has acquired through natural selection her inimitable architectural powers. But this theory can be tested by experiment. Following the example of Mr. Tegetmeyer, I separated two combs and put between them a long, thick, rectangular strip of wax. The bees instantly began to excavate minute circular pits in it, and as they deepened these little pits, they made them wider and wider until they were converted into shallow basins, appearing to the eye perfectly true or parts of a sphere, and of about the diameter of a cell. It was most interesting to observe that, wherever several bees had begun to excavate their basins near together, they had begun their work at such a distance from each other that by the time the basins had acquired the above stated width, i.e. about the width of an ordinary cell, and were in depth about one-sixth of the diameter of the sphere of which they formed a part, the rims of the basins intersected or broke into each other. As soon as this occurred, the bees ceased to excavate, and began to build up flat walls of wax on the lines of intersection between the basins, so that each hexagonal prism was built upon the scalloped edge of a smooth basin, instead on the straight edges of a three-sided pyramid as in the case of ordinary cells. I then put into the hive, instead of a thick rectangular piece of wax, a thin and narrow knife-edged ridge, colored with vermilion. The bees instantly began on both sides to excavate little basins near to each other, in the same way as before. But the ridge of wax was so thin that the bottoms of the basins, if they had been excavated to the same depth as the former experiment, would have broken into each other from the opposite sides. The bees, however, did not suffer this to happen, and they stopped their excavations in due time, so that the basins, as soon as they had been a little deepened, came to have flat bases. And these flat bases, formed by thin little plates of the vermilion wax left unnawed, were situated, as far as the eye could judge, exactly along the planes of imaginary intersection between the basins on the opposite side of the ridge of wax. In some parts, only small portions, in other parts, large portions of a rhombic plate were thus left between the opposed basins, but the work from the unnatural state of things had not been neatly performed. The bees must have worked at very nearly the same rate in circularly gnawing away and deepening the basins on both sides of the ridge of vermilion wax, in order to have thus succeeded in leaving flat plates between the basins, by stopping work at the planes of intersection. Considering how flexible thin wax is, I do not see that there is any difficulty in the bees, whilst at work on the two sides of a strip of wax, perceiving when they have gnawed the wax away to the proper thinness, and then stopping their work. In ordinary combs, it has appeared to me that the bees do not always succeed in working at exactly the same rate from the opposite sides, for I have noticed half-completed roms at the base of a just-commenced cell, which were slightly concave on one side, where I suppose that the bees had excavated too quickly, and convex on the opposed side where the bees had worked less quickly. In one well-marked instance, I put the comb back into the hive, and allowed the bees to go on working for a short time and again examined the cell, and I found that the rhombic plate had been completed, and had become perfectly flat. It was absolutely impossible, from the extreme thinness of the little plate, that they could have effected this by gnawing away the convex side, and I suspect that the bees in such cases stand in the opposed cells, 
and push and bend the ductile and warm wax, which as I have tried is easily done, into its proper intermediate plane, and thus flatten it. From the experiment of the ridge of vermilion wax we can see that, if the bees were to build for themselves a thin wall of wax, they could make their cells of the proper shape by standing at the proper distance from each other, by excavating at the same rate, and by endeavouring to make equal spherical hollows, but never allowing the spheres to break into each other. Now bees, as may be clearly seen by examining the edge of a growing comb, do make a rough circumferential wall or rim all around the comb and they gnaw this away from the opposite sides, always working circularly as they deepen each cell. They do not make the whole three-sided pyramidal base of any one cell at the same time, but only that of one rhombic plate which stands on the extreme growing margin, or the two plates as the case may be. And they never complete the upper edges of the rhombic plates until the hexagonal walls are commenced. Some of these statements differ from those made by the justly celebrated elder, Hubert, but I am convinced of their accuracy, and if I had space, I could show that they are conformable with my theory. Hubert's statement, that the very first cell is excavated out of a little parallel-sided wall of wax, is not, as far as I have seen, strictly correct, the first commencement having always been a little hood of wax but I will not here enter on details. We see how important a part excavation plays in the construction of the cells, but it would be a great error to suppose that the bees cannot build up a rough wall of wax in the proper position, that is, along the plane of intersection between two adjoining spheres. I have several specimens showing clearly that they can do this. Even in the rude circumferential rim or wall of wax around a growing comb, flexures may be sometimes be observed, corresponding in position to the planes of the rhombic basal plates of future cells. But the rough wall of wax has in every case to be finished off by being largely gnawed away on both sides. The manner in which the bees build is curious. They always make the first rough wall from ten to twenty times thicker than the excessively thin, finished wall of the cell, which will ultimately be left. We shall understand how they work by supposing masons first to pile up a broad ridge of cement, and then to begin cutting it away equally on both sides near the ground till the smooth, very thin wall is left in the middle. The masons always piling up the cutaway cement and adding fresh cement on the summit of the ridge. We shall thus have a thin wall steadily growing upward but always crowned by a gigantic coping. From all the cells, both those just commenced and those completed, being thus crowned by a strong coping of wax, the bees can cluster and crawl over the comb without injuring the delicate hexagonal walls. These walls, as Professor Miller has kindly ascertained for me, vary greatly in thickness, being on average of twelve measurements made near the border of the comb, one three hundred and fifty second of an inch in thickness, whereas the basal rhomboidal plates are thicker, nearly in the proportion of three to two, having a mean thickness from twenty-one measurements of one two hundred and twenty-ninth of an inch. By the above singular manner of building, strength is continually given to the comb with the utmost ultimate economy of wax. It seems at first to add to the difficulty of understanding how the cells are made that a multitude of beads all work together, one bee after working a short time at one cell going to another, so that, as Hubert has stated, a score of individuals work even at the commencements of the first cell. I was able practically to show this fact by covering the edges of the hexagonal walls of a single cell, or the extreme margin of the circumferential rim of a growing comb, with an extremely thin layer of melted vermilion wax. And I invariably found that the color was most delicately diffused by the bees, as delicately as a painter could have done it with his brush, by atoms of the colored wax having been taken from the spot on which it had been placed, and worked in the growing edges of the cells all round. The work of construction seems to be a sort of balance struck between many bees, all instinctively standing at the same relative distance from each other, all trying to sweep equal spheres, and then building up or leaving unnawed the planes of intersection between these spheres. It was really curious to note in cases of difficulty, as when two pieces of comb met at an angle, how often these bees would pull down and rebuild in different ways the same cell sometimes recurring to a shape which they had at first rejected. When bees have a place on which they can stand in their proper positions for working, 
for instance on a slip of wood placed directly under the middle of a comb growing downwards so that the comb has to be built over one face of the slip in this case the bees can lay the foundations of one wall of a new hexagon in its strictly proper place projecting beyond the other completed cells it suffices that the bees should be enabled to stand at their proper relative distances from each other and from the walls of the last completed cell and then by striking imaginary spheres they can build up a wall intermediate between two adjoining spheres but as far as i have seen they never gnaw away and finish off the angles of a cell till a large part both of that cell and of the adjoining cells have been built this capacity in bees of laying down under certain circumstances a rough wall in its proper place between two just commenced cells is important as it bears on a fact which seems at first subversive of the foregoing theory namely that the cells on the extreme margin of wasp combs are sometimes strictly hexagonal but i have not space here to enter on this subject nor does there seem to me any great difficulty in a single insect as in the case of a queen wasp making hexagonal cells if she were to work alternately on the inside and outside of two or three cells commenced at the same time always standing at the proper relative distance from the parts of the cells just begun sweeping spheres or cylinders and building up intermediate planes as natural selection acts only by the accumulation of slight modifications of structure or instinct each profitable to the individual under its conditions of life it may reasonably be asked how a long and graduated succession of modified architectural instincts all tending towards the present perfect plan of construction could have profited the progenitors of the hive bee i think the answer is not difficult cells constructed like those of the bee or of the wasp gain in strength and save much in labor and space and in the materials of which they are constructed with respect to the formation of wax it is known that the bees are often hard pressed to get sufficient nectar and i am informed by mr tegetmeyer that it has been experimentally proved that from twelve to fifteen pounds of a dry sugar are consumed by a hive of bees for the secretion of a pound of wax so that a prodigious quantity of fluid nectar must be collected and consumed by the bees in a hive for the secretion of the wax necessary for the construction of their combs moreover many bees have to remain idle for many days during the process of secretion a large store of honey is indispensable to support a large stock of bees during the winter and the security of the hive is known mainly to depend on a large number of bees being supported hence the saving of wax by largely saving honey and the time consumed in collecting the honey must be an important element of success any family of bees of course the success of the species may be dependent on the number of its enemies or parasites or on quite distinct causes and so be altogether independent of the quantity of honey which the bees can collect but let us suppose that this latter circumstance determined as it probably often has determined whether a bee allied to our humble bees could exist in large numbers in any country and let us further suppose that the community lived through the winter and consequently required a store of honey there can in this case be no doubt that it would be an advantage to our imaginary humble bee if a slight modification of her instincts led her to make her waxen cells near together so as to intersect a little for a wall in common even to two adjoining cells would save some little labor and wax hence it would continually be more and more advantageous to our humble bees if they were to make the cells more and more regular nearer together and aggregated into a mass like the cells of the melipona for in this case a large part of the bounding surface of each cell would serve to bound the adjoining cells and much labor and wax would be saved again from the same cause it would be advantageous to the melipona if she were to make her cells closer together and more regular in every way than at present for then as we have seen the spherical surfaces would wholly disappear and be replaced by plane surfaces and the melipona would make a comb as perfect as that of the hive bee beyond this stage of perfection in architecture natural selection could not lead for the comb of the hive bee as far as we can see is absolutely perfect in economizing labor and wax thus as i believe the most wonderful of all known instincts that of the hive bee can be explained by natural selection having taken advantage of numerous successive slight modifications of simpler instincts natural selection having 
by slow degrees more and more perfectly led to the bees to sweep equal spheres at a given distance from each other in a double layer, and to build up and excavate the wax along the planes of intersection. The bees, of course, no more knowing that they swept their spheres at one particular distance from each other than they know what are the several angles of the hexagonal prisms and of the basal rhombic plates, the motive power of the process of natural selection having been the construction of cells of due strength and of the proper size and shape for the larvae, thus being affected with the greatest possible economy of labor and wax. That individual swarm which thus made the best cells with least labor and least waste of honey in the secretion of wax, having succeeded best, and having transmitted their newly acquired economical instincts to new swarms, which, in their turn, will have had the best chance of succeeding in the struggle for existence. End of chapter 8, part 2「ヒロシアンドロスコーヒー」「ヒロシアンドロスコーヒー」「ヒロシアンドロスコーヒー」「ヒロシアンドロスコーヒー」「ヒロシアンドロスコーヒー」「ヒロシアンドロスコーヒー」「ヒロシアンドロスコーヒー」「ヒロシアンドロスコーヒー」「ヒロシアンドロスコーヒー」「ヒロシアンドロスコーヒー」「Objections to the theory of natural selection as applied to instincts, neuter and sterile insects. It has been objected to the foregoing view of the origin of instincts that, quote, the variations of structure and of instinct must have been simultaneous and accurately adjusted to each other, as a modification in the one without an immediate corresponding change in the other would have been fatal, end quote. The force of this objection rests entirely on the assumption that the changes in the instincts and structure are abrupt. To take as an illustration the case of the larger titmouse, Parus major, alluded to in a previous chapter, this bird often holds the seeds of the yew between its feet on a branch and hammers with its beak till it gets at the kernel. Now what special difficulty would there be in natural selection, preserving all the slight individual variations in the shape of the beak, which were better and better adapted to break open the seeds, until a beak was formed as well constructed for this purpose as that of the nuthatch, at the same time that habit or compulsion or spontaneous variations of taste led the bird to become more and more of a seed-eater. In this case the beak is supposed to be slowly modified by natural selection, subsequently to, but in accordance with, slowly changing habits or taste. But let the feed of the titmouse vary and grow larger from correlation with the beak, or from any other unknown cause, and it is not improbable that such larger feet would lead the bird to climb more and more until it acquired the remarkable climbing instinct and power of the nuthatch. In this case, a gradual change of structure is supposed to lead to change to instinctive habits. To take one more case... Few instincts are more remarkable than that which leads the swift of the eastern islands to make its nest wholly of inspissated saliva. Some birds build their nests of mud, believed to be moistened with saliva, and one of the swifts of North America makes its nest, as I have seen, of sticks agglutinated with saliva, and even with flakes of this substance. Is it then very improbable that the natural selection of individual swifts, which secreted more and more saliva, should at last produce a species with instincts, leading it to neglect other materials, and to make its nest exclusively of inspissated saliva. And so, in other cases. It must, however, be admitted that in many instances we cannot conjecture whether it was instinct or structure which first varied. No doubt many instincts of very difficult explanation could be opposed to the theory of natural selection. Cases in which we cannot see how an instinct could have originated. Cases in which no intermediate gradations are known to exist. Cases of instincts of such trifling importance that they could hardly have been acted on by natural selection. Cases of instincts almost identically the same in animals so remote in the scale of nature that we cannot account for their similarity by inheritance from a common progenitor, and consequently must believe that they were independently acquired 
through natural selection. I will not here enter on these several cases, but will confine myself to one special difficulty, which at first appeared to me insuperable and actually fatal to the whole theory. I allude to the neuters or sterile females in insect communities, for these neuters often differ widely in instinct and in structure from both the males and fertile females, and yet, from being sterile, they cannot propagate their kind. The subject well deserves to be discussed at great length, but I will here take only a single case, that of working or sterile ants. How the workers have been rendered sterile is a difficulty, but not much greater than that of any other striking modification of structure, for it can be shown that some insects and other articulate animals in a state of nature occasionally become sterile, and if such insects had been social, and it had been profitable to the community that a number should have been annually born capable of work, but incapable of procreation, I can see no especial difficulty in this having been effected through natural selection. But I must pass over this preliminary difficulty. The great difficulty lies in the working ants differing widely from both the males and the fertile females in structure, as in the shapes of the thorax, and in being destitute of wings, and sometimes of eyes, and in instinct. As far as instinct alone is concerned, the wonderful difference in this respect between the workers and the perfect females would have been better exemplified by the hive bee. If a working ant or other neuter insect had been an ordinary animal, I should have unhesitatingly assumed that all its characters had been slowly acquired through natural selection, namely by individuals having been born with slight profitable modifications which were inherited by the offspring and that these again varied, and again were selected, and so onwards. But with the working ant we have an insect differing greatly from its parents, yet absolutely sterile, so that it could never have transmitted successively acquired modifications of structure or instinct to its progeny. It may well be asked how it is possible to reconcile this case with the theory of natural selection. First, let it be remembered that we have innumerable instances both in our domestic productions and in those in a state of nature of all sorts of differences of inherited structure which are correlated with certain ages and with either sex. We have differences correlated not only with one sex, but with that short period when the reproductive system is active, as in the nuptial plumage of many birds, and in the hooked jaws of the male salmon. We have even slight differences in the horns of different breeds of cattle in relation to an artificially imperfect state of the male sex, for oxen of certain breeds have longer horns than the oxen of other breeds relatively to the length of the horns in both the bulls and cows of these same breeds. Hence I can see no great difficulty in any character becoming correlated with the sterile condition of certain members of insect communities. The difficulty lies in understanding how such correlated modifications of structure could have been slowly accumulated by natural selection. This difficulty, though appearing insuperable, is lessened, or, as I believe, disappears, when it is remembered that selection may be applied to the family as well as to the individual, and may thus gain the desired end. Breeders of cattle wish the flesh and fat to be well marbled together, an animal thus characterized has been slaughtered, but the breeder has gone with confidence to the same stock and has succeeded. Such faith may be placed in the power of selection that a breed of cattle, always yielding oxen with extraordinarily long horns, could, it is probable, be formed by carefully watching which individual bulls and cows, when matched, produce oxen with the longest horns, and yet no one ox would ever have propagated its kind. Here is a better and real illustration. According to M. Verlo, some varieties of the double annual stock, from having been long and carefully selected to the right degree, always produce a large proportion of seedlings bearing double and quite sterile flowers, but they likewise yield some single and fertile plants. These latter, by which alone the variety can be propagated, may be compared with the fertile male and female ants and the double sterile plants with the neuters of the same community. As with the varieties of the stock, so with social insects, selection has been applied to the family and not to the individual for the sake of gaining a serviceable end. Hence we may conclude that slight modifications of structure or of instinct, 
correlated with the sterile condition of certain members of the community, have proved advantageous. Consequently, the fertile males and females have flourished and transmitted to their fertile offspring a tendency to produce sterile members with the same modifications. This process must have been repeated many times until that prodigious amount of difference between the fertile and sterile females of the same species has been produced which we see in many social insects. But we have not as yet touched on the acme of the difficulty, namely the fact that the neuters of several ants differ not only from the fertile females and males, but from each other, sometimes to an almost incredible degree, and are thus divided into two or even three castes. The castes, moreover, do not generally graduate into each other, but are perfectly well defined, being as distinct from each other as are any two species of the same genus, or rather as any two genera of the same family. Thus, in Eseton, there are working and soldier neuters with jaws and instincts extraordinarily different. In Cryptoceros, the workers of one caste alone carry a wonderful sort of shield on their heads, the use of which is quite unknown. In the Mexican Myrmecocystis, the workers of one caste never leave the nest. They are fed by the workers of another caste, and they have an enormously developed abdomen which secretes a sort of honey, supplying the place of that excreted by the aphides or the domestic cattle, as they may be called, which our European ants guard and imprison. It will indeed be thought that I have an overweening confidence in the principle of natural selection, when I do not admit that such wonderful and well-established facts at once annihilate the theory. In the simpler case of neuter insects all of one caste, which, as I believe, have been rendered different from the fertile males and females through natural selection, we may conclude from the analogy of ordinary variations that the success of slight, profitable modifications did not first arise in all the neuters in the same nest, but in some few alone, and that by the survival of the communities with females which produced most neuters having the advantageous modification, all the neuters ultimately came to be thus characterized. According to this view, we ought occasionally to find in the same nest neuter insects presenting gradations of structure, and this we do find, even not rarely, considering how few neuter insects out of Europe have been carefully examined. Mr. F. Smith has shown that the neuters of several British ants differ surprisingly from each other in size and sometimes in color, and that the extreme forms can be linked together by individuals taken out of the same nest. I have myself compared perfect gradations of this kind. It sometimes happens that the larger or the smaller sized workers are the most numerous, or that both large and small are numerous while those of an intermediate size are scanty in numbers. Formica flava has larger and smaller workers with some few of intermediate size, and in this species, as Mr. F. Smith has observed, the larger workers have simple eyes, ocelli, which, though small, can be plainly distinguished, whereas the smaller workers have their ocelli rudimentary. Having carefully dissected several specimens of these workers, I can affirm that the eyes are far more rudimentary in the smaller workers than can be accounted for merely by their proportionately lesser size, and I fully believe, though I dare not assert so positively, that the workers of intermediate size have their ocelli in an exactly intermediate condition. So that here we have two bodies of sterile workers in the same nest, differing not only in size, but in their organs of vision, yet connected by some few members in an intermediate condition. I may digress by adding that if the smaller workers had been the most useful to the community, and those males and females had been continually selected, which produced more and more of the smaller workers, until all the workers were in this condition, we should then have had a species of ant with neuters in nearly the same condition as those of Myrmica. For the workers of Myrmica, have not even rudiments of ocelli, though the male and female ants of this genus have well-developed ocelli. I may give one other case. So confidently did I expect occasionally to find gradations of important structures between the different castes of neuters in the same species, that I gladly availed myself of Mr. F. Smith's offer of numerous specimens from the same nest of the driver ant, Anama, of West Africa. The reader will perhaps best appreciate the amount of difference in these workers by my giving not the actual measurements, but a strictly accurate illustration. The difference was the same as if we were to see a set of workmen building a house, of whom many were five feet four inches high, and many sixteen feet high. 
and we must in addition suppose that the larger workmen had heads four instead of three times as big as those of the smaller men, and jaws nearly five times as big. The jaws, moreover, of the working ants of the several sizes differed wonderfully in shape and in the form and number of the teeth. But the important fact for us is that, though the workers can be grouped into castes of different sizes, yet they graduate insensibly into each other, as does the widely different structure of their jaws. I speak confidently on this latter point, as Sir J. Lubbock made drawings for me with the camera lucida of the jaws which I dissected from the workers of the several sizes. Mr. Bates, in his interesting Naturalist on the Amazons, has described analogous cases. With these facts before me, I believe that natural selection, by acting on the fertile ants, or parents, could form a species which should regularly produce neuters, all of large size with one form of jaw, or all of small size with widely different jaws. Or lastly, and this is the greatest difficulty, one set of workers, of one size and structure, and simultaneously another set of workers, of a different size and structure, a graduated series having first been formed, as in the case of the driver ant, and then the extreme forms having been produced in greater and greater numbers, through the survival of the parents which generated them, until none of the intermediate structure were produced. An analogous explanation has been given by Mr. Wallace of the equally complex case of certain Malayan butterflies regularly appearing under two or even three distinct female forms, and by Fritz Müller of certain Brazilian crustaceans likewise appearing under two widely distinct male forms. But this subject need not here be discussed. I have now explained how, I believe, the wonderful fact of two distinctly defined castes of sterile workers existing in the same nest, both widely different from each other and from their parents, has originated. We can see how useful their production may have been to a social community of ants, on the same principle that the division of labor is useful to civilized man. Ants, however, work by inherited instincts and by inherited organs or tools while man works by acquired knowledge and manufactured instruments. But I must confess that, with all my faith in natural selection, I should never have anticipated that this principle could have been efficient in so high a degree, had not the case of these neuter insects led me to this conclusion. I have therefore discussed this case, at some little but wholly insufficient length, in order to show the power of natural selection, and likewise because this is by far the most serious special difficulty which my theory has encountered. The case also is very interesting as it proves that with animals, as with plants, any amount of modification may be affected by the accumulation of numerous, slight, spontaneous variations, which are in any way profitable, without exercise or habit having been brought into play. For peculiar habits confined to the workers of sterile females, however long they might be followed, could not possibly affect the males and fertile females, which alone leave descendants. I am surprised that no one has advanced this demonstrative case of neuter insects against the well-known doctrine of inherited habit as advanced by Lamarck. Summary I have endeavored in this chapter briefly to show that the mental qualities of our domestic animals vary, and that the variations are inherited. Still more briefly, I have attempted to show that instincts vary slightly in a state of nature. No one will dispute that instincts are of the highest importance to each animal. Therefore there is no real difficulty, under changing conditions of life, in natural selection accumulating to any extent slight modifications of instinct which are in any way useful. In many cases, habit or use and disuse have probably come into play. I do not pretend that the facts given in this chapter strengthen in any great degree my theory, but none of the cases of difficulty, to the best of my judgment, annihilate it. On the other hand, the fact that instincts are not always absolutely perfect and are liable to mistakes, that no instinct can be shown to have been produced for the good of other animals, though animals take advantage of the instincts of others, that the canon in natural history of natura non facit saltum is applicable to instincts as well as to corporeal structure, 
and is plainly explicable on the foregoing views, but is otherwise inexplicable. All tend to corroborate the theory of natural selection. This theory is also strengthened by some few other facts in regard to instincts. As by that common case of closely allied but distinct species, when inhabiting distant parts of the world, and living under considerably different conditions of life, yet often retaining nearly the same instincts. For instance, we can understand, on the principle of inheritance, how it is that the thrush of tropical South America lines its nest with mud in the same peculiar manner as does our British thrush. How it is that the hornbills of Africa and India have the same extraordinary instinct of plastering up and imprisoning the females in a hole in a tree, with only a small hole left in the plaster through which the males feed them and their young when hatched. How it is that the male wrens, troglodytes, of North America, build cock-nests to roost in like the males of our kitty wrens, a habit wholly unlike that of any other known bird. Finally, it may not be a logical deduction, but to my imagination it is far more satisfactory to look at such instincts as the young cuckoo ejecting its foster brothers, ants making slaves, the larvae of ichneumonidae feeding within the live bodies of caterpillars, not as specially endowed or created instincts, but as small consequences of one general law leading to the advancement of all organic beings, namely, multiply, vary, let the strongest live and the weakest die. End of chapter 8 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the preservation of favoured races in the struggle for life. Sixth London edition by Charles Darwin. Chapter number nine. Hybridism. Section one of two. Contents of this chapter. Distinction between the sterility of first crosses and of hybrids. Sterility, various in degree, not universal, affected by close interbreeding, removed by domestication. Laws governing the sterility of hybrids. Sterility not a special endowment, but incidental on other differences not accumulated by natural selection. Causes of the sterility of first crosses and of hybrids. Parallelism between the effects of changed conditions of life and of crossing. Dimorphism and trimorphism. Fertility of varieties when crossed, and of their mongrel offspring not universal. Hybrids and mongrels compared independently of their fertility. Summary The view commonly entertained by naturalists is that species, when intercrossed, have been specially endowed with sterility in order to prevent their confusion. This view certainly seems at first highly probable, for species living together could hardly have been kept distinct had they been capable of freely crossing. The subject is in many ways important for us, more especially as the sterility of species when first crossed, and that of their hybrid offspring, cannot have been acquired, as I shall show, by the preservation of successive profitable degrees of sterility. It is an incidental result of differences in the reproductive systems of the parent species. In treating this subject, two classes of facts, to a large extent fundamentally different, have generally been confounded, namely the sterility of species when first crossed, and the sterility of the hybrids produced from them. Pure species have, of course, their organs of reproduction in a perfect condition. Yet when intercrossed, they produce either few or no offspring. Hybrids, on the other hand, have their reproductive organs functionally impotent, as may be clearly seen in the state of the male element in both plants and animals. Though the formative organs themselves are perfect in structure, as far as the microscope reveals. In the first case, the two sexual elements which go to form the embryo are perfect. 
In the second case, they are either not at all developed or are imperfectly developed. This distinction is important when the cause of the sterility, which is common to the two cases, has to be considered. The distinction probably has been slurred over, owing to the sterility in both cases being looked on as a special endowment, beyond the province of our reasoning powers. The fertility of varieties, that is, of the forms known or believed to be descended from common parents, when crossed, and likewise the fertility of their mongrel offspring, is, with reference to my theory, of equal importance with the sterility of species, for it seems to make a broad and clear distinction between varieties and species. Degrees of Sterility First, for the sterility of species when crossed, and of their hybrid offspring. It is impossible to study the several memoirs and works of those two conscientious and admirable observers, Kohlreuter and Gartner, who almost devoted their lives to this subject, without being deeply impressed with the high generality of some degree of sterility. Kohlreuter makes the rule universal, but then he cuts the knot, for in ten cases in which he found two forms, considered by most authors as distinct species, quite fertile together, he unhesitatingly ranks them as varieties. Gartner, also, makes the rule equally universal, and he disputes the entire fertility of Kohlreuter's ten cases. But in these, and in many other cases, Gartner is obliged carefully to count the seeds in order to show that there is any degree of sterility. He always compares the maximum number of seeds produced by two species when first crossed, and the maximum produced by their hybrid offspring, with the average number produced by both pure parent species in a state of nature. But causes of serious error here intervene. A plant, to be hybridized, must be castrated, and what is often more important, must be secluded in order to prevent pollen being brought to it by insects from other plants. Nearly all the plants experimented on by Gartner were potted, and were kept in a chamber in his house. That these processes are often injurious to the fertility of a plant cannot be doubted, for Gartner gives in his table about a score of cases of plants which he castrated, and artificially fertilized with their own pollen, and, excluding all cases such as leguminosae, in which there is an acknowledged difficulty in the manipulation, half of these twenty plants had their fertility in some degree impaired. Moreover, as Gartner repeatedly crossed some forms, such as the common red and blue pimpernels, Anagallis arvensis and Carulia, which the best botanists rank as varieties, and found them absolutely sterile, we may doubt whether many species are really so sterile when intercrossed as he believed. It is certain, on the one hand, that the sterility of various species when crossed is so different in degree, and graduates away so insensibly, and, on the other hand, that the sterility of pure species is so easily affected by various circumstances, that for all practical purposes it is most difficult to say where perfect fertility ends and sterility begins. I think no better evidence of this can be required than that the two most experienced observers who have ever lived, namely Kohlreuter and Gartner, arrived at diametrically opposite conclusions in regard to some of the very same forms. It is also most instructive to compare, but I have not space here to enter on details, the evidence advanced by our best botanists on the question whether certain doubtful forms should be ranked as species or varieties, with the evidence from fertility adduced by different hybridizers or by the same observer from experiments made during different years. It can thus be shown that neither sterility nor fertility affords any certain distinction between species and varieties. The evidence from this source graduates away, 
and is doubtful in the same degree as is the evidence derived from other constitutional and structural differences. In regard to the sterility of hybrids in successive generations, though Gartner was enabled to rear some hybrids, carefully guarding them from a cross with either pure parent for six or seven, and in one case for ten generations, yet he asserts positively that their fertility never increases, but generally decreases greatly and suddenly. With respect to this decrease, it may first be noticed that when any deviation in structure or constitution is common to both parents, this is often transmitted in an augmented degree to the offspring, and both sexual elements in hybrid plants are already affected in some degree. But I believe that their fertility has been diminished in nearly all these cases by an independent cause, namely by too close interbreeding. I have made so many experiments and collected so many facts, showing on the one hand that an occasional cross with a distinct individual or variety increases the vigour and fertility of the offspring, and on the other hand that very close interbreeding lessens their vigour and fertility, that I cannot doubt the correctness of this conclusion. Hybrids are seldom raised by experimentalists in great numbers, and as the parent species, or other allied hybrids, generally grow in the same garden, the visits of insects must be carefully prevented during the flowering season. Hence hybrids, if left to themselves, will generally be fertilised during each generation by pollen from the same flower, and this would probably be injurious to their fertility, already lessened by their hybrid origin. I am strengthened in this conviction by a remarkable statement repeatedly made by Gartner, namely, that if even the less fertile hybrids be artificially fertilised with hybrid pollen of the same kind, their fertility, notwithstanding the frequent ill effects from manipulation, sometimes decidedly increases and goes on increasing. Now, in the process of artificial fertilization, pollen is as often taken by chance, as I know from my own experience, from the anthers of another flower, as from the anthers of the flower itself which is to be fertilized. So that a cross between two flowers, though probably often on the same plant, would be thus effected. Moreover, Whenever complicated experiments are in progress, so careful an observer as Gartner would have castrated his hybrids, and this would have ensured in each generation a cross with pollen from a distinct flower, either from the same plant or from another plant of the same hybrid nature. Thus, the strange fact of an increase in fertility in the successive generations of artificially fertilized hybrids in contrast with those spontaneously self-fertilized, may, as I believe, be accounted for by too close interbreeding having been avoided. Now let us turn to the results arrived at by a third most experienced hybridizer, namely the Honourable and Reverend W. Herbert. He is as emphatic in his conclusion that some hybrids are perfectly fertile, as fertile as the pure parent species, as are Kohlreuter and Gartner, that some degree of sterility between distinct species is a universal law of nature. He experimented on some of the very same species as did Gartner. The difference in their results may, I think, be in part accounted for by Herbert's great horticultural skill, and by his having hothouses at his command. Of his many important statements, I will here give only a single one as an example, namely that, quote, Every ovule in a pod of Crinum capense, fertilized by Crinum revolutum, produced a plant which I never saw to occur in a case of its natural fecundation. Unquote. So that here we have perfect, or even more than commonly perfect, fertility in a cross between two distinct species. This case of the crinum leads me to refer to a singular fact, 
namely that individual plants of certain species of lobelia, verbascum and passiflora, can easily be fertilized by the pollen from a distinct species, but not by pollen from the same plant, though this pollen can be proved to be perfectly sound by fertilizing other plants or species. In the genus Hippeastrum, in Corydalis, as shown by Professor Hildebrand, in various orchids, as shown by Mr. Scott and Fritz Muller, all the individuals are in this peculiar condition, so that with some species certain abnormal individuals, and in other species all the individuals, can actually be hybridized much more readily than they can be fertilized by pollen from the same individual plant. To give one instance, a bulb of Hippeastrum orlicum produced four flowers. Three were fertilized by Herbert with their own pollen, and the fourth was subsequently fertilized by the pollen of a compound hybrid, descended from three distinct species. The result was that, quote, the ovaries of the three first flowers soon ceased to grow, and after a few days perished entirely, whereas the pod impregnated by the pollen of the hybrid made vigorous growth and rapid progress to maturity, and bore good seed which vegetated freely. Unquote. Mr. Herbert tried similar experiments during many years, and always with the same result. These cases serve to show on what slight and mysterious causes the lesser or greater fertility of a species sometimes depends. The practical experiments of horticulturists, though not made with scientific precision, deserve some notice. It is notorious in how complicated a manner the species of Pelagonium, Fuchsia, Calceolaria, Petunia, Rhododendron, etc., have been crossed, yet many of these hybrids seed freely. For instance, Herbert asserts that a hybrid from Calceolaria integrifolia and Plantaginea, species most widely dissimilar in general habit, quote, reproduces itself as perfectly as if it had been a natural species from the mountains of Chile, unquote. I have taken some pains to ascertain the degree of fertility of some of the complex crosses of rhododendrons, and I am assured that many of them are perfectly fertile. Mr. C. Noble, for instance, informs me that he raises stocks for grafting from a hybrid between Rhododendron ponticum and Catorbiense, and that this hybrid, quote, seeds as freely as it is possible to imagine, unquote. Had hybrids, when fairly treated, always gone on decreasing in fertility in each successive generation, as Gartner believed to be the case, the fact would have been notorious to nurserymen. Horticulturists raise large beds of the same hybrid, and such alone are fairly treated, for by insect agency the several individuals are allowed to cross freely with each other, and the injurious influence of close interbreeding is thus prevented. Anyone may readily convince himself of the efficiency of insect agency by examining the flowers of the more sterile kinds of hybrid rhododendrons, which produce no pollen, for he will find on their stigmas plenty of pollen brought from other flowers. In regard to animals, much fewer experiments have been carefully tried than with plants. If our systematic arrangements can be trusted, that is, if the genera of animals are as distinct from each other as are the genera of plants, then we may infer that animals more widely distinct in the scale of nature can be crossed more easily than in the case of plants. But the hybrids themselves are, I think, more sterile. It should, however, be borne in mind that, owing to few animals breeding freely under confinement, few experiments have been fairly tried. For instance, the canary bird has been crossed with nine distinct species of finches, but, as not one of these breeds freely in confinement, we have no right to expect that the first crosses between them and the canary, or that their hybrids, should be perfectly fertile. 
Again, with respect to the fertility in successive generations of the more fertile hybrid animals, I hardly know of an instance in which two families of the same hybrid have been raised at the same time from different parents, so as to avoid the ill effects of close interbreeding. On the contrary, brothers and sisters have usually been crossed in each successive generation, in opposition to the constantly repeated admonition of every breeder, and in this case it is not at all surprising that the inherent sterility in the hybrids should have gone on increasing. Although I know of hardly any thoroughly well-authenticated cases of perfectly fertile hybrid animals, I have reason to believe that the hybrids from Servulus vaginalis and Rivesii, and from Fasianus colchicus with Fasianus torquatus, are perfectly fertile. M. Catrophage states that the hybrids from two moths, Bombyx cynthia and Arindia, were proved in Paris to be fertile in to say for eight generations. It has lately been asserted that two such distinct species as the hare and rabbit, when they can be got to breed together, produce offspring which are highly fertile when crossed with one of the parent species. The hybrids from the common and Chinese geese, a signoides, species which are so different that they are generally ranked in distinct genera, have often bred in this country with either pure parent, and in one single instance they have bred into say. This was effected by Mr. Ayton, who raised two hybrids from the same parents but from different hatches, and from these two birds he raised no less than eight hybrids grandchildren of the pure geese, from one nest. In India, however, these cross-bred geese must be far more fertile, for I am assured by two eminently capable judges, namely Mr. Blythe and Captain Hutton, that whole flocks of these crossed geese are kept in various parts of the country, and as they are kept for profit, where neither pure parent species exists, they must certainly be highly or perfectly fertile. With our domesticated animals, the various races, when crossed together, are quite fertile, yet in many cases they are descended from two or more wild species. From this fact we must conclude either that the aboriginal parent species at first produced perfectly fertile hybrids, or that the hybrids subsequently reared under domestication became quite fertile. This latter alternative, which was first propounded by Pallas, seems by far the most probable, and can indeed hardly be doubted. It is, for instance, almost certain that our dogs are descended from several wild stocks, yet, with perhaps the exception of certain indigenous domestic dogs of South America, all are quite fertile together. But analogy makes me greatly doubt whether the several aboriginal species would at first have freely bred together and have produced quite fertile hybrids. So again I have lately acquired decisive evidence that the cross-bred offspring from the Indian humped and common cattle are in to say perfectly fertile, and from the observations by Rutimeyer on their important osteological differences, as well as from those by Mr. Blythe on their differences in habits, voice, constitution, etc., these two forms must be regarded as good and distinct species. The same remarks may be extended to the two chief races of the pig. We must, therefore, either give up the belief of the universal sterility of species when crossed, or we must look at this sterility in animals not as an indelible characteristic, but as one capable of being removed by domestication. Finally, considering all the ascertained facts on the intercrossing of plants and animals, it may be concluded that some degree of sterility, both in first crosses and in hybrids, is an extremely general result but that it cannot, under our present state of knowledge, be considered as absolutely universal. Laws Governing the Sterility of First Crosses and Hybrids 
We will now consider a little more in detail the laws governing the sterility of first crosses and of hybrids. Our chief object will be to see whether or not these laws indicate that species have been specially endowed with this quality, in order to prevent their crossing and blending together in utter confusion. The following conclusions are drawn up chiefly from Gartner's admirable work on the hybridization of plants. I have taken much pains to ascertain how far they apply to animals, and considering how scanty our knowledge is in regard to hybrid animals, I have been surprised to find how generally the same rules apply to both kingdoms. It has been already remarked that the degree of fertility, both of first crosses and of hybrids, graduates from zero to perfect fertility. It is surprising in how many curious ways this gradation can be shown, but only the barest outline of the facts can here be given. When pollen from a plant of one family is placed on the stigma of a plant of a distinct family, it exerts no more influence than so much inorganic dust. From this absolute zero of fertility, the pollen of different species applied to the stigma of one species of the same genus yields a perfect gradation in the number of seeds produced, up to nearly complete or even quite complete fertility, and, as we have seen, in certain abnormal cases, even to an excess of fertility, beyond that which the plant's own pollen produces. So in hybrids themselves there are some which never have produced, and probably never would produce, even with the pollen of the pure parents, a single fertile seed. But in some of these cases a first trace of fertility may be detected, by the pollen of one of the pure parent species causing the flower of the hybrid to wither earlier than it otherwise would have done, and the early withering of the flower is well known to be a sign of incipient fertilization. From this extreme degree of sterility we have self-fertilized hybrids producing a greater and greater number of seeds up to perfect fertility. The hybrids raised from two species which are very difficult to cross and which rarely produce any offspring, are generally very sterile. But the parallelism between the difficulty of making a first cross and the sterility of the hybrids thus produced, two classes of facts which are generally confounded together, is by no means strict. There are many cases in which two pure species, as in the genus Verbascum, can be united with unusual facility, and produce numerous hybrid offspring, yet these hybrids are remarkably sterile. On the other hand, there are species which can be crossed very rarely, or with extreme difficulty, but the hybrids, when at last produced, are very fertile. Even within the limits of the same genus, for instance in Dianthus, these two opposite cases occur. The fertility both of first crosses and of hybrids, is more easily affected by unfavourable conditions than is that of pure species. But the fertility of first crosses is likewise innately variable, for it is not always the same in degree when the same two species are crossed under the same circumstances. It depends in part upon the constitution of the individuals which happen to have been chosen for the experiment. So it is with hybrids, for their degree of fertility is often found to differ greatly in the several individuals raised from seed out of the same capsule and exposed to the same conditions. By the term systematic affinity is meant the general resemblance between species in structure and constitution. Now the fertility of first crosses, and of the hybrids produced from them, is largely governed by their systematic affinity. This is clearly shown by hybrids never having been raised between species ranked by systematists in distinct families, and on the other hand by very closely allied species generally uniting with facility. But the correspondence between systematic affinity 
and the facility of crossing is by no means strict. A multitude of cases could be given of very closely allied species which will not unite, or only with extreme difficulty, and on the other hand of very distinct species which unite with the utmost facility. In the same family there may be a genus, as Dianthus, in which very many species can most readily be crossed, and another genus, as Silene, in which the most persevering efforts have failed to produce, between extremely close species, a single hybrid. Even within the limits of the same genus, we meet with this same difference. For instance, the many species of Nicotiana have been more largely crossed than the species of almost any other genus. But Gardner found that Nicotiana acuminata, which is not a particularly distinct species, obstinately failed to fertilize, or to be fertilized, by no less than eight other species of Nicotiana. Many analogous facts could be given. No one has been able to point out what kind or what amount of difference, in any recognizable character, is sufficient to prevent two species crossing. It can be shown that plants most widely different in habit and general appearance, and having strongly marked differences in every part of the flower, even in the pollen, in the fruit, and in the cotyledons, can be crossed. Annual and perennial plants, deciduous and evergreen trees, plants inhabiting different stations, and fitted for extremely different climates, can often be crossed with ease. By a reciprocal cross between two species, I mean the case, for instance, of a female ass being first crossed by a stallion, and then a mare by a male ass, these two species may then be said to have been reciprocally crossed. There is often the widest possible difference in the facility of making reciprocal crosses. Such cases are highly important, for they prove that the capacity in any two species to cross is often completely independent of their systematic affinity, that is, of any difference in their structure or constitution, excepting in their reproductive systems. The diversity of the result in reciprocal crosses between the same two species was long ago observed by Kohlreuter. To give an instance, Mirabilis jalapa can easily be fertilized by the pollen of Mirabilis longiflora, and the hybrids thus produced are sufficiently fertile. But Kohlreuter tried more than two hundred times during eight following years to fertilize reciprocally Mirabilis longiflora with the pollen of Mirabilis jalapa, and utterly failed. Several other equally striking cases could be given. Thure has observed the same fact with certain seaweeds or fuci. Gardner, moreover, found that this difference of facility in making reciprocal crosses is extremely common in a lesser degree. He has observed it even between closely related forms, as Matthiola annua and Glabra, which many botanists rank only as varieties. It is also a remarkable fact that hybrids raised from reciprocal crosses, though of course compounded of the very same two species, the one species having first been used as the father and then as the mother, though they rarely differ in external characters, yet generally differ in fertility, in a small and occasionally in a high degree. Several other singular rules could be given from Gartner. For instance, some species have a remarkable power of crossing with other species. Other species of the same genus have a remarkable power of impressing their likeness on their hybrid offspring. But these two powers do not at all necessarily go together. There are certain hybrids which, instead of having, as is usual, an intermediate character between their two parents, always closely resemble one of them and such hybrids, though externally so like one of their pure parent species, are with rare exceptions extremely sterile. So again, among hybrids which are usually intermediate in structure between their parents, 
exceptional and abnormal individuals sometimes are born, which closely resemble one of their pure parents. And these hybrids are almost always utterly sterile, even when the other hybrids raised from seed from the same capsule have a considerable degree of fertility. These facts show how completely the fertility of a hybrid may be independent of its external resemblance to either pure parent. Considering the several rules now given, which govern the fertility of first crosses and of hybrids, we see that when forms, which must be considered as good and distinct species, are united, their fertility graduates from zero to perfect fertility, or even to fertility under certain conditions in excess. That their fertility, besides being eminently susceptible to favourable and unfavourable conditions, is innately variable, that it is by no means always the same in degree in the first cross and in the hybrids produced from this cross, that the fertility of hybrids is not related to the degree in which they resemble in external appearance either parent, and lastly, that the facility of making a first cross between any two species is not always governed by their systematic affinity or degree of resemblance to each other. This latter statement is clearly proved by the difference in the result of reciprocal crosses between the same two species, for, according as the one species or the other is used as the father or the mother, there is generally some difference, and occasionally the widest possible difference, in the facility of effecting a union. The hybrids, moreover, produced from reciprocal crosses, often differ in fertility. Now, do these complex and singular rules indicate that species have been endowed with sterility simply to prevent their becoming confounded in nature? I think not. For why should the sterility be so extremely different in degree, when various species are crossed, all of which we must suppose it would be equally important to keep from blending together? Why should the degree of sterility be innately variable in the individuals of the same species? Why should some species cross with facility, and yet produce very sterile hybrids, and other species cross with extreme difficulty, and yet produce fairly fertile hybrids? Why should there often be so great a difference in the result of a reciprocal cross between the same two species? Why, it may be asked, has the production of hybrids been permitted? To grant to species the same power of producing hybrids, and then to stop their further propagation by different degrees of sterility, not strictly related to the facility of the first union between their parents, seems a strange arrangement. The foregoing rules and facts, on the other hand, appear to me clearly to indicate that the sterility, both of first crosses and of hybrids, is simply incidental, or dependent on unknown differences in their reproductive systems. The differences being of so peculiar and limited a nature, that in reciprocal crosses between the same two species, the male sexual element of the one will often freely act on the female sexual element of the other, but not in a reverse direction. It will be advisable to explain a little more fully, by an example, what I mean by sterility being incidental on other differences, and not a specially endowed quality. As the capacity of one plant to be grafted or budded on another is unimportant for their welfare in a state of nature, I presume that no one will suppose that this capacity is a specially endowed quality, but will admit that it is incidental on differences in the laws of growth of the two plants. We can sometimes see the reason why one tree will not take on another from differences in their rate of growth, in the hardness of their wood, in the period of the flow or nature of their sap, etc. But in a multitude of cases we can assign no reason whatsoever. Great diversity in the size of two plants, or one being woody 
and the other herbaceous, one being evergreen and the other deciduous, and adaptation to widely different climates does not always prevent the two grafting together. As in hybridization, so with grafting, the capacity is limited by systematic affinity, for no one has been able to graft together trees belonging to quite distinct families. And, on the other hand, closely allied species and varieties of the same species can usually, but not invariably, be grafted with ease. But this capacity, as in hybridization, is by no means absolutely governed by systematic affinity, although many distinct genera within the same family have been grafted together, in other cases species of the same genus will not take on each other. A pear can be grafted far more readily on the quince, which is ranked as a distinct genus, than on the apple, which is a member of the same genus. Even different varieties of the pear take with different degrees of facility on the quince, so do different varieties of the apricot and peach on certain varieties of the plum. As Gartner found that there was sometimes an innate difference in different individuals of the same two species in crossing, so Sagare believes this to be the case with different individuals of the same two species in being grafted together. As in reciprocal crosses, the facility of effecting a union is often very far from equal, so it sometimes is in grafting. The common gooseberry, for instance, cannot be grafted on the current, whereas the current will take, though with difficulty, on the gooseberry. We have seen that the sterility of hybrids, which have their reproductive organs in an imperfect condition, is a different case from the difficulty of uniting two pure species, which have their reproductive organs perfect. Yet these two distinct classes of cases run to a large extent parallel. Something analogous occurs in grafting, for Thuin found that three species of Robinia, which seeded freely on their own roots, and which could be grafted with no great difficulty on a fourth species, when thus grafted were rendered barren. On the other hand, certain species of sorbus, when grafted on other species, yielded twice as much fruit as when on their own roots. We are reminded by this latter fact of the extraordinary cases of Hippiastrum, Passiflora, etc., which seed much more freely when fertilized by the pollen of a distinct species than when fertilized with pollen from the same plant. We thus see that, although there is a clear and great difference between the mere adhesion of grafted stocks and the union of the male and female elements in the act of reproduction, yet that there is a rude degree of parallelism in the results of grafting and of crossing distinct species. And as we must look at the curious and complex laws governing the facility with which trees can be grafted on each other, as incidental on unknown differences in their vegetative systems, so I believe that the still more complex laws governing the facility of first crosses are incidental on unknown differences in their reproductive systems. These differences in both cases follow, to a certain extent, as might have been expected, systematic affinity, by which term every kind of resemblance and dissimilarity between organic beings is attempted to be expressed. The facts by no means seem to indicate that the greater or lesser difficulty of either grafting or crossing various species has been a special endowment, although in the case of crossing the difficulty is as important for the endurance and stability of specific forms as in the case of grafting it is unimportant for their welfare. End of section 1 of chapter 9This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life Sixth London Edition by Charles Darwin Chapter Number 9 Hybridism Section 2 of 2 Origin and Causes of the Sterility of First Crosses and of Hybrids At one time it appeared to me probable, as it has to others, that the sterility of first crosses and of hybrids might have been slowly acquired through the natural selection of slightly lessened degrees of fertility, which, like any other variation, spontaneously appeared in certain individuals of one variety when crossed with those of another variety. For it would clearly be advantageous to two varieties, or incipient species, if they could be kept from blending on the same principle that, when man is selecting at the same time two varieties, it is necessary that he should keep them separate. In the first place, it may be remarked that species inhabiting distinct regions are often sterile when crossed. Now it could clearly have been of no advantage to such separated species to have been rendered mutually sterile, and consequently this could not have been effected through natural selection. But it may perhaps be argued that, if a species was rendered sterile with some one compatriot, sterility with other species would follow as a necessary contingency. In the second place, it is almost as much opposed to the theory of natural selection as to that of special creation, that in reciprocal crosses the male element of one form should have been rendered utterly impotent on a second form while at the same time the male element of this second form is enabled freely to fertilize the first form. For this peculiar state of the reproductive system could hardly have been advantageous to either species. In considering the probability of natural selection having come into action in rendering species mutually sterile, the greatest difficulty will be found to lie in the existence of many graduated steps, from slightly lessened fertility to absolute sterility. It may be admitted that it would profit an incipient species if it were rendered in some slight degree sterile when crossed with its parent form or with some other variety. For thus fewer bastardized and deteriorated offspring would be produced to commingle their blood with the new species in process of formation. But he who will take the trouble to reflect on the steps by which this first degree of sterility could be increased through natural selection to that high degree which is common with so many species, and which is universal with species which have been differentiated to a generic or family rank, will find the subject extraordinarily complex. After mature reflection, it seems to me that this could not have been effected through natural selection. Take the case of any two species which, when crossed, produced few and sterile offspring. Now, what is there which could favour the survival of those individuals which happen to be endowed in a slightly higher degree with mutual infertility, and which thus approached by one small step towards absolute sterility? Yet an advance of this kind, if the theory of natural selection be brought to bear, must have incessantly occurred with many species, for a multitude are mutually quite barren. With sterile, neuter insects we have reason to believe that modifications in their structure and fertility have been slowly accumulated by natural selection from an advantage having been thus indirectly given to the community to which they belonged over other communities of the same species. But an individual animal, not belonging to a social community, if rendered slightly sterile when crossed with some other variety, would not thus itself gain any advantage, or indirectly give any advantage to the other individuals of the same variety, thus leading to their preservation. But it would be superfluous to discuss this question in detail, for with plants 
we have conclusive evidence that the sterility of crossed species must be due to some principle quite independent of natural selection. Both Gartner and Kohlreuter have proved that in genera including numerous species, a series can be formed from species which when crossed yield fewer and fewer seeds, to species which never produce a single seed, but yet are affected by the pollen of certain other species, for the German swells. It is here manifestly impossible to select the more sterile individuals, which have already ceased to yield seeds, so that this acme of sterility, when the German alone is affected, cannot have been gained through selection and from the laws governing the various grades of sterility being so uniform throughout the animal and vegetable kingdoms, we may infer that the cause, whatever it may be, is the same, or nearly the same, in all cases. We will now look a little closer at the probable nature of the differences between species which induce sterility in first crosses and in hybrids. In the case of first crosses, the greater or less difficulty in effecting a union and in obtaining offspring apparently depends on several distinct causes. There must sometimes be a physical impossibility in the male element reaching the ovule, as would be the case with a plant having a pistil too long for the pollen tubes to reach the ovarium. It has also been observed that when the pollen of one species is placed on the stigma of a distantly allied species, though the pollen tubes protrude, they do not penetrate the stigmatic surface. Again, the male element may reach the female element, but be incapable of causing an embryo to be developed, as seems to have been the case with some of Thuret's experiments on fuci. No explanation can be given of these facts any more than why certain trees cannot be grafted on others. Lastly, an embryo may be developed and then perish at an early period. This latter alternative has not been sufficiently attended to, but I believe, from observations communicated to me by Mr. Hewitt, who has had great experience in hybridizing pheasants and fowls, that the early death of the embryo is a very frequent cause of sterility in first crosses. Mr. Salter has recently given the results of an examination of about 500 eggs produced from various crosses between three species of Gallus and their hybrids. The majority of these eggs had been fertilized, and in the majority of the fertilized eggs the embryos had either been partially developed and had then perished, or had become nearly mature, but the young chickens had been unable to break through the shell. Of the chickens which were born, more than four-fifths died within the first few days, or at least weeks, quote, without any obvious cause, apparently from mere inability to live, unquote, so that from the five hundred eggs only twelve chickens were reared. With plants, hybridized embryos probably often perish in a like manner, at least it is known that hybrids raised from very distinct species are sometimes weak and dwarfed, and perish at an early age, of which fact Max Mitura has recently given some striking cases with hybrid willows. It may be here worth noticing that, in some cases of parthenogenesis, the embryos within the eggs of silk moths which had not been fertilized pass through their early stages of development and then perish, like the embryos produced by a cross between distinct species. Until becoming acquainted with these facts, I was unwilling to believe in the frequent early death of hybrid embryos, for hybrids, when once born, are generally healthy and long-lived, as we see in the case of the common mule. Hybrids, however, are differently circumstanced before and after birth, when born, and living in a country where their two parents live, they are generally placed under suitable conditions of life, but a hybrid partakes of only half of the nature and constitution of its mother. It may therefore, before birth, as long as it is nourished within its mother's womb, or within the egg or seed produced by the mother, 
be exposed to conditions in some degree unsuitable, and consequently be liable to perish at an early period, more especially as all very young beings are eminently sensitive to injurious or unnatural conditions of life. But after all, the cause more probably lies in some imperfection in the original act of impregnation, causing the embryo to be imperfectly developed, rather than in the conditions to which it is subsequently exposed. In regard to the sterility of hybrids, in which the sexual elements are imperfectly developed, the case is somewhat different. I have more than once alluded to a large body of facts showing that, when animals and plants are removed from their natural conditions, they are extremely liable to have their reproductive systems seriously affected. This, in fact, is the great bar to the domestication of animals. Between the sterility thus superinduced and that of hybrids, there are many points of similarity. In both cases, the sterility is independent of general health, and is often accompanied by excess of size or great luxuriance. In both cases, the sterility occurs in various degrees. In both, the male element is the most liable to be affected, but sometimes the female more than the male. In both, the tendency goes to a certain extent with systematic affinity, for whole groups of animals and plants are rendered impotent by the same unnatural conditions, and whole groups of species tend to produce sterile hybrids. On the other hand, one species in a group will sometimes resist great changes of conditions with unimpaired fertility, and certain species in a group will produce unusually fertile hybrids. No one can tell, till he tries, whether any particular animal will breed under confinement, or any exotic plant seed freely under culture, nor can he tell till he tries whether any two species of a genus will produce more or less sterile hybrids. Lastly, when organic beings are placed during several generations under conditions not natural to them, they are extremely liable to vary, which seems to be partly due to their reproductive systems having been specially affected, though in a lesser degree than when sterility ensues. So it is with hybrids, for their offspring in successive generations are eminently liable to vary, as every experimentalist has observed. Thus we see that when organic beings are placed under new and unnatural conditions, and when hybrids are produced by the unnatural crossing of two species, the reproductive system, independently of the general state of health, is affected in a very similar manner. In the one case, the conditions of life have been disturbed, though often in so slight a degree as to be inappreciable by us. In the other case, or that of hybrids, the external conditions have remained the same, but the organization has been disturbed by two distinct structures and constitutions, including, of course, the reproductive systems, having been blended into one. For it is scarcely possible that two organizations should be compounded into one without some disturbance occurring in the development or periodical action, or mutual relations of the different parts and organs one to another, or to the conditions of life. When hybrids are able to breed into say, they transmit to their offspring from generation to generation the same compounded organization, and hence we need not be surprised that their sterility, though in some cases variable, does not diminish. It is even apt to increase this being generally the result, as before explained, of too close interbreeding. The above view of the sterility of hybrids being caused by two conditions being compounded into one has been strongly maintained by Max Wichura. It must, however, be owned that we cannot understand, on the above or any other view, several facts with respect to the sterility of hybrids, for instance, the unequal fertility of hybrids produced with reciprocal crosses, 
or the increased sterility in those hybrids which occasionally and exceptionally resemble closely either pure parent. Nor do I pretend that the foregoing remarks go to the root of the matter. No explanation is offered why an organism, when placed under unnatural conditions, is rendered sterile. All that I have attempted to show is that in two cases, in some respects allied, sterility is the common result, in the one case from the conditions of life having been disturbed, in the other case from the organization having been disturbed by two organizations being compounded into one. A simple parallelism holds good with an allied yet very different class of facts. It is an old and almost universal belief, founded on a considerable body of evidence, which I have elsewhere given, that slight changes in the conditions of life are beneficial to all living things. We see this acted on by farmers and gardeners in their frequent exchanges of seed, tubers, etc., from one soil or climate to another and back again. During the convalescence of animals, great benefit is derived from almost any change in the habits of life. Again, both with plants and animals, there is the clearest evidence that a cross between individuals of the same species, which differ to a certain extent, gives vigour and fertility to the offspring, and that close interbreeding, continued during several generations, between the nearest relations, if these be kept under the same conditions of life, almost always leads to decreased size, weakness or sterility. Hence it seems that, on the one hand, slight changes in the conditions of life benefit all organic beings, and on the other hand that slight crosses, that is, crosses between the males and females of the same species, which have been subjected to slightly different conditions, or which have been slightly varied, give vigour and fertility to the offspring. But, as we have seen, organic beings long habituated to certain uniform conditions under a state of nature, when subjected, as under confinement, to a considerable change in their conditions, very frequently are rendered more or less sterile, and we know that a cross between two forms that have become widely or specifically different produce hybrids which are almost always in some degree sterile. I am fully persuaded that this double parallelism is by no means an accident or an illusion. He who is able to explain why the elephant and a multitude of other animals are incapable of breeding when kept under only partial confinement in their native country will be able to explain the primary cause of hybrids being so generally sterile. He will at the same time be able to explain how it is that the races of some of our domesticated animals, which have often been subjected to new and not uniform conditions, are quite fertile together, although they are descended from distinct species which would probably have been sterile if aboriginally crossed. The above two parallel series of facts seem to be connected together by some common but unknown bond which is essentially related to the principle of life. This principle, according to Mr. Herbert Spencer, being that life depends on, or consists in, the incessant action and reaction of various forces, which, as throughout nature, are always tending towards an equilibrium. And when this tendency is slightly disturbed by any change, the vital forces gain in power. Reciprocal Dimorphism and Trimorphism This subject may be here briefly discussed, and will be found to throw some light on hybridism. Several plants belonging to distinct orders present two forms, which exist in about equal numbers, and which differ in no respect except in their reproductive organs. One form having a long pistil with short stamens, the other a short pistil with long stamens, the two having differently sized pollen grains. With trimorphic plants there are three forms likewise differing in the lengths of their pistils and stamens, in the size and colour of the pollen grains, 
and in some other respects. And as in each of the three forms there are two sets of stamens, the three forms possess altogether six sets of stamens and three kinds of pistils. These organs are so proportioned in length to each other that half the stamens in two of the forms stand on a level with the stigma of the third form. Now I have shown, and the result has been confirmed by other observers, that in order to obtain full fertility with these plants, it is necessary that the stigma of the one form should be fertilized by the pollen taken from the stamens of corresponding height in another form, so that with dimorphic species two unions, which may be called legitimate, are fully fertile, and two, which may be called illegitimate, are more or less infertile. With trimorphic species, six unions are legitimate, or fully fertile, and twelve are illegitimate, or more or less infertile. The infertility which may be observed in various dimorphic and trimorphic plants, when they are illegitimately fertilized, that is by pollen taken from stamens not corresponding in height with the pistil, differs much in degree, up to absolute and utter sterility just in the same manner as occurs in crossing distinct species. As the degree of sterility in the latter case depends in an eminent degree on the conditions of life being more or less favourable, so I have found it with illegitimate unions, it is well known that if pollen of a distinct species be placed on the stigma of a flower, and its own pollen be afterwards, even after a considerable interval of time, placed on the same stigma, its action is so strongly prepotent that it generally annihilates the effect of the foreign pollen. So it is with the pollen of the several forms of the same species, for legitimate pollen is strongly prepotent over illegitimate pollen, when both are placed on the same stigma. I ascertained this by fertilizing several flowers, first illegitimately, and twenty-four hours afterwards legitimately, with pollen taken from a peculiarly coloured variety, and all the seedlings were similarly coloured. This shows that the legitimate pollen, though applied twenty-four hours subsequently, had wholly destroyed or prevented the action of the previously applied illegitimate pollen. Again, as in making reciprocal crosses between the same two species, there is occasionally a great difference in the result, so the same thing occurs in trimorphic plants. For instance, the mid-styled form of Lythrum salicaria was illegitimately fertilized with the greatest ease by pollen from the longer stamens of the short-styled form, and yielded many seeds. But the latter form did not yield a single seed when fertilized by the longer stamens of the mid-styled form. In all these respects, and in others which might be added, the forms of the same undoubted species, when illegitimately united, behave in exactly the same manner as do two distinct species when crossed. This led me carefully to observe, during four years, many seedlings raised from several illegitimate unions. The chief result is that these illegitimate plants, as they may be called, are not fully fertile. It is possible to raise from dimorphic species both long-styled and short-styled illegitimate plants, and from trimorphic plants all three illegitimate forms. These can then be properly united in a legitimate manner. When this is done, there is no apparent reason why they should not yield as many seeds as did their parents when legitimately fertilized. But this is not the case. They are all infertile in various degrees, some being so utterly and incurably sterile that they do not yield during four seasons a single seed or even seed capsule. The sterility of these illegitimate plants, when united with each other in a legitimate manner, may be strictly compared with that of hybrids when crossed into se. If, on the other hand, a hybrid is crossed with either pure parent species, the sterility is usually much lessened and so it is when an illegitimate plant is fertilized by a legitimate plant. 
In the same manner as the sterility of hybrids does not always run parallel with the difficulty of making the first cross between the two parent species, so that sterility of certain illegitimate plants was unusually great, while the sterility of the union from which they were derived was by no means great. With hybrids raised from the same seed capsule, the degree of sterility is innately variable, so it is in a marked manner with the illegitimate plants. Lastly, many hybrids are profuse and persistent flowerers, while other and more sterile hybrids produce few flowers and are weak, miserable dwarfs. Exactly similar cases occur with the illegitimate offspring of various dimorphic and trimorphic plants. Altogether, there is the closest identity in character and behavior between illegitimate plants and hybrids. It is hardly an exaggeration to maintain that illegitimate plants are hybrids, produced within the limits of the same species by the improper union of certain forms, while ordinary hybrids are produced from an improper union between so-called distinct species. We have also already seen that there is the closest similarity in all respects between first illegitimate unions and first crosses between distinct species. This will perhaps be made more fully apparent by an illustration. We may suppose that a botanist found two well-marked varieties, and such occur, of the long-styled form of the trimorphic Lythrum salicaria, and that he determined to try by crossing whether they were specifically distinct. He would find that they yielded only about one-fifth of the proper number of seed, and that they behaved in all the other above specified respects as if they had been two distinct species. But to make the case sure, he would raise plants from his supposed hybridized seed, and he would find that the seedlings were miserably dwarfed and utterly sterile and that they behaved in all other respects like ordinary hybrids. He might then maintain that he had actually proved, in accordance with the common view, that his two varieties were as good and as distinct species as any in the world, but he would be completely mistaken. The facts now given on dimorphic and trimorphic plants are important, because they show us, first, that the physiological test of lessened fertility both in first crosses and in hybrids, is no safe criterion of specific distinction. Secondly, because we may conclude that there is some unknown bond which connects the infertility of illegitimate unions with that of their illegitimate offspring, and we are led to extend the same view to first crosses and hybrids. Thirdly, because we find, and this seems to me of special importance, that two or three forms of the same species may exist and may differ in no respect whatever, either in structure or in constitution, relatively to external conditions, and yet be sterile when united in certain ways. For we must remember that it is the union of the sexual elements of individuals of the same form, for instance, of two long-styled forms, which results in sterility while it is the union of the sexual elements proper to two distinct forms which is fertile. Hence the case appears at first sight exactly the reverse of what occurs in the ordinary unions of the individuals of the same species and with crosses between distinct species. It is, however, doubtful whether this is really so, but I will not enlarge on this obscure subject. We may, however, infer as probable from the consideration of dimorphic and trimorphic plants that the sterility of distinct species when crossed and of their hybrid progeny depends exclusively on the nature of their sexual elements and not on any difference in their structure or general constitution. We are also led to this same conclusion by considering reciprocal crosses in which the male of one species cannot be united or can be united with great difficulty, with the female of a second species, while the converse cross can be effected with perfect facility. That excellent observer, Gartner, 
likewise concluded that species, when crossed, are sterile, owing to differences confined to their reproductive systems. Fertility of varieties when crossed, and of their mongrel offspring, not universal. It may be urged, as an overwhelming argument, that there must be some essential distinction between species and varieties, inasmuch as the latter, however much they may differ from each other in external appearance, cross with perfect facility, and yield perfectly fertile offspring. With some exceptions, presently to be given, I fully admit that this is the rule, but the subject is surrounded by difficulties, for, looking to varieties produced under nature, if two forms hitherto reputed to be varieties be found in any degree sterile together, they are at once ranked by most naturalists as species. For instance, the blue and red pimpernel, which are considered by most botanists as varieties, are said by Gartner to be quite sterile when crossed, and he consequently ranks them as undoubted species. If we thus argue in a circle, the fertility of all varieties produced under nature will assuredly have to be granted. If we turn to varieties produced or supposed to have been produced under domestication, we are still involved in some doubt. For when it is stated, for instance, that certain South American indigenous domestic dogs do not readily unite with European dogs, the explanation which will occur to everyone, and probably the true one, is that they are descended from aboriginally distinct species. Nevertheless, the perfect fertility of so many domestic races, differing widely from each other in appearance, for instance those of the pigeon or of the cabbage, is a remarkable fact, more especially when we reflect how many species there are which, though resembling each other most closely, are utterly sterile when intercrossed. Several considerations, however, render the fertility of domestic varieties less remarkable. In the first place it may be observed that the amount of external difference between two species is no sure guide to their degree of mutual sterility, so that similar differences in the case of varieties would be no sure guide. It is certain that with species the cause lies exclusively in differences in their sexual constitution. Now the varying conditions to which domesticated animals and cultivated plants have been subjected have had so little tendency towards modifying the reproductive system in a manner leading to mutual sterility that we have good grounds for admitting the directly opposite doctrine of Pallas, namely, that such conditions generally eliminate this tendency, so that the domesticated descendants of species which in their natural state probably would have been in some degree sterile when crossed, become perfectly fertile together. With plants, so far is cultivation from giving a tendency towards sterility between distinct species, that in several well-authenticated cases already alluded to, certain plants have been affected in an opposite manner, for they have become self-impotent while still retaining the capacity of fertilizing and being fertilized by other species. If the Palaisian doctrine of the elimination of sterility through long-continued domestication be admitted, and it can hardly be rejected, it becomes in the highest degree improbable that similar conditions long-continued should likewise induce this tendency though in certain cases, with species having a peculiar constitution, sterility might occasionally be thus caused. Thus, as I believe, we can understand why, with domesticated animals, varieties have not been produced which are mutually sterile, and why with plants only a few such cases, immediately to be given, have been observed. The real difficulty in our present subject is not, as it appears to me, why domestic varieties have not become mutually infertile when crossed, but why this has so generally occurred with natural varieties, as soon as they have been permanently modified in a sufficient degree to take rank as species. We are far from precisely knowing the cause, 
nor is this surprising, seeing how profoundly ignorant we are in regard to the normal and abnormal action of the reproductive system. But we can see that species, owing to their struggle for existence with numerous competitors, will have been exposed during long periods of time to more uniform conditions than have domestic varieties, and this may well make a wide difference in the result for we know how commonly wild animals and plants, when taken from their natural conditions and subjected to captivity, are rendered sterile, and the reproductive functions of organic beings which have always lived under natural conditions would probably, in like manner, be eminently sensitive to the influence of an unnatural cross. Domesticated productions, on the other hand, which, as shown by the mere fact of their domestication, were not originally highly sensitive to changes in their conditions of life, and which can now generally resist with undiminished fertility repeated changes of conditions, might be expected to produce varieties which would be little liable to have their reproductive powers injuriously affected by the act of crossing with other varieties which had originated in a like manner. I have as yet spoken as if the varieties of the same species were invariably fertile when intercrossed. But it is impossible to resist the evidence of the existence of a certain amount of sterility in the few following cases which I will briefly abstract. The evidence is at least as good as that from which we believe in the sterility of a multitude of species. The evidence is also derived from hostile witnesses who in all other cases consider fertility and sterility as safe criterions of specific distinction. Gardner kept, during several years, a dwarf kind of maize with yellow seeds and a tall variety with red seeds growing near each other in his garden. And although these plants have separated sexes, they never naturally crossed. He then fertilized thirteen flowers of the one kind with pollen of the other, but only a single head produced any seed, and this one head produced only five grains. Manipulation in this case could not have been injurious, as the plants have separated sexes. No one, I believe, has suspected that these varieties of maize are distinct species and it is important to notice that the hybrid plants thus raised were themselves perfectly fertile, so that even Gartner did not venture to consider the two varieties as specifically distinct. Giroud de Bouzarang crossed three varieties of gourd, which, like the maize, had separated sexes, and he asserts that their mutual fertilization is by so much the less easy as their differences are greater. How far these experiments may be trusted, I know not, but the forms experimented on are ranked by Sagaret, who mainly founds his classification by the test of infertility as varieties, and Naudin has come to the same conclusion. The following case is far more remarkable, and seems at first incredible, but it is the result of an astonishing number of experiments made during many years on nine species of verbascum, by so good an observer and so hostile a witness as Gartner, namely that the yellow and white varieties, when crossed, produce less seed than the similarly coloured varieties of the same species. However, he asserts that, when yellow and white varieties of one species are crossed with yellow and white varieties of a distinct species, more seed is produced by the crosses between the similarly coloured flowers than between those which are differently coloured. Mr. Scott also has experimented on the species and varieties of verbascum, and although unable to confirm Gartner's results on the crossing of the distinct species, he finds that the dissimilarly coloured varieties of the same species yield fewer seeds, in the proportion of 86 to 100, than the similarly coloured varieties. Yet these varieties differ in no respect, except in the colour of their flowers, and one variety can sometimes be raised from the seed of another. Kohlreuter, whose accuracy has been confirmed by every subsequent observer, 
has proved the remarkable fact that one particular variety of the common tobacco was more fertile than the other varieties when crossed with a widely distinct species. He experimented on five forms, which are commonly reputed to be varieties, and which he tested by the severest trial, namely, by reciprocal crosses, and he found their mongrel offspring perfectly fertile. But one of these five varieties, when used either as the father or mother, and crossed with the Nicotiana glutinosa, always yielded hybrids not so sterile as those which were produced from the four other varieties when crossed with Nicotiana glutinosa. Hence the reproductive system of this one variety must have been in some manner and in some degree modified. From these facts it can no longer be maintained that varieties when crossed are invariably quite fertile. From the great difficulty of ascertaining the infertility of varieties in a state of nature, for a supposed variety, if proved to be infertile in any degree, would almost universally be ranked as a species, for man attending only to external characters in his domestic varieties, and from such varieties not having been exposed for very long periods to uniform conditions of life, from these several considerations we may conclude that fertility does not constitute a fundamental distinction between varieties and species when crossed. The general sterility of crossed species may safely be looked at, not as a special acquirement or endowment, but as incidental on changes of an unknown nature in their sexual elements. Hybrids and mongrels compared independently of their fertility. Independently of the question of fertility, the offspring of species and of varieties when crossed may be compared in several other respects. Gartner, whose strong wish it was to draw a distinct line between species and varieties, could find very few, and, as it seems to me, quite unimportant differences between the so-called hybrid offspring of species and the so-called mongrel offspring of varieties, and on the other hand they agree most closely in many important respects. I shall here discuss this subject with extreme brevity. The most important distinction is that in the first generation mongrels are more variable than hybrids, but Gartner admits that hybrids from species which have long been cultivated are often variable in the first generation and I have myself seen striking instances of this fact. Gartner further admits that hybrids between very closely allied species are more variable than those from very distinct species, and this shows that the difference in the degree of variability graduates away. When mongrels and the more fertile hybrids are propagated for several generations, an extreme amount of variability in the offspring in both cases is notorious. But some few instances of both hybrids and mongrels long retaining a uniform character could be given. The variability, however, in the successive generations of mongrels is, perhaps, greater than in hybrids. The greater variability in mongrels than in hybrids does not seem at all surprising for the parents of mongrels are varieties, and mostly domestic varieties. Very few experiments have been tried on natural varieties, and this implies that there has been recent variability, which would often continue and would augment that arising from the act of crossing. The slight variability of hybrids in the first generation, in contrast with that in the succeeding generations, is a curious fact and deserves attention for it bears on the view which I have taken of one of the causes of ordinary variability, namely, that the reproductive system, from being eminently sensitive to changed conditions of life, fails under these circumstances to perform its proper function of producing offspring closely similar in all respects to the parent form. Now, hybrids in the first generation are descended from species, excluding those long cultivated, which have not had their reproductive systems in any way affected, and they are not variable. 
but hybrids themselves have their reproductive systems seriously affected, and their descendants are highly variable. But to return to our comparison of mongrels and hybrids, Gartner states that mongrels are more liable than hybrids to revert to either parent form, but this, if it be true, is certainly only a difference in degree. Moreover, Gartner expressly states that the hybrids from long cultivated plants are more subject to reversion than hybrids from species in their natural state and this probably explains the singular difference in the results arrived at by different observers. Thus Max Wichura doubts whether hybrids ever revert to their parent forms, and he experimented on uncultivated species of willows, while Nodin, on the other hand, insists in the strongest terms on the almost universal tendency to reversion in hybrids, and he experimented chiefly on cultivated plants. Gartner further states that when any two species, although most closely allied to each other, are crossed with a third species, the hybrids are widely different from each other, whereas if two very distinct varieties of one species are crossed with another species, the hybrids do not differ much. But this conclusion, as far as I can make out, is founded on a single experiment and seems directly opposed to the results of several experiments made by Kohlreuter. Such alone are the unimportant differences which Gartner is able to point out between hybrid and mongrel plants. On the other hand, the degrees and kinds of resemblance in mongrels and in hybrids to their respective parents, more especially in hybrids produced from nearly related species, follow, according to Gartner, the same laws. When two species are crossed, one has sometimes a prepotent power of impressing its likeness on the hybrid, so I believe it to be with varieties of plants, and with animals one variety certainly often has this prepotent power over another variety. Hybrid plants produced from a reciprocal cross generally resemble each other closely and so it is with mongrel plants from a reciprocal cross. Both hybrids and mongrels can be reduced to either pure parent form by repeated crosses in successive generations with either parent. These several remarks are apparently applicable to animals, but the subject is here much complicated, partly owing to the existence of secondary sexual characters but more especially owing to prepotency in transmitting likeness running more strongly in one sex than in the other, both when one species is crossed with another and when one variety is crossed with another variety. For instance, I think those authors are right who maintain that the ass has a prepotent power over the horse, so that both the mule and the hinny resemble more closely the ass than the horse but that the prepotency runs more strongly in the male than in the female ass, so that the mule, which is an offspring of the male ass and mare, is more like an ass than is the hinny, which is the offspring of the female ass and stallion. Much stress has been laid by some authors on the supposed fact that it is only with mongrels that the offspring are not intermediate in character, but closely resemble one of their parents but this does sometimes occur with hybrids, yet I grant much less frequently than with mongrels. Looking to the cases which I have collected of cross-bred animals closely resembling one parent, the resemblances seem chiefly confined to characters almost monstrous in their nature, and which have suddenly appeared, such as albinism, melanism, deficiency of tail or horns, or additional fingers and toes, and do not relate to characters which have been slowly acquired through selection. A tendency to sudden reversions to the perfect character of either parent would also be much more likely to occur with mongrels, which are descended from varieties often suddenly produced and semi-monstrous in character, than with hybrids, which are descended from species slowly and naturally produced. On the whole, I entirely agree with Dr. Prosper Lucas, who, after arranging an enormous body of facts with respect to animals, 
comes to the conclusion that the laws of resemblance of the child to its parents are the same, whether the two parents differ little or much from each other, namely, in the union of individuals of the same variety, or of different varieties, or of distinct species. Independently of the question of fertility and sterility, in all other respects there seems to be a general and close similarity in the offspring of crossed species and of crossed varieties. If we look at species as having been specially created, and at varieties as having been produced by secondary laws, this similarity would be an astonishing fact. But it harmonizes perfectly with the view that there is no essential distinction between species and varieties. Summary of chapter First crosses between forms, sufficiently distinct to be ranked as species, and their hybrids, are very generally, but not universally, sterile. The sterility is of all degrees, and is often so slight that the most careful experimentalists have arrived at diametrically opposite conclusions in ranking forms by this test. The sterility is innately variable in individuals of the same species, and is eminently susceptible to action of favourable and unfavourable conditions. The degree of sterility does not strictly follow systematic affinity, but is governed by several curious and complex laws. It is generally different, and sometimes widely different, in reciprocal crosses between the same two species. It is not always equal in degree in a first cross and in the hybrids produced from this cross. In the same manner as in grafting trees, the capacity in one species or variety to take on another is incidental on differences, generally of an unknown nature, in their vegetative systems. So in crossing, the greater or less facility of one species to unite with another is incidental on unknown differences in their reproductive systems. There is no more reason to think that species have been specially endowed with various degrees of sterility to prevent their crossing and blending in nature than to think that trees have been specially endowed with various and somewhat analogous degrees of difficulty in being grafted together in order to prevent their inarching in our forests. The sterility of first crosses and of their hybrid progeny has not been acquired through natural selection. In the case of first crosses it seems to depend on several circumstances, in some instances in chief part on the early death of the embryo. In the case of hybrids it apparently depends on their whole organization having been disturbed by being compounded from two distinct forms, the sterility being closely allied to that which so frequently affects pure species when exposed to new and unnatural conditions of life. He who will explain these latter cases will be able to explain the sterility of hybrids. This view is strongly supported by a parallelism of another kind, namely that, firstly, slight changes in the conditions of life add to the vigour and fertility of all organic beings, and secondly, that the crossing of forms which have been exposed to slightly different conditions of life, or which have varied, favours the size, vigour, and fertility of their offspring. The facts given on the sterility of the illegitimate unions of dimorphic and trimorphic plants, and of their illegitimate progeny, perhaps render it probable that some unknown bond in all cases connects the degree of fertility of first unions with that of their offspring. The consideration of these facts on dimorphism, as well as of the results of reciprocal crosses, clearly leads to the conclusion that the primary cause of the sterility of crossed species is confined to differences in their sexual elements. But why, in the case of distinct species, the sexual elements should so generally have become more or less modified, leading to their mutual infertility, we do not know, but it seems to stand in some close relation to species having been exposed for long periods of time to nearly uniform conditions of life. It is not surprising that the difficulty in crossing any two species, 
and the sterility of their hybrid offspring should in most cases correspond, even if due to distinct causes, for both depend on the amount of difference between the species which are crossed. Nor is it surprising that the facility of effecting a first cross, and the fertility of the hybrids thus produced, and the capacity of being grafted together, though this latter capacity evidently depends on widely different circumstances, should all run, to a certain extent, parallel with the systematic affinity of the forms subjected to experiment. For systematic affinity includes resemblances of all kinds. First crosses between forms known to be varieties, or sufficiently alike to be considered as varieties, and their mongrel offspring are very generally, but not, as is often stated, invariably fertile. Nor is this almost universal and perfect fertility surprising, when it is remembered how liable we are to argue in a circle with respect to varieties in a state of nature, and when we remember that the greater number of varieties have been produced under domestication by the selection of mere external differences, and that they have not been long exposed to uniform conditions of life. It should also be especially kept in mind that long-continued domestication tends to eliminate sterility, and is therefore little likely to induce this same quality. Independently of the question of fertility, in all other respects there is the closest general resemblance between hybrids and mongrels in their variability, in their power of absorbing each other by repeated crosses, and in their inheritance of characters from both parent forms. Finally, then, although we are as ignorant of the precise cause of the sterility of first crosses and of hybrids, as we are why animals and plants removed from their natural conditions become sterile, yet the facts given in this chapter do not seem to me opposed to the belief that species aboriginally existed as varieties. End of chapter 9「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Julian Jameson. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or The Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life. Sixth London Edition. By Charles Darwin. Chapter number 10. On the Imperfection of the Geological Record. Part A. Contents of this chapter include On the absence of intermediate varieties at the present day, On the nature of extinct intermediate varieties, On their number, On the lapse of time, as inferred from the rate of denudation and of deposition number, On the lapse of time as estimated by years, On the poorness of our paleontological collections, On the intermittence of geological formations, On the denudation of granitic areas, on the absence of intermediate varieties in any one formation, on the sudden appearance of groups of species, on their sudden appearance in the lowest known fossiliferous strata, antiquity of the habitable earth. In the sixth chapter I enumerated the chief objections which might be justly urged against the views maintained in this volume. Most of them have now been discussed. One namely, the distinctness of specific forms, and their not being blended together by innumerable transitional links, is a very obvious difficulty. I assigned reasons why such links do not commonly occur at the present day, under the circumstances apparently most favorable for their presence, namely, on an extensive and continuous area with graduated physical conditions. I endeavored to show that the life of each species depends in a more important manner on the presence of other already defined organic forms than on climate, and therefore that the really governing conditions of life do not graduate away quite insensibly, like heat or moisture. 
I endeavoured also to show that intermediate varieties, from existing in lesser numbers than the forms which they connect, will generally be beaten out and exterminated during the course of further modification and improvement. The main cause, however, of innumerable intermediate links, not now occurring everywhere throughout nature, depends on the very process of natural selection, through which new varieties continually take the places of, and supplant their parent forms. But just in proportion as this process of extermination has acted on an enormous scale, so must the number of intermediate varieties, which have formerly existed, be truly enormous. Why, then, is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this, perhaps, is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against my theory. The explanation lies, as I believe, in the extreme imperfection of the geological record. In the first place, it should always be borne in mind what sort of intermediate forms must, on the theory, have formerly existed. I have found it difficult, when looking at any two species, to avoid picturing to myself forms directly intermediate between them. But this is a wholly false view. We should always look for forms intermediate between each species and a common but unknown progenitor, and the progenitor will generally have differed in some respects from all its modified descendants. To give a simple illustration, the fantail and powder pigeons are both descended from the rock pigeon. If we possessed all the intermediate varieties which have ever existed, we should have an extremely close series between both and the rock pigeon, but we should have no varieties directly intermediate between the fantail and powder. None, for instance, combining a tail somewhat expanded with a crop somewhat enlarged, the characteristic features of these two breeds. These two breeds, moreover, have become so such modified that if we had no historical or indirect evidence regarding their origin, it would not have been possible to have determined from a mere comparison of their structure with that of the rock pigeon, C. Levia, whether they had descended from this species or from some other allied species, such as C. Onas. So, with natural species, if we look to forms very distinct, for instance, to the horse and tapir, we have no reason to suppose that links directly intermediate between them ever existed, but between each and an unknown common parent. The common parent will have had in its whole organization much general resemblance to the tapir and to the horse, but in some points of structure may have differed considerably from both, even perhaps more than they differ from each other. Hence, in all such cases, we should be unable to recognize the parent form of any two or more species, even if we closely compared the structure of the parent with that of its modified descendants, unless at the same time we had a nearly perfect chain of the intermediate links. It is just possible, by the theory, that one of two living forms might have descended from the other, for instance a horse from a tapir, and in this case direct intermediate links will have existed between them but such a case would imply that one form had remained for a very long period unaltered, whilst its descendants had undergone a vast amount of change, and the principle of competition between organism and organism, between child and parent, will render this a very rare event, for in all cases the new and improved forms of life tend to supplant the old and unimproved forms. By the theory of natural selection, all living species have been connected with the parent species of each genus, by differences not greater than we see between the natural and domestic varieties of the same species at the present day. And these parent species, now generally extinct, have in their turn been similarly connected with more ancient forms, and so on backwards, always converging to the common ancestor of each great class so that the number of intermediate and transitional links between all living and extinct species must have been inconceivably great. But assuredly, if this theory be true, such have lived upon the earth. On the lapse of time, as inferred from the rate of deposition and extent of denudation. Independently of our not finding fossil remains of such infinitely numerous connecting links, it may be objected that time cannot have sufficed for so great an amount of organic change, all changes having been effected slowly. It is hardly possible for me to recall to the reader, who is not a practical geologist, the facts leading the mind feebly to comprehend the lapse of time. He who can read Sir Charles Lyell's grand work on the principles of geology, 
which the future historian will recognize as having produced a revolution in natural science, and yet does not admit how vast have been the past periods of time, may at once close this volume. Not that it suffices to study the principles of geology, or to read special treatises by different observers on separate formations, and to mark how each author attempts to give an inadequate idea of the duration of each formation, or even of each stratum. We can best gain some idea of past time by knowing the agencies at work, and learning how deeply the surface of the land has been denuded, and how much sediment has been deposited. As Lyell has well remarked, the extent and thickness of our sedimentary formations are the result and the measure of the denudation which the earth's crust has elsewhere undergone. Therefore a man should examine for himself the great piles of superimposed strata, and watch the rivulets bringing down mud, and the waves wearing away the sea-cliffs, in order to comprehend something about the duration of past time, the monuments of which we see all around us. It is good to wander along the coast, when formed of moderately hard rocks, and mark the process of degradation. The tides, in most cases, reach the cliffs only for a short time, twice a day, and the waves eat into them only when they are charged with sand or pebbles, for there is good evidence that pure water effects nothing in wearing away rock. At last, the base of the cliff is undermined, huge fragments fall down, and these, remaining fixed, have to be worn away, atom by atom, until after being reduced in size they can be rolled about by the waves, and then they are more quickly ground into pebbles, sand, or mud. But how often do we see along the bases of retreating cliffs rounded boulders, all thickly clothed by marine productions, showing how little they are abraded, and how seldom they are rolled about? Moreover, if we follow for a few miles any line of rocky cliff, which is undergoing degradation, we find that it is only here and there, along a short length or round a promontory, that the cliffs are at the present time suffering. The appearance of the surface and the vegetation show that elsewhere years have elapsed since the waters washed their base. We have, however, recently learned from the observations of Ramsay, in the van of many excellent observers, of Jukes, Geike, Kroll, and others, that subaerial degradation is a much more important agency than coast action, or the power of the waves. The whole surface of the land is exposed to the chemical action of the air and of the rainwater, with its dissolved carbonic acid, and in colder countries to frost. The disintegrated matter is carried down even gentle slopes during heavy rain, and to a greater extent than might be supposed, especially in arid districts, by the wind. It is then transported by the streams and rivers, which, when rapid, deepen their channels, and triturate the fragments. On a rainy day, even in a gently undulating country, we see the effects of subaerial degradation in the muddy rills which flow down every slope. Messrs. Ramsay and Whitaker have shown, and the observation is a most striking one, that the great lines of escarpment in the Wealdian district, and those ranging across England, which formerly were looked at as ancient sea-coasts, cannot have been thus formed, for each line is composed of one and the same formation, while our sea-cliffs are everywhere formed by the intersection of various formations. This being the case, we are compelled to admit that the escarpments owe their origin in chief part to the rocks of which they are composed, having resisted subaerial denudation better than the surrounding surface. This surface consequently has been gradually lowered, with the lines of harder rock left projecting. Nothing impresses the mind with the vast duration of time, according to our ideas of time, more forcibly than the conviction thus gained that subaerial agencies, which apparently have so little power, and which seem to work so slowly, have produced great results. When thus impressed with the slow rate at which the land is worn away, through subaerial and littoral action, it is good, in order to appreciate the past duration of time, to consider, on the one hand, the masses of rock which have been removed over many extensive areas, and on the other hand, the thickness of our sedimentary formations. I remember having been much struck when viewing volcanic islands, which have been worn by the waves and paired all round into perpendicular cliffs of one or two thousand feet in height. For the gentle slope of the lava streams, due to their formerly liquid state, showed at a glance how far the hard, rocky beds had once extended into the open ocean. The same story is told still more plainly by faults, those great cracks along which the strata have been upheaved on one side, or thrown down on the other, to the height or depth of thousands of feet, 
for since the crust cracked, and it makes no great difference whether the upheaval was sudden, or, as most geologists now believe, was slow and effected by many starts, the surface of the land has been so completely planed down that no trace of these vast dislocations is externally visible. The Craven Fault, for instance, extends for upward of thirty miles, and along this line the vertical displacement of the strata varies from six hundred to three thousand feet. Professor Ramsey has published an account of a downthrow in Anglesey of twenty-three hundred feet, and he informs me that he fully believes that there is one in Marionethshire of twelve thousand feet. Yet in these cases there is nothing on the surface of the land to show such prodigious movements, the pile of rocks on either side of the crack having been smoothly swept away. On the other hand, in all parts of the world the piles of sedimentary strata are of wonderful thickness. In the Cordillera I estimated one mass of conglomerate at ten thousand feet, and although conglomerates have probably been accumulated at a quicker rate than finer sediments, yet from being formed of worn and rounded pebbles, each of which bears the stamp of time, they are good to show how slowly the mass must have been heaped together. Professor Ramsey has given me the maximum thickness, from actual measurement in most cases, of the successive formations in different parts of Great Britain, and this is the result. Paleozoic strata, not including igneous beds, 57,154 feet. Secondary strata, 13,190 feet. Tertiary strata, 2,240 feet making, altogether, 72,584 feet, that is, very nearly thirteen and three-quarters British miles. Some of these formations, which are represented in England by thin beds, are thousands of feet in thickness on the continent. Moreover, between each successive formation we have, in the opinion of most geologists, blank periods of enormous length so that the lofty pile of sedimentary rocks in Britain gives but an inadequate idea of the time which has elapsed during their accumulation. The consideration of these various facts impresses the mind almost in the same manner as does the vain endeavor to grapple with the idea of eternity. Nevertheless, this impression is partly false. Mr. Kroll, in an interesting paper, remarks that we do not err in forming too great a conception of the length of geological periods, but in estimating them by years. When geologists look at large and complicated phenomena, and then at the figures representing several million years, the two produce a totally different effect on the mind, and the figures are at once pronounced too small. In regard to subaerial denudation, Mr. Kroll shows, by calculating the known amount of sediment annually brought down by certain rivers, relatively to their areas of drainage, that one thousand feet of solid rock, as it became gradually disintegrated, would thus be removed from the mean level of the whole area in the course of six million years. This seems an astonishing result, and some considerations lead to the suspicion that it may be too large. But if halved or quartered, it is still very surprising. Few of us, however, know what a million really means. Mr. Kroll gives the following illustrations. Take a narrow strip of paper, eighty-three feet four inches in length, and stretch it along the wall of a large hall. Then mark off at one end the tenth of an inch. This tenth of an inch will represent one hundred years, and the entire strip a million years. But let it be borne in mind, in relation to the subject of this work, what a hundred years implies, represented as it is by a measure utterly insignificant in a hall of the above dimensions. Several eminent breeders, during a single lifetime, have so largely modified some of the higher animals, which propagate their kind much more slowly than most of the lower animals, that they have formed what well deserves to be called a new sub-breed. Few men have attended with due care to any one strain for more than half a century, so that a hundred years represents the work of two breeders in succession. It is not to be supposed that species in a state of nature ever change so quickly as domestic animals under the guidance of methodical selection. The comparison would be in every way fairer, with the effects which follow from unconscious selection, that is, the preservation of the most useful or beautiful animals, with no intention of modifying the breed. But by this process of unconscious selection, various breeds have been sensibly changed in the course of two or three centuries. Species, however, probably change much more slowly, and within the same country only a few change at the same time. 
This slowness follows from all the inhabitants of the same country being already so well adapted to each other, that new places in the polity of nature do not occur until after long intervals, due to the occurrence of physical changes of some kind, or through the immigration of new forms. Moreover, variations or individual differences of the right nature, by which some of the inhabitants might be better fitted to their new places under the altered circumstance, would not always occur at once. Unfortunately, we have no means of determining, according to the standard of years, how long a period it takes to modify a species. But to the subject of time we must return. ON THE POORNESS OF PALEONTOLOGICAL COLLECTIONS Now let us return to our richest museums, and what a paltry display we behold. That our collections are imperfect is admitted by every one. The remark of that admirable paleontologist, Edward Forbes, should never be forgotten, namely, that very many fossil species are known and named from single and often broken specimens, or from a few specimens collected on some one spot. Only a small portion of the surface of the earth has been geologically explored, and no part with sufficient care, as the important discoveries made every year in Europe prove. No organism wholly soft can be preserved. Shells and bones decay and disappear when left on the bottom of the sea, where sediment is not accumulating. We probably take a quite erroneous view when we assume that sediment is being deposited over nearly the whole bed of the sea at a rate sufficiently quick to embed and preserve fossil remains. Throughout an enormously large proportion of the ocean, the bright blue tint of the water bespeaks its purity. The many cases on record of a formation conformably covered after an immense interval of time, by another and later formation, without the underlying bed having suffered in the interval any wear and tear, seem explicable only on the view of the bottom of the sea not rarely lying for ages in an unaltered condition. The remains which do become embedded, if in sand or gravel, will, when the beds are upraised, generally be dissolved by the percolation of rainwater charged with carbonic acid. Some of the many kinds of animals which live on the beach between high and low water mark seem to be rarely preserved. For instance, the several species of the Chthamelinae, a subfamily of sessile cirripedes, coat the rocks all over the world in infinite numbers. They are all strictly littoral, with the exception of a single Mediterranean species, which inhabits deep water, and this has been found fossil in Sicily, whereas not one other species has hitherto been found in any tertiary formation. Yet it is known that the genus Chthamelus existed during the chalk period. Lastly, many great deposits, requiring a vast length of time for their accumulation, are entirely destitute of organic remains, without our being able to assign any reason. One of the most striking instances is that of the flesh formation, which consists of shale and sandstone, several thousand, occasionally even six thousand feet in thickness, and extending for at least three hundred miles from Vienna to Switzerland, and although this great mass has been most carefully searched, no fossils, except a few vegetable remains, have been found. With respect to the terrestrial productions which lived during the secondary and Paleozoic periods, it is superfluous to state that our evidence is fragmentary in an extreme degree. For instance, until recently not a land shell was known belonging to either of these vast periods, with the exception of one species discovered by Sir C. Lyell and Dr. Dawson in the Carboniferous strata of North America. But now land shells have been found in the Leas. In regard to mammiferous remains, a glance at the historical table published in Lyell's manual, which bring home the truth, how accidental and rare is their preservation, far better than pages of detail. Nor is their rarity surprising when we remember how large a proportion of the bones of tertiary mammals have been discovered either in caves or in lacustrine deposits, and that not a cave or true lacustrine bed is known belonging to the age of our secondary or Paleozoic formations. But the imperfection in the geological record largely results from another and more important cause than any of the foregoing namely, from the several formations being separated from each other by wide intervals of time. This doctrine has been emphatically admitted by many geologists and paleontologists, who, like E. Forbes, entirely disbelieve in the change of species. When we see the formations tabulated in written works, or when we follow them in nature, it is difficult to avoid believing that they are closely consecutive. But we know, for instance, from Sir R. Murchison's great work on Russia, what wide gaps there are in that country between the superimposed formations. 
so it is in north america and in many other parts of the world the most skilful geologist if his attention had been confined exclusively to these large territories would never have suspected that during the periods which were blank and barren in his own country great piles of sediment charged with new and peculiar forms of life had elsewhere been accumulated and if in every separate territory hardly any idea can be formed of the length of time which has elapsed between the consecutive formations we may infer that this could nowhere be ascertained the fragment and great changes in the mineralogical composition of consecutive formations generally implying great changes in the geography of the surrounding lands whence the sediment was derived accord with the belief of vast intervals of time having elapsed between each formation we can i think see why the geological formations of each region are almost invariably intermittent that is have not followed each other in close sequence scarcely any fact struck me more when examining many hundred miles of the south american coasts which have been upraised several hundred feet within the recent period than the absence of any recent deposits sufficiently extensive to last for even a short geological period along the whole west coast which is inhabited by a peculiar marine fauna tertiary beds are so poorly developed that no record of several successive and peculiar marine faunas will probably be preserved to a distant age a little reflection will explain why along the rising coast of the western side of south america no extensive formations with recent or tertiary remains can anywhere be found though the supply of sediment must for ages have been great from the enormous degradation of the coast rocks and from the muddy streams entering the sea the explanation no doubt is that the littoral and sublittoral deposits are continually worn away as soon as they are brought up by the slow and gradual rising of the land within the grinding action of the coast waves we may i think conclude that sediment must be accumulated in extremely thick solid or extensive masses in order to withstand the incessant action of the waves when first upraised and during subsequent oscillations of level as well as the subsequent subaerial degradation such thick and extensive accumulations of sediment may be formed in two ways either in profound depths of the sea in which case the bottom will not be inhabited by so many and such varied forms of life as the more shallow seas and the mass when upraised will give an imperfect record of the organisms which existed in the neighborhood during the period of its accumulation or sediment may be deposited to any thickness and extent over a shallow bottom if it continues slowly to subside in this latter case as long as the rate of subsidence and supply of sediment nearly balance each other the sea will remain shallow and favorable for many and varied forms and thus a rich fossiliferous formation thick enough when upraised to resist a large amount of denudation may be formed i am convinced that nearly all our ancient formations which are throughout the greater part of their thickness rich in fossils have thus been formed during subsidence since publishing my views on this subject in eighteen forty five i have watched the progress of geology and have been surprised to note how author after author in treating of this or that great formation has come to the conclusion that it was accumulated during subsidence i may add that the only ancient tertiary formation on the west coast of south america which has been bulky enough to resist such degradation as it has as yet suffered but which will hardly last to a distant geological age was deposited during a downward oscillation of level and thus gained considerable thickness all geological facts tell us plainly that each area has undergone numerous slow oscillations of level and apparently these oscillations have affected wide spaces consequently formations rich in fossils and sufficiently thick and extensive to resist subsequent degradation will have been formed over wide spaces during periods of subsidence but only where the supply of sediment was sufficient to keep the sea shallow and to embed and preserve the remains before they had time to decay on the other hand as long as the bed of the sea remained stationary thick deposits cannot have been accumulated in the shallow parts which are the most favorable to life still less can this have happened during the alternate periods of elevation or to speak more accurately the beds which were then accumulated will generally have been destroyed by being upraised and brought within the limits of the coast action these remarks apply chiefly to littoral and sublittoral deposits in the case of an extensive and shallow sea such as that within a large part of the malay archipelago where the depth varies from thirty or forty to sixty fathoms 
a widely extended formation might be formed during a period of elevation, and yet not suffer excessively from denudation during its slow upheaval. But the thickness of the formation could not be great, for owing to the elevatory movement it would be less than the depth in which it was formed, nor would the deposit be much consolidated, nor be capped by overlying formations, so that it would run a good chance of being worn away by atmospheric degradation and by the action of the sea during subsequent oscillations of level. It has, however, been suggested by Mr. Hopkins, that if one part of the area, after rising and before being denuded, subsided, the deposit formed during the rising movement, though not thick, might afterwards become protected by fresh accumulations, and thus be preserved for a long period. Mr. Hopkins also expresses his belief that sedimentary beds of considerable horizontal extent have rarely been completely destroyed. But all geologists, excepting the few who believe that our present metamorphic schists and plutonic rocks once formed the primordial nucleus of the globe, will admit that these latter rocks have been stripped of their covering to an enormous extent. For it is scarcely possible that such rocks could have been solidified and crystallized while uncovered, but if the metamorphic action occurred at profound depths of the ocean, the former protecting mantle of rock may not have been very thick. Admitting, then, that gneiss, mica schist, granite, diorite, etc., were once necessarily covered up, how can we account for the naked and extensive areas of such rocks, in many parts of the world, except on the belief that they have subsequently been completely denuded of all overlying strata? That such extensive areas do exist cannot be doubted. The granitic region of Parime is described by Humboldt as being at least nineteen times as large as Switzerland. South of the Amazon, Bue colors an area composed of rocks of this nature as equal to that of Spain, France, Italy, part of Germany, and the British Isles, all conjoined. This region has not been carefully explored, but from the concurrent testimony of travelers, the granitic area is very large. Thus von Eschwege gives a detailed section of these rocks, stretching from Rio de Janeiro for 260 geographical miles inland in a straight line and I travelled for 150 miles in another direction, and saw nothing but granitic rocks. Numerous specimens, collected along the whole coast from Neo Rio de Janeiro to the mouth of the Plata, a distance of 1,100 geographical miles, were examined by me, and they all belonged to this class. Inland, along the whole northern bank of the Plata, I saw, besides modern tertiary beds, only one small batch of slightly metamorphosed rock which alone could have formed a part of the original capping of the granitic series. Turning to a well-known region, namely to the United States and Canada, as shown in Professor H. D. Rogers' beautiful map, I have estimated the areas by cutting out and weighing the paper, and I find that the metamorphic, excluding the semi-metamorphic, and granite rocks exceed, in the proportion of 19 to 12.5, the whole of the newer Paleozoic formations. In many regions, the metamorphic and granite rocks would be found much more widely extended than they appear to be, if all the sedimentary beds were removed which rest unconformably on them, and which could not have formed part of the original mantle under which they were crystallized. Hence it is probable that in some parts of the world whole formations have been completely denuded, with not a wreck left behind. One remark is here worth a passing notice. During periods of elevation, the area of the land and of the adjoining shoal parts of the sea will be increased, and new stations will often be formed, all circumstances favorable, as previously explained, for the formation of new varieties and species. But during such periods there will generally be a blank in the geological record. On the other hand, during subsidence, the inhabited area and number of inhabitants will decrease, excepting on the shores of a continent, when first broken up into an archipelago and consequently during subsidence, though there will be much extinction, few new varieties or species will be formed, and it is during these very periods of subsidence that the deposits which are richest in fossils have been accumulated. End of chapter 10. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox. Dot org. Recorded by Julian Jameson. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, or The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life, 
Sixth London Edition by Charles Darwin. Chapter Number Ten, Part B. On the absence of numerous intermediate varieties in any single formation. From these several considerations, it cannot be doubted that the geological record, viewed as a whole, is extremely imperfect. But if we confine our attention to any one formation, it becomes much more difficult to understand why we do not therein find closely graduated varieties between the allied species which lived at its commencement and at its close. Several cases are on record of the same species presenting varieties in the upper and lower parts of the same formation. Thus Trouchold gives a number of instances with ammonites, and Hilgendorf has described a most curious case of ten graduated forms of Planorbis multiformis in the successive beds of a freshwater formation in Switzerland. Although each formation has indisputably required a vast number of years for its deposition, several reasons can be given why each should not commonly include a graduated series of links between the species which lived at its commencement and close but I cannot assign due proportional weight to the following considerations. Although each formation may mark a very long lapse of years, each probably is short compared with the period requisite to change one species into another. I am aware that two paleontologists, whose opinions are worthy of much deference, namely Braun and Woodward, have concluded that the average duration of each formation is twice or thrice as long as the average duration of specific forms. But insuperable difficulties, as it seems to me, prevent us from coming to any just conclusion on this head. When we see a species first appearing in the middle of any formation, it would be rash in the extreme to infer that it had not elsewhere previously existed. So again, when we find a species disappearing before the last layers have been deposited, it would be equally rash to suppose that it then became extinct. We forget how small the area of Europe is compared with the rest of the world, nor have the several stages of the same formation throughout Europe been correlated with perfect accuracy. We may safely infer that with marine mammals of all kinds, there has been a large amount of migration due to climatal and other changes, and when we see a species first appearing in any formation, the probability is that it only then first immigrated into that area. It is well known, for instance, that several species appear somewhat earlier in the Paleozoic beds of North America than in those of Europe time having apparently been required for their migration from the American to the European seas. In examining the latest deposits, in various quarters of the world, it has everywhere been noted that some few still existing species are common in the deposit, but have become extinct in the immediately surrounding sea, or, conversely, that some are now abundant in the neighboring sea, but are rare or absent in this particular deposit. It is an excellent lesson to reflect on the ascertained amount of migration of the inhabitants of Europe during the glacial epoch, which forms only a part of one whole geological period, and likewise to reflect on the changes of level, on the extreme change of climate, and on the great lapse of time, all included within this same glacial period. Yet it may be doubted whether, in any quarter of the world, sedimentary deposits, including fossil remains, have gone on accumulating within the same area during the whole of this period. It is not, for instance, probable that sediment was deposited during the whole of the glacial period near the mouth of the Mississippi, within that limit of depth at which marine animals can best flourish. For we know that great geographical changes occurred in other parts of America during this space of time. When such beds as were deposited in shallow water near the mouth of the Mississippi during some part of the glacial period shall have been upraised, organic remains will probably first appear and disappear at different levels, owing to the migrations of species and to geographical changes. And in the distant future, a geologist, examining these beds, would be tempted to conclude that the average duration of life of the embedded fossils had been less than that of the glacial period, instead of having been really far greater, that is, extending from before the glacial epoch to the present day. In order to get a perfect gradation between two forms in the upper and lower parts of the same formation, the deposit must have gone on continuously accumulating during a long period, sufficient for the slow process of modification. Hence, the deposit must be a very thick one, and the species undergoing change must have lived in the same district throughout the whole time. But we have seen that a thick formation, fossiliferous throughout its entire thickness, can accumulate only during a period of subsidence, and to keep the depth approximately the same, which is necessary that the same marine species may live on the same space, 
the supply of sediment must nearly counterbalance the amount of subsidence. But this same movement of subsidence will tend to submerge the area whence the sediment is derived, and thus diminish the supply, whilst the downward movement continues. In fact, this nearly exact balancing between the supply of sediment and the amount of subsidence is probably a rare contingency. For it has been observed by more than one paleontologist that very thick deposits are usually barren of organic remains, except near their upper or lower limits. It would seem that each separate formation, like the whole pile of formations in any country, has generally been intermittent in its accumulation. When we see, as is so often the case, a formation composed of beds of widely different mineralogical composition, we may reasonably suspect that the process of deposition has been more or less interrupted. Nor will the closest inspection of a formation give us any idea of the length of time which its deposition may have consumed. Many instances could be given of beds only a few feet in thickness, representing formations which are elsewhere thousands of feet in thickness, and which must have required an enormous period for their accumulation. Yet no one ignorant of this fact would have even suspected the vast lapse of time represented by the thinner formation. Many cases could be given of the lower beds of a formation having been upraised, denuded, submerged, and then recovered by the upper beds of the same formation. Facts showing what wide yet easily overlooked intervals have occurred in its accumulation. In other cases we have the plainest evidence in great fossilized trees, still standing upright as they grew, of many long intervals of time and changes of level during the process of deposition, which would not have been suspected had not the trees been preserved. Thus Sir C. Lyell and Dr. Dawson found carboniferous beds fourteen hundred feet thick in Nova Scotia, with ancient root-bearing strata, one above the other, at no less than sixty-eight different levels. Hence, when the same species occurs at the bottom, middle, and top of a formation, the probability is that it has not lived on the same spot during the whole period of deposition, but has disappeared and reappeared, perhaps many times, during the same geological period. Consequently, if it were to undergo a considerable amount of modification during the deposition of any one geological formation, a section would not include all the fine intermediate gradations which must on our theory have existed, but abrupt, though perhaps slight, changes of form. It is all important to remember that naturalists have no golden rule by which to distinguish species and varieties. They grant some little variability to each species, but when they meet with a somewhat greater amount of difference between any two forms, they rank both as species unless they are enabled to connect them together by the closest intermediate gradations. And this, from the reasons just assigned, we can seldom hope to effect in any one geological section. Supposing B and C to be two species, and a third, A, to be found in an older and underlying bed, even if A were strictly intermediate between B and C, it would simply be ranked as a third and distinct species, unless at the same time it could be closely connected by intermediate varieties with either one or both forms. Nor should it be forgotten, as before explained, that A might be the actual progenitor of B and C, and yet would not necessarily be strictly intermediate between them in all respects, so that we might obtain the parent species and its several modified descendants from the lower and upper beds of the same formation, and unless we obtained numerous transitional gradations, we should not recognize their blood relationship, and should consequently rank them as distinct species. It is notorious on what excessively slight differences many paleontologists have found in their species, and they do this the more readily if the specimens come from different substages of the same formation. Some experienced conchologists are now sinking many of the very fine species of Dorbigny and others into the rank of varieties, and on this view we do find the kind of evidence of change which on the theory we ought to find. Look again at the later tertiary deposits, which include many shells believed by the majority of naturalists to be identical with existing species. But some excellent naturalists, as Agassiz and Pictet, maintain that all these tertiary species are specifically distinct, though the distinction is admitted to be very slight. So that here, unless we believe that these eminent naturalists have been misled by their imaginations, and that these late tertiary species really present no difference whatever from their living representatives, or unless we admit, in opposition to the judgment of most naturalists, 
that these tertiary species are all truly distinct from the recent, we have evidence of the frequent occurrence of slight modifications of the kind required. If we look to rather wider intervals of time, namely to distinct but consecutive stages of the same great formation, we find that the embedded fossils, though universally ranked as specifically different, yet are far more closely related to each other than are the species found in more widely separated formations, so that here again we have undoubted evidence of change in the direction required by the theory. But to this latter subject I shall return in the following chapter. With animals and plants that propagate rapidly and do not wander much, there is reason to suspect, as we have formerly seen, that their varieties are generally at first local, and that such local varieties do not spread widely and supplant their parent form until they have been modified and perfected in some considerable degree. According to this view, the chance of discovering in a formation in any one country all the early stages of transition between any two forms is small, for the successive changes are supposed to have been local or confined to some one spot. Most marine animals have a wide range, and we have seen that with plants it is those which have the widest range that oftenest present varieties, so that with shells and other marine animals it is probable that those which had the widest range, far exceeding the limits of the known geological formations in Europe, have oftenest given rise, first to local varieties and ultimately to new species, and this again would greatly lessen the chance of our being able to trace the stages of transition in any one geological formation. It is a more important consideration, leading to the same result, as lately insisted on by Dr. Falconer, namely, that the period during which each species underwent modification, though long as measured by years, was probably short in comparison with that during which it remained without undergoing any change. It should not be forgotten that at the present day, with perfect specimens for examination, two forms can seldom be connected by intermediate varieties, and thus proved to be the same species, until many specimens are collected from many places, and with fossil species this can rarely be done. We shall perhaps best perceive the improbability of our being enabled to connect species by numerous, fine, intermediate fossil links, by asking ourselves whether, for instance, geologists at some future period will be able to prove that our different breeds of cattle, sheep, horses, and dogs, are descended from a single stock or from several aboriginal stocks or, again, whether certain seashells inhabiting the shores of North America, which are ranked by some conchologists as distinct species from the European representatives, and by other conchologists as only varieties, are really varieties, or are, as it is called, specifically distinct. This could be effected by the future geologist only by his discovery in a fossil state numerous intermediate gradations, and such success is improbable in the highest degree. It has been asserted over and over again, by writers who believe in the immutability of species, that geology yields no linking forms. This assertion, as we shall see in the next chapter, is certainly erroneous. As Sir J. Lubbock has remarked, every species is a link between other allied forms. If we took a genus having a score of species, recent and extinct, and destroy four-fifths of them, no one doubts that the remainder will stand much more distinct from each other. If the extreme forms in the genus happen to have been destroyed, the genus itself will stand more distinct from other allied genera. What geological research has not revealed is the former existence of infinitely numerous gradations, as fine as existing varieties, connecting together nearly all existing and extinct species. But this ought not to be expected, yet this has been repeatedly advanced, as a most serious objection against my views. It may be worth while to sum up the foregoing remarks on the causes of the imperfection of the geological record under an imaginary illustration. The Malay archipelago is about the size of Europe from the North Cape to the Mediterranean, and from Britain to Russia, and therefore equals all the geological formations which have been examined with any accuracy, excepting those of the United States of America. I fully agree with Mr. Godwin Austin that the present condition of the Malay archipelago, with its numerous large islands separated by wide and shallow seas, probably represents the former state of Europe, while most of our formations were accumulating. The Malay archipelago is one of the richest regions in organic beings, yet, if all the species were to be collected which have ever lived there, 
how imperfectly would they represent the natural history of the world. But we have every reason to believe that the terrestrial productions of the archipelago would be preserved in an extremely imperfect manner in the formations which we suppose to be there accumulating. Not many of the strictly littoral animals, or of those which lived on naked submarine rocks, would be embedded, and those embedded in gravel or sand would not endure to a distant epoch. Wherever sediment did not accumulate on the bed of the sea, or where it did not accumulate at a sufficient rate to protect organic bodies from decay, no remains could be preserved. Formations rich in fossils of many kinds, and of thickness sufficient to last to an age as distant in futurity as the secondary formations lie in the past, would generally be formed in the archipelago only during periods of subsidence. These periods of subsidence would be separated from each other by immense intervals of time, during which the area would be either stationary or rising. Whilst rising, the fossiliferous formations on the steeper shores would be destroyed, almost as soon as accumulated, by the incessant coast action, as we now see on the shores of South America. Even throughout the extensive and shallow seas within the archipelago, sedimentary beds could hardly be accumulated of great thickness during the periods of elevation, or become capped and protected by subsequent deposits, so as to have a good chance of enduring to a very distant future. During the periods of subsidence, there would probably be much extinction of life. During the periods of elevation, there would be much variation, but the geological record would then be less perfect. It may be doubted whether the duration of any one great period of subsidence over the whole or part of the archipelago, together with a contemporaneous accumulation of sediment, would exceed the average duration of the same specific forms. And these contingencies are indispensable for the preservation of all the transitional gradations between any two or more species. If such gradations were not all fully preserved, transitional varieties would merely appear as so many new, though closely allied, species. It is also probable that each great period of subsidence would be interrupted by oscillations of level, and that slight climatical changes would intervene during such lengthy periods. And in these cases, the inhabitants of the archipelago would migrate, and no closely consecutive record of their modifications could be preserved in any one formation. Very many of the marine inhabitants of the archipelago now range thousands of miles beyond its confines, and analogy plainly leads to the belief that it would be chiefly these far-ranging species, though only some of them, which would oftenest produce new varieties, and the varieties would at first be local or confined to one place, but if possessed of any decided advantage, or when further modified and improved, they would slowly spread and supplant their parent forms. When such varieties returned to their ancient homes, as they would differ from their former state in a nearly uniform, though perhaps extremely slight, degree, and as they would be found embedded in slightly different substages of the same formation, they would, according to the principles followed by many paleontologists, be ranked as new and distinct species. If, then, there be some degree of truth in these remarks, we have no right to expect to find, in our geological formations, an infinite number of those fine transitional forms, which, on our theory, have connected all the past and present species of the same group into one long and branching chain of life. We ought only to look for a few links, and such assuredly we do find, some more distantly, some more closely, related to each other. And these links, let them be ever so close, if found in different stages of the same formation, would, by many paleontologists, be ranked as distinct species but I do not pretend that I should ever have suspected how poor was the record in the best preserved geological sections, had not the absence of innumerable transitional links between the species which lived at the commencement and close of each formation pressed so hardly on my theory. On the Sudden Appearance of Whole Groups of Allied Species the abrupt manner in which whole groups of species suddenly appear, in certain formations, has been urged by several paleontologists, for instance by Agassiz, Pictet, and Sedgwick, as a fatal objection to the belief in the transmutation of species. If numerous species, belonging to the same genera or families, have really started into life at once, the fact would be fatal to the theory of evolution through natural selection. 
for the development by this means of a group of forms, all of which are descended from some one progenitor, must have been an extremely slow process, and the progenitors must have lived long before their modified descendants. But we continually overrate the perfection of the geological record, and falsely infer, because certain genera or families have not been found beneath a certain stage, that they did not exist before that stage. In all cases, positive paleontological evidence may be implicitly trusted. Negative evidence is worthless, as experience has so often shown. We continually forget how large the world is, compared with the area over which our geological formations have been carefully examined. We forget that groups of species may elsewhere have long existed, and have slowly multiplied, before they invaded the ancient archipelagos of Europe and the United States. We do not make due allowance for the enormous intervals of time which have elapsed between our consecutive formations, longer, perhaps, in many cases, than the time required for the accumulation of each formation. These intervals will have given time for the multiplication of species from some one parent form, and in the succeeding formation such groups or species will appear as if suddenly created. I may here recall a remark formerly made, namely, that it might require a long succession of ages to adapt an organism to some new and peculiar line of life, for instance, to fly through the air, and consequently that the transitional forms would often long remain confined to some one region. But that, when this adaptation had once been effected, and a few species had thus acquired a great advantage over other organisms, a comparatively short time would be necessary to produce many divergent forms, which would spread rapidly and widely throughout the world. Professor Pictet, in his excellent review of this work, in commenting on early transitional forms, and taking birds as an illustration, cannot see how the successive modifications of the anterior limbs of a supposed prototype could possibly have been of any advantage. But look at the penguins of the southern ocean. Have not these birds, their front limbs, in this precise intermediate state of, quote, neither true arms nor true wings? Yet these birds hold their place victoriously in the battle for life, for they exist in infinite numbers and of many kinds. I do not suppose that we here see the real transitional grades through which the wings of birds have passed. But what special difficulty is there in believing that it might profit the modified descendants of the penguin? first to become enabled to flap along the surface of the sea, like the logger-headed duck, and ultimately to rise from its surface and glide through the air. I will now give a few examples to illustrate the foregoing remarks, and to show how liable we are to error in supposing that whole groups of species have suddenly been produced. Even in so short an interval as that between the first and second editions of Pictet's great work on paleontology, published in 1844-46, to and in 1853-57, to the conclusions on the first appearance and disappearance of several groups of animals have been considerably modified, and a third edition would require still further changes. I may recall the well-known fact that in geological treatises, published not many years ago, mammals were always spoken of as having abruptly come in at the commencement of the tertiary series, and now one of the richest known accumulations of fossil mammals belongs to the middle of the secondary series, and true mammals have been discovered in the new red sandstone at nearly the commencement of this great series. Cuvier used to urge that no monkey occurred in any tertiary stratum, but now extinct species have been discovered in India, South America, and in Europe, as far back as the Miocene stage. Had it not been for the rare accident of the preservation of footsteps, in the new red sandstone of the United States, who would have ventured to suppose that no less than at least thirty different bird-like animals, some of gigantic size, existed during that period. Not a fragment of bone has been discovered in these beds. Not long ago, paleontologists maintained that the whole class of birds came suddenly into existence during the Eocene period. But now we know, on the authority of Professor Owen, that a bird certainly lived during the deposition of the upper green sand, and still more recently, that strange bird, the Archaeopteryx, with a long lizard-like tail, bearing a pair of feathers on each joint, and with its wings furnished with two free claws, has been discovered in the oolitic slates of Solenhofen. 
Hardly any recent discovery shows more forcibly than this how little we as yet know of the former inhabitants of the world. I may give another instance, which, from having passed under my own eyes, has much struck me. In a memoir on fossil sessile cirripedes, I stated that, from the large number of existing and extinct tertiary species, from the extraordinary abundance of the individuals of many species all over the world, from the Arctic regions to the equator, inhabiting various zones of depths, from the upper tidal limits to fifty fathoms, from the perfect manner in which specimens are preserved in the oldest tertiary beds, from the ease with which even a fragment of a valve can be recognized, from all these circumstances I inferred that, had sessile cirripedes existed during the secondary periods, they would certainly have been preserved and discovered. And as not one species had then been discovered in beds of this age, I concluded that this great group had been suddenly developed at the commencement of the tertiary series. This was a sore trouble to me, adding, as I then thought, one more instance of the abrupt appearance of a great group of species. But my work had hardly been published, when a skilful paleontologist, M. Bosquet, sent me a drawing of a perfect specimen of an unmistakable sessile cirripede, which he had himself extracted from the chalk of Belgium. And as if to make the case as striking as possible, this cirripede was a chthamalus, a very common, large, and ubiquitous genus, of which not one species has as yet been found even in any tertiary stratum. Still more recently, a pyrgoma, a member of a distinct subfamily of sessile cirripedes, has been discovered by Mr. Woodward in the upper chalk, so that we now have abundant evidence of the existence of this group of animals during the secondary period. The case most frequently insisted on by paleontologists, of the apparently sudden appearance of a whole group of species, is that of the teleostean fishes, low down, according to Agassiz, in the chalk period. This group includes the large majority of existing species. But certain Jurassic and Triassic forms are now commonly admitted to be teleostean, and even some Paleozoic forms have thus been classed by one high authority. If the Teleosteans had really appeared suddenly in the northern hemisphere, at the commencement of the chalk formation, the fact would have been highly remarkable. But it would not have formed an insuperable difficulty, unless it could likewise have been shown that at the same period the species were suddenly and simultaneously developed in other quarters of the world. It is almost superfluous to remark that hardly any fossil fish are known from south of the equator, and by running through Pictet's paleontology, it will be seen that very few species are known from several formations in Europe. Some few families of fish now have a confined range. The teleostean fishes might formerly have had a similarly confined range, and after having been largely developed in some one sea, have spread widely. Nor have we any right to suppose that the seas of the world have always been so freely open from south to north as they are at present. Even at this day, if the Malay archipelago were converted into land, the tropical parts of the Indian Ocean would form a large and perfectly enclosed basin, in which any great group of marine animals might be multiplied, and here they would remain confined, until some of the species became adapted to a cooler climate, and were enabled to double the southern capes of Africa or Australia, and thus reach other and distant seas. From these considerations, from our ignorance of the geology of other countries beyond the confines of Europe and the United States, and from the revolution in our paleontological knowledge effected by the discoveries of the last dozen years, it seems to me to be about as rash to dogmatize on the succession of organic forms throughout the world, as it would be for a naturalist to land for five minutes on a barren point in Australia, and then to discuss the number and range of its productions. On the sudden appearance of groups of allied species in the lowest known fossiliferous strata. There is another and allied difficulty, which is much more serious. I allude to the manner in which species belonging to several of the main divisions of the animal kingdom suddenly appear in the lowest known fossiliferous rocks. Most of the arguments which have convinced me that all the existing species of the same group are descended from a single progenitor apply with equal force to the earliest known species. For instance, it cannot be doubted that all the Cambrian and Silurian trilobites are descended from some one crustacean, which must have lived long before the Cambrian age, and which probably differed greatly from any known animal. 
Some of the most ancient animals, as the Nautilus, Lingula, etc., do not differ much from living species, and it cannot on our theory be supposed that these old species were the progenitors of all the species belonging to the same groups which have subsequently appeared, for they are not in any degree intermediate in character. Consequently, if the theory be true, it is indisputable that before the lowest Cambrian stratum was deposited, long periods elapsed, as long as, or probably far longer than, the whole interval from the Cambrian age to the present day, and that during these vast periods the world swarmed with living creatures. Here we encounter a formidable objection, for it seems doubtful whether the earth, in a fit state for the habitation of living creatures, has lasted long enough. Sir W. Thompson concludes that the consolidation of the crust can hardly have occurred less than twenty or more than four hundred million years ago, but probably not less than ninety-eight or more than two hundred million years. These very wide limits show how doubtful the data are, and other elements may have hereafter to be introduced into the problem. Mr. Kroll estimates that about sixty million years have elapsed since the Cambrian period, but this, judging from the small amount of organic change since the commencement of the glacial epoch, appears a very short time for the many and great mutations of life, which have certainly occurred since the Cambrian formation. And the previous one hundred and forty million years can hardly be considered as sufficient for the development of the varied forms of life which already existed during the Cambrian period. It is, however, probable, as Sir William Thompson insists, that the world, at a very early period, was subjected to more rapid and violent changes in its physical conditions than those now occurring, and such changes would have tended to induce changes at a corresponding rate in the organisms which then existed. To the question why we do not find rich, fossiliferous deposits belonging to these assumed earliest periods prior to the Cambrian system, I can give no satisfactory answer. Several eminent geologists, with Sir R. Murchison at their head, were until recently convinced that we beheld in the organic remains of the lowest Silurian stratum the first dawn of life. Other highly competent judges, as Lyell and E. Forbes, have disputed this conclusion. We should not forget that only a small portion of the world is known with accuracy. Not very long ago, M. Barand added another and lower stage, abounding with new and peculiar species, beneath the then-known Silurian system. And now, still lower down in the lower Cambrian formation, Mr. Hicks has found South Wales beds rich in trilobites, and containing various mollusks and annelids. The presence of phosphatic nodules and bituminous matter, even in some of the lowest azotic rocks, probably indicates life at these periods, and the existence of the Eozoan in the Laurentian formation of Canada is generally admitted. There are three great series of strata beneath the Silurian system in Canada, in the lowest of which the Eozoan is found. Sir W. Logan states that their quote, united thickness may possibly far surpass that of all the succeeding rocks, from the base of the Paleozoic series to the present time. We are thus carried back to a period so remote that the appearance of the so-called primordial fauna of Barand may by some be considered as a comparatively modern event. End quote. The Eozoan belongs to the most lowly organized of all classes of animals, but is highly organized for its class. It existed in countless numbers, and, as Dr. Dawson has remarked, certainly preyed on other minute organic beings, which must have lived in great numbers. Thus the words which I wrote in 1859 about the existence of living beings long before the Cambrian period, and which are almost the same with those since used by Sir W. Logan, have proved true. Nevertheless, the difficulty of assigning any good reason for the absence of vast piles of strata, rich in fossils, beneath the Cambrian system, is very great. It does not seem probable that the most ancient beds have been quite worn away by denudation or that their fossils have been wholly obliterated by metamorphic action, for if this had been the case we should have found only small remnants of the formations next succeeding them in age, and these would always have existed in a partially metamorphosed condition. But the descriptions which we possess of the Silurian deposits over immense territories in Russia and in North America, 
do not support the view that the older a formation is, the more invariably it has suffered extreme denudation and metamorphism. The case at present must remain inexplicable, and may be truly urged as a valid argument against the views here entertained. To show that it may hereafter receive some explanation, I will give the following hypothesis. From the nature of the organic remains, which do not appear to have inhabited profound depths, in the several formations of Europe and of the United States, and from the amount of sediment, miles in thickness, of which the formations are composed, we may infer that from first to last large islands or tracts of land, whence the sediment was derived, occurred in the neighborhood of the now existing continents of Europe and North America. This same view has since been maintained by Agassiz and others. But we do not know what was the state of things in the intervals between the several successive formations, whether Europe and the United States during these intervals existed as dry land, or as a submarine surface, near land, on which sediment was not deposited, or as the bed of an open and unfathomable sea. Looking to the existing oceans, which are thrice as extensive as the land, we see them studded with many islands, but hardly one truly oceanic island, with the exception of New Zealand, if this can be called a truly oceanic island, is as yet known to afford even a remnant of any Paleozoic or secondary formation. Hence we may perhaps infer that during the Paleozoic and secondary periods, neither continents nor continental islands existed where our oceans now extend. For had they existed, Paleozoic and secondary formations would in all probability have been accumulated from sediment derived from their wear and tear, and would have been at least partially upheaved by the oscillations of level, which must have intervened during these enormously long periods. If, then, we may infer anything from these facts, we may infer that, where our oceans now extend, oceans have extended from the remotest period of which we have any record and on the other hand, that where continents now exist, large tracts of land have existed, subjected no doubt to great oscillations of level, since the Cambrian period. The colored map appended to my volume on coral reefs led me to conclude that the great oceans are still mainly areas of subsidence, the great archipelagos still areas of oscillations of level, and the continents areas of elevation. But we have no reason to assume that things have thus remained from the beginning of the world. Our continents seem to have been formed by a preponderance, during many oscillations of level, of the force of elevation. But may not the areas of preponderant movement have changed in the lapse of ages? At a period long antecedent to the Cambrian epoch, continents may have existed where oceans are now spread out, and clear and open oceans may have existed where our continents now stand. Nor should we be justified in assuming that if, for instance, the bed of the Pacific Ocean were now converted into a continent, we should there find sedimentary formations, in recognizable condition, older than the Cambrian strata, supposing such to have been formerly deposited. For it might well happen that strata which had subsided some miles nearer to the centre of the earth, and which had been pressed on by an enormous weight of superincumbent water, might have undergone far more metamorphic action than strata which have always remained nearer to the surface. The immense areas in some parts of the world, for instance in South America, of naked metamorphic rocks, which must have been heated under great pressure, have always seemed to me to require some special explanation, and we may perhaps believe that we see in these large areas the many formations long anterior to the Cambrian epoch in a completely metamorphosed and denuded condition. The several difficulties here discussed, namely, that, though we find in our geological formations many links between the species which now exist and which formerly existed, we do not find infinitely numerous fine transitional forms closely joining them all together. The sudden manner in which several groups of species first appear in our European formations, the almost entire absence, as at present known, of formations rich in fossils beneath the Cambrian strata, are all undoubtedly of the most serious nature. We see this in the fact that the most eminent paleontologists, namely Cuvier, Agassiz, Barand, Pictet, Falconer, E. Forbes, etc., and all our greatest geologists, as Lyell, Murchison, Sedgwick, etc., 
have unanimously, often vehemently, maintained the immutability of species. But Sir Charles Lyell now gives the support of his high authority to the opposite side, and most geologists and paleontologists are much shaken in their former belief. Those who believe that the geological record is in any degree perfect will undoubtedly at once reject my theory. For my part, following out Lyell's metaphor, I look at the geological record as a history of the world, imperfectly kept, and written in a changing dialect. Of this history we possess the last volume alone, relating only to two or three countries. Of this volume only here and there a short chapter has been preserved, and of each page only here and there a few lines. Each word of the slowly changing language, more or less different in the successive chapters, may represent the forms of life which are entombed in our consecutive formations, and which falsely appear to have been abruptly introduced. On this view, the difficulties above discussed are greatly diminished, or even disappear. End of chapter 10 Part This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox Dot org. The Origin of the Species by Natural Selection Or, The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life Sixth London Edition by Charles Darwin Chapter 11 On the Geological Succession of Organic Beings Part 1 Contents of this chapter include Of the slow and successive appearance of new species On their different rates of change Species once lost do not appear Groups of species follow the same general rules In their appearance and disappearance As do single species On extinction on simultaneous changes in the forms of life throughout the world. On the affinities of extinct species to each other and to living species. On the state of development of ancient forms. Of the succession of the same types within the same areas. Summary of preceding and present chapter. Let us now see whether the several facts and laws relating to the geological succession of organic beings accord best with the common view of the immutability of species or with that of their slow and gradual modification through variation and natural selection. New species have appeared very slowly, one after another, both on the land and in the waters. Lyell has shown that it is hardly possible to resist the evidence of this head in the case of the several tertiary stages, and every year tends to fill up the blanks between the stages, and to make the proportion between the lost and existing forms more gradual. In some of the most recent beds, though undoubtedly of high antiquity if measured by years, only one or two species are extinct, and only one or two are new, having appeared there for the first time either locally, or, as far as we know, on the face of the earth. The secondary formations are more broken. But, as Braun has remarked, neither the appearances nor disappearance of the many species embedded in each formation has been simultaneous. Species belonging to different genera and classes have not changed at the same rate or in the same degree. In the older tertiary beds, a few living shells may still be found in the midst of a multitude of extinct forms. Falconer has given a striking instance of a similar fact, for an existing crocodile is associated with many lost mammals and reptiles in the sub-Himalayan deposits. 
the Silurian lingula differs but little from the living species of this genus, whereas most of other Silurian mollusks and all the crustaceans have changed greatly. The productions of the land seem to have changed at a quicker rate than those of the sea, of which a striking instance has been observed in Switzerland. There is some reason to believe that organisms high in the scale change more quickly than those that are low, though there are exceptions to this rule. The amount of organic change, as Pictet has remarked, is not the same in each successive so-called formation. Yet, if we compare any but the most closely related formulations, all the species will be found to have undergone some change. When a species has once disappeared from the face of the earth, we have no reason to believe that the same identical form ever reappears. The strongest apparent exception to this latter rule is that of the so-called colonies of M. Barand, which intrude for a period in the midst of an older formation, and then allow the pre-existing fauna to reappear. But Lyell's explanation, namely, that it is a case of temporary migration from a distinct geographical province, seems satisfactory. These several facts accord well with our theory, which includes no fixed laws of development, causing all the inhabitants of an area to change abruptly, or simultaneously, or to an equal degree. The process of modification must be slow, and will generally affect only a few species at the same time, for the variability of each species is independent of that of all others. Whether such variations or individual differences, as may arise, will be accumulated through natural selection, in a greater or less degree, thus causing a greater or less amount of permanent modification, will depend on many complex contingencies, on the variations being of beneficial nature, on the freedom of intercrossing, on the slowly changing physical conditions of the country, on the immigration of new colonists, and on the nature of the other inhabitants with which the varying species come into competition. Hence, it is by no means surprising that one species should retain the same identical form much longer than others, or, if changing, should change in a less degree. We find similar relations between the existing inhabitants of distinct countries, for instance, the land shells and coleopterous insects of Madeira have come to differ considerably from their nearest allies on the continent of Europe, whereas the marine shells and birds have remained unaltered. We can perhaps understand the apparent quicker rate of change in terrestrial and in more highly organized productions compared with marine and lower productions by the more complex relations of the higher beings to their organic and inorganic conditions of life as explained in a former chapter. When many of the inhabitants of any area have become modified and improved, we can understand on the principle of competition, and from the all-important relations of organism to organism in the struggle for life, that any form which did not become in some degree modified and improved would be liable to extermination. Hence, we see why all the species in the same region do at last, if we look to long enough intervals of time, become modified, for otherwise they would become extinct. In members of the same class, the average amount of change during long and equal periods of time may perhaps be nearly the same, but as the great accumulation of enduring formations, rich in fossils, depends on great masses of sediment being deposited on subsiding areas, our formations have been almost necessarily accumulated at wide and irregularly intermittent intervals of time. Consequently, the amount of organic change exhibited by the fossils embedded in consecutive formations is not equal. Each formation, on this view, 
does not mark a new and complete act of creation, but only an occasional scene, taken almost at hazard in an ever-slowly changing drama. We can clearly understand why a species, when once lost, should never reappear, even if the very same conditions of life, organic and inorganic, should recur. For though the offspring of one species might be adapted, and no doubt this has occurred in innumerable instances, to fill the place of another species in the economy of nature, and thus supplant it, yet the two forms, the old and the new, would not be identically the same, for both would almost certainly inherit different characters from their distinct progenitors, and organisms already differing would vary in a different manner. For instance, it is possible, if all our fantail pigeons were destroyed, that fanciers might make a new breed hardly distinguishable from the present breed, but if the parent rock pigeon were likewise destroyed, and under nature we have every reason to believe that parent forms are generally supplanted and exterminated by their improved offspring, it is incredible that a fantail identical with the existing breed could be raised from any other species of pigeon or even from any other well-established race of the domestic pigeon, for the successive variations would almost certainly be in some degree different, and the newly formed variety would probably inherit from its progenitor some characteristic differences. Groups of species, <coughs> that is, genera and families, follow the same general rules in their appearance and disappearance as do single species, changing more or less quickly, and in a greater or lesser degree. A group, when it has once disappeared, never reappears. That is, its existence, as long as it lasts, is continuous. I am aware that there are some apparent exceptions to this rule, but the exceptions are surprisingly few so few that e forbes pictet and woodward though all strongly opposed to such views as i maintain admit its truth and the rule strictly accords with the theory for all the species of the same group however long it may have lasted are the modified descendants one from the other and all from a common progenitor in the genus Lingula, for instance, the species which have successively appeared at all ages must have been connected by an unbroken series of generations from the lowest Silurian stratum to the present day. We have seen in the last chapter that whole groups of species sometimes falsely appear to have been abruptly developed, and I have attempted to give an explanation of this fact which, if true, would be fatal to my views. But such cases are certainly exceptional, the general rule being a gradual increase in number until the group reaches its maximum, and then sooner or later a gradual decrease. If the number of species included within a genus, or the number of the genera within a family, be represented by a vertical line of varying thickness, ascending through the successive geological formations in which the species are found, the line will sometimes falsely appear to begin at its lower end, not in a sharp point, but abruptly. It then gradually thickens upwards, often keeping of equal thickness for a space, and ultimately thins out in the upper beds, marking the decrease and final extinction of the species. This gradual increase in the number of the species of a group is strictly conformable with the theory, for the species of the same genus and the genera of the same family can increase only slowly and progressively. The process of modification and the production of a number of allied forms necessarily being a slow and gradual process, one species first giving rise to two or three varieties these being slowly converted into species, which in their turn 
produce by equally slow steps other varieties and species, and so on, like the branching of a great tree from a single stem, till the group becomes large. ON EXTINCTION We have as yet only spoken incidentally of the disappearance of species and of groups of species. On the theory of natural selection, the extinction of old forms and the production of new and improved forms are intimately connected together. The old notion of all the inhabitants of the earth being swept away by catastrophes at successive periods is very generally given up, even by those geologists, as Elie de Beaumont, Murchison, Barand, etc., whose general views would naturally lead them to this conclusion. On the contrary, we have every reason to believe, from the study of the tertiary formations, that species and groups of species gradually disappear, one after another, first from one spot, then from another, and finally from the world. In some few cases, however, as by the breaking of an isthmus and the consequent eruption of a multitude of new inhabitants into an adjoining sea, or by the final subsistence of an island, the process of extinction may have been rapid. Both single species and whole groups of species last for very unequal periods. Some groups, as we have seen, have endured from the earliest known dawn of life to the present day. Some have disappeared before the close of the Paleozoic period. No fixed law seems to determine the length of time during which any single species or any single genus endures. There is reason to believe that the extinction of a whole group of species is generally a slower process than their production. If their appearance and disappearance be represented, as before, by a vertical line of varying thickness, the line is found to taper more gradually at its upper end, which marks the progress of extermination, than at its lower end, which marks the first appearance and the early increase in number of the species. In some cases, however, the extermination of whole groups, as of ammonites, toward the close of the secondary period, has been wonderfully sudden. The extinction of species has been involved in the most gratuitous mystery. Some authors have even supposed that, as the individual has a definite length of life, so have species a definite duration. No one can have marveled more than I have done at the extinction of species. When I found in La Plata the tooth of a horse embedded with the remains of Mastodon, Megatherium, Toxodon, and other extinct monsters, which all coexisted with still living shells at a very late geological period, I was filled with astonishment for, seeing that the horse, since its introduction by the Spaniards into South America, has run wild over the whole country, and has increased in numbers at an unparalleled rate, I asked myself what could so recently have exterminated the former horse under conditions of life apparently so favorable. But my astonishment was groundless. Professor Owen soon perceived that the tooth, though so like that of the existing horse, belonged to an extinct species. Had this horse been still living, but in some degree rare, no naturalist would have felt the least surprise at its rarity, for rarity is the attribute of a vast number of species of all classes, in all countries. If we ask ourselves why this or that species is rare, we answer that something is unfavorable in its conditions of life, but what that something is, we can hardly ever tell. On the supposition of the fossil horse, still existing as a rare species, we might have felt certain from the analogy of all other mammals, even of the slow-breeding elephant, 
and from the history of the naturalization of the domestic horse in South America, that under more favorable conditions it would, in a very few years, have stocked the whole continent. But we could not have told what the unfavorable conditions were which checked its increase, whether some one or several contingencies, and at what period of the horse's life, and in what degree they severally acted. If the conditions had gone on, however slowly, becoming less and less favorable, we assuredly would not have perceived the fact, yet the fossil horse would certainly have become rarer and rarer, and finally extinct, its place being seized on by some more successful competitor. It is most difficult always to remember that the increase of every living creature is constantly being checked by unperceived hostile agencies, and that these same unperceived agencies are amply sufficient to cause rarity and finally extinction. So little is this subject understood that I have heard surprise repeatedly expressed at such great monsters as the Mastodon, and the more ancient Donosaurians having become extinct, as if mere bodily strength gave victory in the battle of life. Mere size, on the contrary, would in some cases determine, as has been remarked by Owen, quicker extermination from the greater amount of requisite food. Before man inhabited India or Africa, some cause must have checked the continued increase of the existing elephant. A highly capable judge, Dr. Falconer, believes that it is chiefly insects which, from incessantly harassing and weakening the elephant in India, checked its increase. And this was Bruce's conclusion with respect to the African elephant in Abyssinia. It is certain that insects and blood-sucking bats determine the existence of the larger naturalized quadrupeds in several parts of South America. We see in many cases, in the more recent tertiary formations, that rarity precedes extinction, and we know that this has been the progress of events with those animals which have been exterminated, either, either locally or wholly, through man's agency. I may repeat what I published in 1845, namely, that to admit that species generally become rare before they become extinct, to feel no surprise at the rarity of a species, and yet to marvel greatly when the species ceases to exist, is much the same as to admit that sickness in the individual is the forerunner of death. To feel no surprise at sickness, but when the sick man dies, to wonder and to suspect that he died by some deed of violence. The theory of natural selection is grounded on the belief that each new variety, and ultimately each new species, is produced and maintained by having some advantage over those with which it comes into competition and the consequent extinction of less favored forms almost inevitably follows. It is the same with our domestic productions. When a new and slightly improved variety has been raised, it at first supplants the less, imp less improved varieties in the same neighborhood. When much improved, it is transported far and near like our short-horn cattle and takes the place of other breeds, in other countries. Thus the appearance of new forms and the disappearance of old forms, both those naturally and artificially produced, are bound together. In flourishing groups the number of new specific forms which have been produced within a given time has at some periods probably been greater than the number of the old specific forms which have been exterminated but we know that species have not gone on indefinitely increasing, at least during the later geological epochs, so that, looking to later times, we may believe that the production of new forms has caused the extinction of about the same number of old forms. 
The competition will generally be most severe, as formerly explained and illustrated by examples, between the forms which are most like each other in all respects. Hence the improved and modified descendants of a species will generally cause the extermination of the parent species, and if many new forms have been developed from any one species, the nearest allies of that species, that is, the species of the same genus, will be the most liable to extermination. Thus, as I believe, a number of new species descended from one species, that is, a new genus, comes to supplant an old genus belonging to the same family. But it must often have happened that a new species belonging to some one group has seized on the place occupied by a species belonging to a distinct group, and thus have caused its extermination. If many allied forms be developed from the successful intruder, many will have to yield their places, and it will generally be the allied forms which will suffer from some inherited inferiority in common. But whether it be species belonging to the same or to a distinct class, which have yielded their places to other modified and improved species, a few of the sufferers may often be preserved for a long time, from being fitted to some peculiar line of life, or from inhabiting some distant and isolated station, where they will have escaped severe competition. For instance, some species of Trigonia, a great genus of shells in the secondary formations, survive in the Australian seas, and a few members of the great and almost extinct group of ganoid fishes still inhabit our fresh waters. Therefore, the utter extinction of a group is generally, as we have seen, a slower process than its production. With respect to the apparently sudden extermination of whole families or orders, as of trilobites at the close of the Paleozoic period, and of ammonites at the close of the secondary period, we must remember what has been said already on the probable wide intervals of time between our consecutive formations, and in these intervals there may have been much slow extermination. Moreover, when, by sudden immigration or by unusually rapid development, many species of a new group have taken possession of an area, many of the older species will have been exterminated in a correspondingly rapid manner, and the forms which thus yield their places will commonly be allied for they will partake of the same inferiority in common. Thus, as it seems to me, the manner in which single species and whole groups of species become extinct accords well with the theory of natural selection. We need not marvel at extinction. If we must marvel, let it be at our presumption in imagining for a moment that we understand the many complex contingencies on which the existence of each species depends. If we forget for an instant that each species tends to increase inordinately, and that some check is always in action, yet seldom perceived by us, the whole economy of nature will be utterly obscured. Whenever we can precisely say why this species is more abundant in individuals than that, why this species, and not another, can be naturalized in a given country, then, and not until then, we may justly feel surprise why we cannot account for the extinction of any particular species or group of species. ON THE FORMS OF LIFE CHANGING ALMOST SIMULTANEOUSLY THROUGHOUT THE WORLD. Scarcely any paleontological discovery is more striking than the fact that the forms of life change almost simultaneously throughout the world. Thus our European chalk formation can be recognized in many distant regions under the most different climates 
where not a fragment of the mineral chalk itself can be found, namely in North America, in equatorial South America, in Tierra del Fuego, at the Cape of Good Hope, and in the peninsula of India. For at these distant points the organic remains in certain beds present an unmistakable resemblance to those of the chalk. It is not that the same species are met with, for in some cases not one species is identically the same, but they belong to the same families, genera, and sections of genera, and sometimes are similarly characterized in such trifling points as mere superficial sculpture. Moreover, other forms which are not found in the chalk of Europe, but which occur in the formations either above or below, occur in the same order at these distant points of the world. In the several successive paleologic formations of Russia, Western Europe, and North America, a similar parallelism in the forms of life has been observed by many authors, and so it is, according to Lyell, with the European and North American tertiary deposits. Even if the few fossil species which are common to the old and new worlds were kept wholly out of view, the general parallelism in the successive forms of life in the Paleozoic and Tertiary stages would still be manifest, and the several formations could be easily correlated. These observations, however, relate to the marine inhabitants of the world. We have not sufficient data to judge whether the productions of land and of fresh water at distant points change in the same parallel manner. We may doubt whether they have thus changed. If the Megatherium, Mylodon, Macrachenia, and Toxodon had been brought to Europe from La Plata without any information in regard to their geological position, no one would have suspected that they had coexisted with seashells, all still living. But as these anomalous monsters coexisted with the mastodon and horse, it might at least have been inferred that they had lived during one of the later tertiary stages. When the marine forms of life are spoken of as having changed simultaneously throughout the world, it must not be supposed that this expression relates to the same year, or even to the same century, or even that it has a very strict geological sense. For if all of the marine animals now living in Europe, and all those that lived in Europe during the Pleistocene period, a very remote period, as measured by years, including the whole glacial epoch, were compared with those now existing in South America or in Australia, the most skillful naturalist would hardly be able to say whether the present or the Pleistocene inhabitants of Europe resembled most closely those of the southern hemisphere. So, again, several highly competent observers maintain that the existing productions of the United States are more closely related to those which lived in Europe during certain late tertiary stages than to the present inhabitants of Europe, and if this be so, it is evident that Fossiliferous beds now deposited on the shores of North America would hereafter be liable to be classed with somewhat older European beds. Nevertheless, looking to a remotely future epoch, there can be little doubt that 
all the more modern marine formations, namely the Upper Pliocene, the Pleistocene, and strictly modern beds of Europe, North and South America and Australia, from containing fossil remains in some degree allied, and from not including those forms which are found only in the older underlying deposits, would be correctly ranked as simultaneous in a geological sense. The fact of the forms of life changing simultaneously in the above large sense at distant parts of the world has greatly struck those admirable observers, Messrs. de Vernoy and Dacariac. After referring to the parallelism of the Paleozoic forms of life in various parts of Europe, they add, quote, If struck by this strange sequence, we turn our attention to North America, and there discover a series of analogous phenomena, it will appear certain that all these modifications of species, their extinction and the introduction of new ones, cannot be owing to mere changes in marine currents, or other causes more or less local and temporary, but depend on general laws which govern the whole animal kingdom. Close quote. M. Barand has made forcible remarks to precisely the same effect. It is indeed quite futile to look to changes of currents, climate, or other physical conditions as the cause of these great mutations in the forms of life throughout the world under the most different climates. We must, as Barand has remarked, look to some special law. We shall see this more clearly when we treat of the present distribution of organic beings, and how slight is the relation between the physical conditions of various countries and the nature of their inhabitants. This great fact of the parallel succession of the forms of life throughout the world is explicable on the theory of natural selection. New species are formed by having some advantage over older forms, and the forms which are already dominant, or have some advantage over the other forms in their own country, give birth to the greatest number of new varieties or incipient species. We have distinct evidence on this head in the plants which are dominant, that is, which are commonest and most widely diffused, producing the greatest number of new varieties. It is also natural that the dominant, varying, and far-spreading species, which have already invaded, to a certain extent, the territories of other species, should be those which would have the best chance of spreading still further, and of giving rise in new countries to other new varieties and species. The process of diffusion would often be very slow, depending on climatal and geographical changes, on strange accidents, and on the gradual acclimatization of new species to the various climates through which they might have to pass, but in the course of time the dominant forms would generally succeed in spreading and would ultimately prevail. The diffusion would be slower, it is probable, with the terrestrial inhabitants of distinct continents than with the marine inhabitants of the continuous sea. We might therefore expect to find, as we do, a less strict degree of parallelism in the succession of the productions of the land than with those of the sea. Thus, as it seems to me, the parallel, 
and taken at a large sense, simultaneous succession of the same forms of life throughout the world, accords well with the principle of new species having been formed by dominant species spreading widely and varying. The new species thus produced being themselves dominant, owing to their having had some advantage over their already dominant parents, as well as over other species, and again spreading, varying, and producing new forms. The old forms which are beaten, and which yield their places to the new and victorious forms, will generally be allied in groups, from inheriting some inferiority in common, and therefore, as new and improved groups spread throughout the world, old groups disappear from the world, and the succession of forms everywhere tends to correspond both in their first appearance and final disappearance. There is one other remark connected with this subject worth making. I have given my reasons for believing that most of our great formations, rich in fossils, were deposited during periods of subsidence, and that blank intervals of vast duration, as far as fossils are concerned, occurred during the periods when the bed of the sea was either stationary or rising, and likewise when sediment was not thrown down quickly enough to embed and preserve organic remains. During these long and blank intervals, I suppose that the inhabitants of each region underwent a considerable amount of modification and extinction, and that there was much migration from other parts of the world. As we have reason to believe that large areas are affected by the same movement, it is probable that strictly contemporaneous formations have often been accumulated over very wide spaces in the same quarter of the world, but we are very far from having any right to conclude that this has invariably been the case, and that large areas have invariably been affected by the same movements. When two formations have been deposited in two regions during nearly but not exactly the same period, we should find in both, from the causes explained in the foregoing paragraphs, the same general succession in the forms of life. But the species would not exactly correspond, for there will have been a little more time in the one region than in the other for modification, extinction, and immigration. I suspect that cases of this nature occur in Europe. Mr. Prestwich, in his admirable memoirs of the Eocene deposits of England and France, is able to draw a close general parallelism between the successive states in the two countries. But when he compares certain stages in England with those in France, although he finds in both a curious accordance in the numbers of the species belonging to the same genera, yet the species themselves differ in a manner very difficult to account for considering the proximity of the two areas, unless, indeed, it be assumed that an isthmus separated two seas inhabited by distinct but contemporaneous faunas. Lyell has made similar observations on some of the later tertiary formations. Baran, also, shows that there is a striking general parallelism in the successive Silurian deposits of Bohemia and Scandinavia. Nevertheless, he finds a surprising amount of difference in the species. If the several formations in these regions have not been deposited during the same exact periods, a formation in one region often corresponding with a blank interval in the other, and if in both regions the species have gone on slowly changing during the accumulation of the several formations, and during the long intervals of time between them, in this case the several formations in the two regions could be arranged in the same order, in accordance with the general succession of the forms of life. And the order would falsely appear to be strictly parallel. Nevertheless, the species would not all be the same in the apparently corresponding stages in the two regions. 
End of Chapter 11 Part 1 Recorded by Dennis Sayers, Modesto, California, Winter 2 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. The Origin of the Species by Natural Selection or The Preservation of Favoured Races in the Struggle for Life 6th London Edition by Charles Darwin Chapter 11 On the Geological Succession of Organic Beings Part 2 On the Affinities of Extinct Species to Each Other and to Living Forms let us now look to the mutual affinities of extinct and living species. All fall into a few grand classes, and this fact is at once explained on the principle of descent. The more ancient any form is, the more, as a general rule, it differs from living forms. But, as Buckland long ago remarked, extinct species can be classed either in still existing groups or between them. That the extinct forms of life help to fill up the intervals between existing genera, families, and orders is certainly true, but as this statement has often been ignored or even denied, it may be well to make some remarks on the subject and to give some instances. If we confine our attention either to the living or to the extinct species of the same class, the series is far less perfect than if we combine both into one general system. In the writings of Professor Owen, we continually meet with the expression of generalized forms as applied to extinct animals, and in the writings of Agassiz, of prophetic or synthetic types, and these terms imply that such forms are, in fact, intermediate or connecting links. Another distinguished paleontologist, M. Gaudry, has shown in the most striking manner that many of the fossil animals discovered by him in Attica serve to break down the intervals between existing genera. Cuvier ranked the ruminants and pachyderms as two of the most distinct orders of mammals. But so many fossil links have been disentombed that Owen has had to alter the whole classification and has placed certain pachyderms in the same suborder with ruminants. For example, he dissolves by gradations the apparently wide interval between the pig and the camel. The ungulata of hoofed quadrupeds are now divided into the even-toed or odd-toed divisions. But the macrochenia of South America connects to a certain extent these two grand divisions. No one will deny that the hyparion is intermediate between the existing horse and certain other ungulate forms. What a wonderful connecting link in the chain of mammals is the Typotherium from South America, as the name given to it by Professor Gerbet expresses, and which cannot be placed in any existing order. The Sirenia form, a very distinct group of the mammals and one of the most remarkable peculiarities in existing Dugong and Lamington, is the entire absence of hind limbs, without even a rudiment being left. But the extinct halotherium had, according to Professor Flower, an ossified thigh bone, quote, articulated to a well-defined acetabulum in the pelvis, close quote. And it thus makes some approach to ordinary hooved quadrupeds, to which the Sirenia are in other respects allied. The cetaceans, or whales, are widely different from all other mammals, but the tertiary, Swiglodon and Squalodon, which have been placed 
by some naturalists in an order by themselves, are considered by Professor Huxley to be undoubtedly cetaceans, and, quote, to constitute connecting links with the aquatic carnivora, close quote. Even the wide interval between birds and reptiles has been shown by the naturalist just quoted to be partially bridged over in the most unexpected manner, on the one hand, by the ostrich and the extinct Archeoteryx, and on the other hand, by the Compsognathus, one of the dinosaurians, that group which includes the most gigantic of all terrestrial reptiles. Turning to the invertebrata, Barand asserts, a higher authority could not be named, that he is every day taught that, although Paleozoic animals can certainly be classed under existing groups, yet that at this ancient period the groups were not so distinctly separated from each other as they now are. Some writers have objected to any extinct species or group of species being considered as intermediate between any two living species, or groups of species. If by this term it is meant that an extinct form is directly intermediate in all its characters between the two living forms or groups, the objection is probably valid. But in a natural classification, many fossil species certainly stand between living species and some extinct genera between living genera, even between genera belonging to distinct families. The most common case, especially with respect to very distinct groups, such as fish and reptiles, seems to be that, supposing them to be distinguished at the present day by a score of characters, the ancient members are separated by a somewhat lesser number of characters, so that the two groups formerly made a somewhat nearer approach to each other than they now do. It is a common belief that the more ancient a form is, by so much the more it tends to connect by some of its characters groups now widely separated from each other. This remark, no doubt, must be restricted to those groups which have undergone much change in the course of geological ages, and it would be difficult to prove the truth of the proposition, for every now and then even a living animal, as the Lepidosiren, is discovered having affinities directed towards very distinct groups. Yet if we compare the older reptiles and baltrachians, the older fish, the older cephalopods, and the eocene mammals, with the recent members of the same classes, we must admit that there is truth in the remark. Let us see how far these facts and several inferences accord with the theory of descent with modification. As the subject is somewhat complex, I must request the reader to turn to the diagram in the fourth chapter. We may suppose that the numbered letters in italics represent genera, and the dotted lines diverging from them the species in each genus. The diagram is much too simple, too few genera, and too few species being given, but this is unimportant for us. The horizontal lines may represent successive geological formations, and all the forms beneath the uppermost line may be considered as extinct. The three existing genera, A14, Q14, P14, will form a small family, B14 and F14 a closely allied family or subfamily, and O14, I14, M14, a third family. These three families, together with the many extinct genera on the several lines of descent, diverging from the parent form, A, will form an order, for all will have inherited something in common from their ancient progenitor. On the principle of the continued tendency to divergence of character, which was formerly illustrated by this diagram, the more recent any form is, the more it will generally differ from its ancient progenitor. Hence, we can understand the rule 
that the most ancient fossils differ most from existing forms. We must not, however, assume that divergence of character is a necessary contingency. It depends solely on the descendants from a species being thus enabled to seize on many and different places in the economy of nature. Therefore, it is quite possible, as we have seen in the case of some Silurian forms, that a species might go on being slightly modified in relation to its slightly altered conditions of life, and yet retain throughout a vast period the same general characteristics. This is represented in the diagram by the letter capital F, 14. All the many forms, extinct and recent, descended from A, make, as before remarked, one order, and this order, from the continued effects of extinction and divergence of character, has become divided into several subfamilies and families, some of which are supposed to have perished at different periods, and some to have endured to the present day. By looking at the diagram, we can see that if many of the extinct forms supposed to be embedded in these successive formations were discovered at several points low down in the series, the three existing families on the uppermost line would be rendered less distinct from each other. If, for instance, the genera A1, A5, A10, F8, M3, M6, M9 were disinterred, these three families would be so closely linked together that they probably would have to be united into one great family in nearly the same manner as has occurred with ruminants and certain pachyderms. Yet he who objected to consider as intermediate the extinct genera, which thus linked together the living genera of three families, would be partly justified, for they are intermediate, not directly, but only by a long and circuitous course through many widely different forms. If many extinct forms were to be discovered above one of the middle horizontal lines, or geological formations, for instance, above number 7, but none from beneath this line, then only two of the families, those on the left hand, A14, etc., and B14, etc., would have to be united into one, and there would remain two families which would be less distinct from each other than they were before the discovery of the fossils. So, again, if the three families formed of eight genera, A14 to M14, on the uppermost line, be supposed to differ from each other by half a dozen important characters, then the families which existed at the period marked seven would certainly have differed from each other by a less number of characters, for they would, at this early stage of descent, have diverged in a less degree from their common progenitor. Thus it becomes that ancient and extinct genera are often in a greater or less degree intermediate in character between their modified descendants, or between their collateral relations. Under nature, the process will be far more complicated than is represented in the diagram, for the groups will have been more numerous. They will have endured for extremely unequal lengths of time, and will have been modified in various degrees. As we possess only the last volume of the geological record, and that in a very broken condition, we have no right to expect, except in rare cases, to fill up the wide intervals in the natural system, and thus to unite distinct families or orders. All that we have a right to expect is that those groups which have, within known geological periods, undergone much modification, should in the older formations make some slight approach to each other, so that the older members should differ less from each other in some of their characters than do the existing members of the same groups, and this by the concurrent evidence of our best paleontologists is frequently the case. Thus, on the theory of descent with modification, 
the main facts with respect to the mutual affinities of the extinct forms of life to each other and to living forms are explained in a satisfactory manner, and they are wholly inexplicable on any other view. On this same theory, it is evident that the fauna during any one great period in the Earth's history will be intermediate in general character between that which preceded and that which succeeded it. Thus, the species which lived at the sixth great stage of descent in the diagram are the modified offspring of those which lived at the fifth stage, and are the parents of those which became still more modified at the seventh stage. Hence, they could hardly fail to be nearly intermediate in character between the forms of life above and below. We must, however, allow for the entire extinction of some preceding forms, and in any one region for the immigration of new forms from other regions, and for a large amount of modification during the long and blank intervals between the successive formations. Subject to these allowances, the fauna of each geological period undoubtedly is intermediate in character between the preceding and succeeding faunas. I need give only one instance, namely, the manner in which the fossils of the Devonian system, when this system was first discovered, were at once recognized by paleontologists as intermediate in character between those of the overlying Carboniferous and underlying Silurian systems. But each fauna is not necessarily exactly intermediate, as unequal intervals of time have elapsed between consecutive formations. It is no real objection to the truth of the statement that the fauna of each period as a whole is nearly intermediate in character between the preceding and succeeding faunas, that certain genera offer exceptions to the rule. For instance, the species of mastodons and elephants, when arranged by Dr. Falconer in two series, in the first place according to their mutual affinities, and in the second place according to their periods of existence, do not accord in arrangement. The species extreme in character are not the oldest or the most recent, nor are those which are intermediate in character, intermediate in age. But supposing for an instant, in this and other such cases, that the record of the first appearance and disappearance of the species was complete, which is far from the case, we have no reason to believe that forms successively produced necessarily endure for corresponding lengths of time. A very ancient form may occasionally have lasted much longer than a form elsewhere subsequently produced, especially in the case of terrestrial productions inhabiting separated districts. To compare small things with great, if the principal living and extinct races of the domestic pigeon were arranged in serial affinity, this arrangement would not closely accord with the order and time of their production, and even less with the order of their disappearance, for the parent rock pigeon still lives, and many varieties between the rock pigeon and the carrier have become extinct, and carriers, which are extreme in the important character of length of beak, originated earlier than short-beaked tumblers, which are at the opposite end of the series in this respect. Closely connected with the statement that the organic remains from an intermediate formation are in some degree intermediate in character, is the fact, insisted on by all paleontologists, that fossils from two consecutive formations are far more closely related to each other than are the fossils from two remote formations. Pictet gives, as a well-known instance, the general resemblance of the organic remains from the several stages of the chalk formation, though the species are distinct in each stage. This fact alone, from its generality, seems to have shaken Professor Pictet in his belief in the immutability of species. He who is acquainted with the distribution of existing species over the globe 
will not attempt to account for the close resemblance of distinct species in closely consecutive formations by the physical conditions of the ancient areas having remained nearly the same. Let it be remembered that the forms of life, at least those inhabiting the sea, have changed almost simultaneously throughout the world, and therefore under the most different climates and conditions. Consider the prodigious vicissitudes of climate during the Pleistocene period, which includes the whole glacial epoch, and note how little the specific forms of the inhabitants of the sea have been affected. On the theory of descent, the full meaning of the fossil remains from closely consecutive formations being closely related, though ranked as distinct species, is obvious. As the accumulation of each formation has often been interrupted, and as long blank intervals have intervened between successive formations, we ought not to expect to find, as I attempted to show in the last chapter, in any one or in any two formations, all the intermediate varieties between the species which appeared at the commencement and close of these periods. But we ought to find, after intervals, very long as measured by years, but only moderately long as measured geologically, closely allied forms, or, as they have been called by some authors, representative species, and these assuredly we do find. We find, in short, such evidence of the slow and scarcely sensible mutations of specific forms as we have the right to expect. On the state of development of ancient compared with living forms. We have seen in the fourth chapter that the degree of differentiation and specialization of the parts in organic beings, when arrived at maturity, is the best standard, as yet suggested, of their degree of perfection or highness. We have also seen that as the specialization of parts is an advantage to each being, so natural selection will tend to render the organization of each being more specialized and perfect, and in this sense higher. Not but that it may leave many creatures with simple and unimproved structures fitted for simple conditions of life, and in some cases will even degrade or simplify the organization, yet leaving such degraded beings better fitted for their new walks of life. In another and more general manner, new species become superior to their predecessors, for they have to beat in the struggle of life all the older forms, with which they come into close competition. We may therefore conclude that if under a nearly similar climate the Eocene inhabitants of the world could be put into competition with the existing inhabitants, the former would be beaten and exterminated by the latter, as would the secondary by the Eocene, and the Paleozoic by the secondary forms, so that by this fundamental test of victory in the battle for life, as well as by the standard of the specialization of organs, modern forms ought, on the theory of natural selection, to stand higher than ancient forms. Is this the case? A large majority of paleontologists would answer in the affirmative, and it seems that this answer must be admitted as true, though difficult of proof. It is no valid objection to this conclusion that certain brachiopods have been but slightly modified from an extremely remote geological epoch, and that certain land and fresh water shells have remained nearly the same from the time when, as far as is known, they first appeared. It is not an insuperable difficulty that foraminifera have not, as insisted on by Dr. Carpenter, progressed in organization since even the Laurentian epoch, for some organisms would have to remain fitted for simple conditions of life, and what could be better fitted for this end than these lowly organized protozoa? Such objections as the above would be fatal to my view if it included 
advance in organization as a necessary contingent. They would likewise be fatal if the above foraminifera, for instance, could be proved to have first come into existence during the Laurentian epoch, or the above brachiopods during the Cambrian formation, for in this case there would not have been time sufficient for the development of these organisms up to the standard which they had then reached. When advanced up to any given point, there is no necessity, on the theory of natural selection, for their further continued process, though they will, during each successive age, have to be slightly modified so as to hold their places in relation to slight changes in their conditions. The foregoing objections hinge on the question whether we really know how old the world is, and at what period the various forms of life first appeared, and this may be well disputed. The problem whether organization on the whole has advanced is in many ways excessively intricate, the geological record, at all times imperfect, does not extend far back enough to show with unmistakable clearness that within the known history of the world, organization has largely advanced. Even at the present day, looking to members of the same class, naturalists are not unanimous which forms ought to be ranked as highest. Thus, some look at the Salisians or sharks from their approach in some important points of structure to reptiles as the highest fish. Others look at the Teleosteans as the highest. The Ganoids stand intermediate between the Celesians and the Teleosteans. The latter at the present day are largely preponderant in number, but formerly Celesians and Ganoids alone existed, and in this case, according to the standard of highness chosen, so will it be said that fishes have advanced or retrograded in organization. To attempt to compare members of distinct types in the scale of highness seems hopeless. Who will decide whether a cuttlefish be higher than a bee? That insect, which the great von Baer believed to be, quote, in fact, more highly organized than a fish, although upon another type. Close quote. In the complex struggle for life, it is quite credible that crustaceans, not very high in their own class, might beat cephalopods, the highest mollusks, and such crustaceans, though not highly developed, would stand very high in the scale of invertebrate animals, if judged by the most decisive of all trials, the law of battle. Beside these inherent difficulties in deciding which forms are the most advanced in organization, we ought not solely to compare the highest members of a class at any two periods, though undoubtedly this is one and perhaps the most important element in striking a balance, but we ought to compare all the members high and low at two periods. At an ancient epoch, the highest and lowest molluscoidal animals, namely cephalopods and brachiopods, swarmed in numbers, and at the present time both groups are heavily reduced, while others, intermediate in organization, have largely increased. Consequently, some naturalists maintain that mollusks were formerly more highly developed than at present, but a stronger case can be made out on the opposite side by considering the vast reduction of brachiopods and the fact that our existing cephalopods, though few in number, are more highly organized than their ancient representatives. We ought also to compare the relative proportional numbers at any two periods of the high and low classes throughout the world, if, for instance, at the present day 50,000 kinds of vertebrate animals exist, and if we knew that at some former time only 10,000 kinds existed, we ought to look at this increase in number in the highest class, which implies a great displacement of lower forms, as a decided advance in the organization of the world. We thus see how hopelessly difficult it is to compare with perfect fairness 
under such extreme complex relations the standard of organization of the imperfectly known faunas of successive periods. We shall appreciate this difficulty more clearly by looking to certain existing faunas and floras. From the extraordinary manner in which European productions have recently spread over New Zealand, and have seized on places which must have been previously occupied by the indigenes, we must believe that if all the animals and plants of Great Britain were set free in New Zealand, a multitude of British forms would in the course of time become thoroughly naturalized there and would exterminate many of the natives. On the other hand, from the fact that hardly a single inhabitant of the southern hemisphere has become wild in any part of Europe, we may well doubt whether, if all the productions of New Zealand were set free in Great Britain, any considerable number would be enabled to seize on places now occupied by our native plants and animals. Under this point of view, the productions of Great Britain stand much higher in the scale than those of New Zealand, yet the most skillful naturalist, from an examination of the species of the two countries, could not have foreseen this result. Agassiz and several other highly competent judges insist that ancient animals resemble, to a certain extent, the embryos of recent animals belonging to the same classes, and that the geological succession of extinct forms is nearly parallel with the embryological development of existing forms. This view accords well with our theory. In a future chapter, I shall attempt to show that the adult differs from its embryo, owing to variations having supervened at a not early age, and having been inherited at a corresponding age. This process, whilst it leaves the embryo almost unaltered, continually adds, in the course of successive generations, more and more difference to the adult. Thus the embryo comes to be left as a sort of picture preserved by nature of the former and less modified condition of the species. This view may be true, and yet may never be capable of proof. Seeing, for instance, that the oldest known mammals, reptiles, and fishes strictly belong to their proper classes, though some of these old forms are in a slight degree less distinct from each other than are the typical members of the same groups at the present day, it would be vain to look for animals having the common embryological character of the vertebrata, until beds rich in fossils are discovered far beneath the lowest Cambrian strata, a discovery of which the chance is small. On the succession of the same types within the same areas during the later tertiary periods. Mr. Cliff, many years ago, showed that the fossil mammals from the Australian caves were closely allied to the living marsupials of that continent. In South America, a similar relationship is manifest, even to an uneducated eye, in the gigantic pieces of armor, like those of the armadillo, found in several parts of La Plata, and Professor Owen has shown in the most striking manner that most of the fossil mammals buried there, in such numbers, are related to South American types. This relationship is even more clearly seen in the wonderful collection of fossil bones made by Messrs. Lund and Clausen in the caves of Brazil. I was so much impressed with these facts that in 1839 and 1845, I strongly insisted on this, quote, law of the succession of types, on this wonderful relationship in the same continent between the dead and the living, close quote. Professor Owen has subsequently extended the same generalization to the mammals of the old world. We see the same law in this author's restorations of the extinct and gigantic birds of New Zealand. 
We see it also in the birds of the caves of Brazil. Mr. Woodward has shown that the same law holds good with seashells, but from the wide distribution of most mollusks, it is not well displayed by them. Other cases could be added, as the relation between the extinct and living land shells of Madeira, and between the extinct and living brackish water shells of the Aralo caspian Sea. Now, what does this remarkable law of succession of the same types within the same areas mean? He would be a bold man who, after comparing the present climate of Australia and of parts of South America, and under the same latitude, would attempt to account, on the one hand, through to similar physical conditions, for the dissimilarity of the inhabitants of these two continents, and, on the other hand, through similarity of conditions, for the uniformity of the same types in each continent during the latter tertiary periods. Nor can it be pretended that it is an immutable law that marsupials should have been chiefly or solely produced in Australia, or that edentata and other American types should have been solely produced in South America. For we know that Europe in ancient times was peopled by numerous marsupials, and I have shown in the publications above alluded to that in America the law of distribution of terrestrial mammals was formerly different from what it now is. North America formerly partook strongly of the present character of the southern half of the continent, and the southern half was formerly more closely allied than it is at present to the northern half. In a similar manner, we know from Falconer and Cotley's discoveries that northern India was more formally closely related in its mammals to Africa than it is at the present time. Analogous facts could be given in relation to the distribution of marine animals. On the theory of descent with modification, the great law of the long-enduring but not immutable succession of the same types within the same areas is at once explained. For the inhabitants of each quarter of the world will obviously tend to leave in that quarter, during the next succeeding period of time, closely allied, though in some degree modified, descendants. If the inhabitants of one continent formerly differed greatly from those of another continent, so will their modified descendants still differ in nearly the same manner and degree. But after very long intervals of time, and after great geographical changes, permitting much intermigration, the feebler will yield to the more dominant forms, and there will be nothing immutable in the distribution of organic beings. It may be asked in ridicule whether I suppose that the Megatherium and other allied huge monsters which formerly lived in South America have left behind them the sloth, armadillo, and anteater as their degenerate descendants. This cannot for an instant be admitted. These huge animals have become wholly extinct and have left no progeny. But in the caves of Brazil, there are many extinct species which are closely allied in size and in all other characters to the species still living in South America, and some of these fossils may have been the actual progenitors of the living species. It must not be forgotten that, on our theory, all the species of the same genus are the descendants of some one species, so that if six genera each having eight species be found in one geological formation, and in a succeeding formation there be six or other allied or representative genera, each with the same number of species, then we may conclude that generally only one species of each of the older genera has left modified descendants, which constitute the new genera, containing the several species, the other seven species of each old genus having died out and left no progeny. 
or, and this will be a far commoner case, two or three species and two or three alone of the six older genera will be the parents of the new genera. The other species and the other old genera having become utterly extinct. In failing orders, with the genera and species decreasing in number, as in the case of the Edentata of South America, still fewer genera and species will leave modified blood descendants. Summary of the preceding and present chapters. I have attempted to show that the geological record is extremely imperfect, that only a small portion of the globe has been geologically explored with care, that only certain classes of organic beings having been largely preserved in a fossil state, that the number both of specimens and of species preserved in our museums is absolutely as nothing compared with the number of generations which must have passed away, even during a single formation. That, owing to the subsidence being almost necessary for the accumulation of deposits rich in fossil species of many kinds, and thick enough to outlast future degradation, great intervals of time must have elapsed between most of our successive formations. That there has probably been more extinction during the periods of subsidence, and more variation during the periods of elevation, and during the latter the record will have been least perfectly kept. That each single formation has not been continuously deposited, that the duration of each formation is probably short compared with the average duration of specific forms, that migration has played an important part in the first appearance of new forms in any one area and formation, that widely ranging species are those which have varied most frequently and have oftenest given rise to new species, that varieties have at first been local. And lastly, although each species must have passed through numerous transitional stages, it is probable that the periods during which each underwent modification, though many and long as measured by years, have been short in comparison with the periods during which each remained in an unchanged condition. These causes, taken conjointly, will to a large extent explain why, though we do find many links, we do not find interminable varieties, connecting together all extinct and existing forms by the finest graduated steps. It should also be constantly borne in mind that any linking variety between two forms which might be found would be ranked, unless the whole chain could be perfectly restored as a new and distinct species, for it is not pretended that we have any sure criterion by which species and varieties can be discriminated. He who rejects this view of the imperfection of the geological record will rightly reject the whole theory, for he may ask in vain where are the numberless transitional links which must formerly have connected the closely allied or representative species found in the successive stages of the same great formation. He may disbelieve in the immense intervals of time which must have elapsed between our consecutive formations. He may overlook how important a part migration has played when the formations of any one great region, as those of Europe, are considered. He may urge the apparent, but often falsely apparent, sudden coming in of whole groups of species. He may ask, where are the remains of those infinitely numerous organisms which must have existed long before the Cambrian system was deposited? We now know that at least one animal did then exist, but I can answer this last question only by supposing that where our oceans now extend, they have extended for an enormous period, and where our oscillating continents now stand, 
they have stood since the commencement of the Cambrian system, but that long before that epoch the world presented a widely different aspect, and that the older continents, formed of formations older than any known to us, exist now only as remnants in a metamorphosed condition, or lie still buried under the ocean. Passing from these difficulties, the other great leading facts in paleontology agree admirably with the theory of descent, with modification, through variation and natural selection. We can thus understand how it is that new species come in slowly and successively, how species of different classes do not necessarily change together, or at the same rate, or in the same degree. Yet in the long run, that all undergo modification to some extent. The extinction of old forms is the almost inevitable consequence of the production of new forms. We can understand why, when a species has once disappeared, it never reappears. Groups of species increase in numbers slowly and endure for unequal periods of time, for the process of modification is necessarily slow and depends on many complex contingencies. The dominant species belonging to large and dominant groups tend to leave many modified descendants, which form new subgroups and groups. As these are formed, the species of the less vigorous groups, from their inferiority inherited from a common progenitor, tend to become extinct together and to leave no modified offspring on the face of the earth. But the utter extinction of a whole group of species has sometimes been a slow process, from the survival of a few descendants lingering in protected and isolated situations. When a group has once wholly disappeared, it does not reappear, for the link of generation has been broken. We can understand how it is that dominant forms which spread widely and yield the greatest number of varieties tend to people the world with allied but modified descendants, and these will generally succeed in displacing the groups which are their inferiors in the struggle for existence. Hence, after long intervals of time, the productions of the world appear to have changed simultaneously. We can understand how it is that all the forms of life, ancient and recent, make together a few grand classes. We can understand from the continued tendency to divergence of character why the more ancient a form is, the more it generally differs from those now living. Why ancient and extinct forms often tend to fill up gaps between existing forms, sometimes blending two groups, previously classed as distinct into one, but more commonly bringing them only a little closer together. The more ancient a form is, the more often it stands in some degree intermediate between groups now distinct, for the more ancient a form is, the more nearly it will be related to and consequently resemble the common progenitor of groups since become widely divergent. Extinct forms are seldom directly intermediate between existing forms, but are intermediate only by a long and circuitous course through other extinct and different forms. We can clearly see why the organic remains of closely consecutive formations are closely allied, for they are closely linked together by generation. We can clearly see why the remains of an intermediate formation are intermediate in character. The inhabitants of the world at each successive period in its history have beaten their predecessors in the race for life, and are, in so far, higher in the scale, and their structure has generally become more specialized. And this may account for the common belief held by so many paleontologists that organization on the whole has progressed. Extinct and ancient animals resemble, to a certain extent, 
the embryos of the more recent animals belonging to the same classes, and this wonderful fact receives a simple explanation according to our views. The succession of the same types of structure within the same areas during the later geological periods ceases to be mysterious and is intelligible on the principle of inheritance. If then the geological record be as imperfect as many believe, and it may at least be asserted that the record cannot be proved to be much more perfect, the main objections to the theory of natural selection are greatly diminished or disappear. On the other hand, all the chief laws of paleontology plainly proclaim, as it seems to me, that species have been produced by ordinary generation, old forms having been supplanted by new and improved forms of life, the products of variation and the survival of the fittest. End of chapter 11 Part 2 Read by Dennis Sayers, Modesto, California, Winter 2006This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on January 26, 2006. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Sixth London Edition by Charles Darwin. Chapter 12. First Section. Geographical Distribution. Present distribution cannot be accounted for by differences in physical conditions. Importance of Barriers. Affinity of the Productions of the Same Continent. Centers of creation, means of dispersal by changes of climate and the level of the land, and by occasional means, dispersal during the glacial period, alternate glacial periods in the north and south. In considering the distribution of organic beings over the face of the globe, the first great fact which strikes us is that neither the similarity nor the dissimilarity of the inhabitants of various regions can be wholly accounted for by climatal or other physical conditions. Of late, almost every author who has studied the subject has come to this conclusion. The case of America alone would almost suffice to prove its truth, for if we exclude the Arctic and northern temperate parts, all authors agree that one of the most fundamental divisions in geographical distribution is between the new and old worlds. Yet, if we travel over the vast American continent from the central parts of the United States to its extreme southern point, we meet with the most diversified conditions, humid districts, arid deserts, lofty mountains, grassy plains, forests, marshes, lakes, and great rivers under almost every temperature. There is hardly a climate or condition in the old world which cannot be paralleled in the new, at least so closely as the same species generally require. No doubt small areas can be pointed out in the old world hotter than any in the new world, but these are not inhabited by a fauna different from that of the surrounding districts, for it is rare to find a group of organisms confined to a small area in which the conditions are peculiar in only a slight degree. Notwithstanding this general parallelism of the conditions of the old and new worlds, how widely different are their living productions! In the southern hemisphere, if we compare large tracts of land in Australia, South Africa, and western South America between 
latitudes 25 and 35 degrees, we shall find parts extremely similar in all their conditions, yet it would not be possible to point out three faunas and floras more utterly dissimilar. Or again, we may compare the productions of South America, south of latitude 35 degrees, with those north of 25 degrees, which consequently are separated by a space of 10 degrees of latitude, and are exposed to considerably different conditions. Yet they are incomparably more closely related to each other than they are to the productions of Australia or Africa under nearly the same climate. Analogous facts could be given with respect to the inhabitants of the sea. A second great find which strikes us in our general review is that barriers of any kind, or obstacles to free migration, are related in a close and important manner to the differences between productions of various regions. We see this in the great difference in nearly all the terrestrial productions of the old and new worlds, excepting in the northern parts, where the land almost joins, and where, under a slightly different climate, there might have been free migration for the northern temperate forms, as there now is for these strictly arctic productions. We see the same fact in the great difference between the inhabitants of Australia, Africa, and South America under the same latitude, for these countries are almost as isolated from each other as is possible. On each continent, also, we see the same fact, for on the opposite sides of lofty and continuous mountain ranges, and of great deserts, and even of large rivers, we find different productions, though as mountain chains, deserts, etc., are not as impassable, or likely to have endured so long as the oceans separating the continents, the differences are very inferior in degree to those characteristic of distinct continents. Turning to the sea, we find the same law. The marine inhabitants of the eastern and western shores of South America are very distinct, with extremely few shells, crustacea, or echinodermata in common. But Dr. Gunther has recently shown that about 30% of the fishes are the same on the opposite sides of the Isthmus of Panama, and this fact has led naturalists to believe that the Isthmus was formerly open. Westward of the shores of America, a wide space of open ocean extends, with not an island as a halting place for emigrants. Here we have a barrier of another kind, and as soon as this is passed, we meet in the eastern islands of the Pacific with another totally distinct fauna. So that three marine faunas range northward and southward in parallel lines, not far from each other, under corresponding climate, but from being separated from each other by impassable barriers, either of land or open sea, they are almost wholly distinct. On the other hand, proceeding still further westward from the eastern islands of the tropical parts of the Pacific, we enter no impassable barriers, and we have innumerable islands as halting places, or continuous coasts, until, after travelling over a hemisphere, we come to the shores of Africa, and over this vast space we meet with no well-defined and distinct marine faunas. Although so few marine animals are common to the above-named three approximate faunas of eastern and western America and the eastern Pacific Islands, yet many fishes range from the Pacific into the Indian Ocean, and many shells are common to the eastern islands of the Pacific and the eastern shores of Africa on almost exactly opposite meridians of longitude. A third great fact, partly included in the foregoing statement, is the affinity of the productions of the same continent or of the same sea, though the species themselves are distinct at different points and stations. It is a law of the widest generality, and every continent offers innumerable instances. Nevertheless, the naturalist, in travelling, for instance, from north to south, never fails to be struck by the manner in which successive groups of beings, specifically distinct, though nearly related, replace each other. He hears from closely allied yet distinct kinds of birds, 
notes nearly similar, and sees their nests similarly constructed, but not quite alike, with eggs colored in nearly the same manner. The plains near the Straits of Magellan are inhabited by one species of rare American ostrich, and northward the plains of La Plata by another species of the same genus, and not by a true ostrich or emu, like those inhabiting Africa and Australia under the same latitude. On these same plains of La Plata we see the agouti and bizcacha, animals having nearly the same habits as our hares and rabbits, and belonging to the same order of rodents, but they plainly display an American type of structure. We ascend the lofty peaks of the Cordillera, and find an alpine species of bizcacha. We look to the waters, and we do not find the beaver or muskrat, but the koipu and the capybara, rodents of the South American type. Innumerable other instances could be given. If we look to the islands off the American shore, however much they may differ in geological structure, the inhabitants are essentially American, though they may be all peculiar species. We may look back to past ages, as shown in the last chapter, and we find American types then prevailing on the American continent and in the American seas. We see in these facts some deep organic bond throughout space and time, over the same areas of land and water, independently of physical conditions. The naturalist must be dull who is not led to inquire what this bond is. The bond is simply inheritance. That cause which alone, as far as we positively know, produces organisms quite like each other, or, as we see in the case of varieties, nearly alike. The dissimilarity of the inhabitants of different regions may be attributed to modification through variation and natural selection, and probably in a subordinate degree to the definite influence of different physical conditions. The degrees of dissimilarity will depend on the migration of the more dominant forms of life from one region to another, having been more or less effectually prevented at periods more or less remote, on the nature and number of former immigrants, and on the action of the inhabitants on each other in leading to the preservation of different modifications, the relation of organism to organism in the struggle for life being, as I have already often remarked, the most important of all relations. Thus the high importance of barriers comes into play by checking migration, as does time for the slow process of modification through natural selection. Widely ranging species abounding in individuals which have already triumphed over many competitors in their own widely extended homes will now have the best chance of seizing on new places when they spread out into new countries. In their new homes they will be exposed to new conditions, and will frequently undergo further modification and improvement, and thus they will become still further victorious, and will produce groups of modified descendants. On this principle of inheritance, with modification, we can understand how it is that sections of genera, whole genera, and even families are confined to the same areas, as is so commonly and notoriously the case. There is no evidence, as was remarked in the last chapter, of the existence of any law of necessary development. As the variability of each species is an independent property, and will be taken advantage of by natural selection, only so far as it profits each individual in its complex struggle for life, so the amount of modification in different species will be no uniform quantity. If a number of species, after having long competed with each other in their old home, were to migrate in a body to a new and afterwards isolated country, they would be little liable to modification, for neither migration nor isolation in themselves affect anything. These principles come into play only by bringing organisms into new relations with each other, and in a lesser degree with the surrounding physical conditions. 
as we have seen in the last chapter that some forms have retained nearly the same character from an enormously remote geological period, so certain species have migrated over vast spaces, and have not become greatly, or at all, modified. According to these views, it is obvious that several species of the same genus, though inhabiting the most distant quarters of the world, must originally have proceeded from the same source, as they are descended from the same progenitor. In the case of those species which have undergone, during whole geological periods, little modification, there is not much difficulty in believing that they have migrated from the same region, for during the vast geographical and climatical changes which have supervened since ancient times, almost any amount of migration is possible. But in many other cases in which we have reason to believe that the species of a genus have been produced within comparatively recent times, there is great difficulty on this head. It is also obvious that the individuals of the same species, though now inhabiting different and isolated regions, must have proceeded from one spot where their parents were first produced, for, as has been explained, it is incredible that individuals identically the same should have been produced from parents specifically distinct. Single Centers of Supposed Creation we are thus brought to the question which has been largely discussed by naturalists, namely whether species have been created at one or more points on the Earth's surface. Undoubtedly there are many cases of extreme difficulty in understanding how the same species could possibly have migrated from some one point to the several distant and isolated points where now found. Nevertheless, the simplicity of the view that each species was first produced within a single region captivates the mind. He who rejects it rejects the vera causa of ordinary generation with subsequent migration, and calls in the agency of a miracle. It is universally admitted that in most cases the area inhabited by a species is continuous, and that when a plant or animal inhabits two points so distant from each other, or with an interval of such a nature that the space could not have been easily passed over by migration, the fact is given as something remarkable and exceptional. The incapacity of migrating across a wide sea is more clear in the case of terrestrial mammals than perhaps with any other organic beings and accordingly we find no inexplicable instances of the same mammals inhabiting distant points of the world. No geologist feels any difficulty in Great Britain possessing the same quadrupeds with the rest of Europe, for they were no doubt once united. But if the same species can be produced at two separate points, why do we not find a single mammal common to Europe and Australia or South America? The conditions of life are nearly the same, so that a multitude of European animals and plants have become naturalized in America and Australia, and some of the aboriginal plants are identically the same at these different points on the northern and southern hemispheres. The answer, as I believe, is that mammals have not been able to migrate, whereas some plants, from their varied means of dispersal, have migrated across the wide and broken interspaces. The great and striking influence of barriers of all kinds is intelligible only on the view that the great majority of species have been produced on one side, and have not been able to migrate to the opposite side. Some few families, many subfamilies, very many genera, and still greater numbers of sections of genera are confined to a single region, and it has been observed by several naturalists that the most natural genera, or those genera in which the species are most closely related to each other, are generally confined to the same country, or if they have a wide range, that their range is continuous. What a strange anomaly it would be if a directly opposite rule were to prevail, when we were to go down one step lower in the series, namely to the individuals of that same species, and these had not been, at least at first, confined to some one region. 
Hence it seems to me, as it has to many other naturalists, that the view of each species having been produced in one area alone, and having subsequently migrated from that area as far as its powers of migration and subsistence under past and present conditions permitted, it is most probable. Undoubtedly, many cases occur in which we cannot explain how the same species could have passed from one point to the other. But the geographical and climatical changes, which have certainly occurred within recent geological times, must have rendered discontinuous the formerly continuous range of many species, so that we are reduced to consider whether the exceptions to continuity of range are so numerous and of so grave a nature that we ought to give up the belief, rendered probable by general considerations, that each species has been produced within one area, and has migrated thence as far as it could. It would be hopelessly tedious to discuss all the exceptional cases of the same species, now living at distant and separated points, nor do I for a moment pretend that any explanation could be offered of many instances. But, after some preliminary remarks, I will discuss a few of the most striking classes of facts, namely the existence of the same species on the summits of distant mountain ranges, and at distant points in the Arctic and Antarctic regions, and secondly, in the following chapter, the wide distribution of fresh water productions, and thirdly, the occurrence of the same terrestrial species on islands and on the nearest mainland, though separated by hundreds of miles of open sea. If the existence of the same species at distant and isolated points of the earth's surface can in many instances be explained on the view of each species having migrated from a single birthplace, then, considering our ignorance with respect to former climatical and geographical changes, and to the various occasional means of transport, the belief that a single birthplace is the law seems to me incomparably the safest. In discussing this subject, we shall be enabled at the same time to consider a point equally important for us, namely, whether the several species of a genus, which must on our theory all be descended from a common progenitor, can have migrated, undergoing modification during their migration from some one area. If, when most of the species inhabiting one region are different from those in another region, though closely allied to them, it can be shown that migration from one region to the other has probably occurred at some former period. Our general view will be much strengthened, for the explanation is obvious on the principle of descent with modification. A volcanic island, for instance, upheaved and formed at the distance of a few hundreds of miles from a continent, probably would receive from it in the course of time a few colonists, and their descendants, though modified, would still be related by inheritance to the inhabitants of that continent. Cases of this nature are common, and are, as we shall hereafter see, inexplicable on the theory of independent creation. This view of the relation of the species of one region to those of another does not differ much from that advanced by Mr. Wallace, who concludes that every species has come into existence coincident both in space and time with a pre-existing closely allied species. And it is now well known that he attributes this coincidence to descent with modification. The question of single and multiple centers of creation differs from another though allied question, namely whether all the individuals of the same species are descended from a single pair, or single hermaphrodite, or whether, as some authors suppose, from many individuals simultaneously created. With organic beings, which never intercross, if such exist, such species must be descended from a succession of modified varieties that have supplanted each other, but have never blended with other individuals or varieties of the same species, so that at each successive stage of modification all the individuals of the same form will be descended from a single parent. 
but in the great majority of cases, namely with all organisms which habitually unite for each birth, or which occasionally intercross, the individuals of the same species inhabiting the same area will be kept nearly uniform by intercrossing, so that many individuals will go on simultaneously changing, and the whole amount of modification at each stage will not be due to descent from a single parent. To illustrate what I mean, our English racehorses differ from the horses of every other breed, but they do not owe their difference and superiority to descent from any single pair, but to continued care in the selecting and training of many individuals during each generation. Before discussing the three classes of facts, for which I have selected as presenting the greatest amount of difficulty on the theory of single centers of creation, I must say a few words on the means of dispersal. Means of Dispersal Sir C. Lyell and other authors have ably treated this subject. I can give here only the briefest abstract of the more important facts. Change of climate must have had a powerful influence on migration. A region now impassable to certain organisms from the nature of its climate might have been a high road for migration when the climate was different. I shall, however, presently have to discuss this branch of the subject in some detail. Changes of level in the land must also have been highly influential. A narrow isthmus now separates two marine faunas. Submerge it, or let it formerly have been submerged, and the two faunas will now blend together, or may formerly have blended. Where the sea now extends, land may at a former period have connected islands, or possibly even continents, together, and thus have allowed terrestrial productions to pass from one to another. No geologist disputes that great mutations of level have occurred within the period of existing organisms. Edward Forbes insisted that all the islands in the Atlantic must have been recently connected with Europe or Africa, and Europe likewise with America. Other authors have thus hypothetically bridged over every ocean, and united almost every island with some mainland. If indeed the arguments used by Forbes are to be trusted, it must be admitted that scarcely a single island exists which has not recently been united to some continent. This view cuts the Gordian knot of the dispersal of the same species to the most distant points, and removes many a difficulty. But, to the best of my judgment, we are not authorized in admitting such enormous geographical changes within the period of existing species. It seems to me that we have abundant evidence of great oscillations of the level of land or sea but not of such vast changes in the position and extension of our continents as to have united them within the recent period to each other, and to the several intervening oceanic islands. I freely admit that the former existence of many islands now buried beneath the sea, which may have served as halting places for plants and for many animals during their migration, in the coral-producing oceans, such sunken islands are now marked by rings of coral or atolls standing over them. Whenever it is fully admitted, as it will some day be, that each species has proceeded from a single birthplace, and when in the course of time we know something definite about the means of distribution, we shall be enabled to speculate with security on the former extension of the land but I do not believe that it will ever be proved that, within the recent period, most of our continents, which now stand quite separate, have been continuously, or almost continuously, united with each other, and with the many existing oceanic islands. Several facts in distribution, such as the great difference in the marine faunas on the opposite sides of almost every continent, the close relation with the tertiary inhabitants of several lands and even seas to their present inhabitants, the degree of affinity between the mammals inhabiting islands with those of the nearest continent, being in part determined, as we shall hereafter see, by the depth of the intervening ocean, 
these and other such facts are opposed to the admission of such prodigious geographical revolutions within the recent period, as are necessary on the view advanced by Forbes, and admitted by his followers. The nature and relative proportions of the inhabitants of oceanic islands are likewise opposed to the belief of their former continuity of continents. Nor does the almost universally volcanic composition of such islands favor the admission that they were the wrecks of sunken continents. If they had originally existed as continental mountain ranges, some at least of the islands would have been formed, like other mountain summits, of granite, metamorphic schists, old fossiliferous, and other rocks, instead of consisting of mere piles of volcanic matter. I must now say a few words on what are called accidental means, but which more properly should be called occasional means of distribution. I shall here confine myself to plants. In botanical works this or that plant is often stated to be ill-adapted for wide dissemination, but the greater or less facilities for transport across the sea may be said to be almost wholly unknown. Until I tried, with Mr. Berkeley's aid, a few experiments, it was not even known how far seeds could resist the injurious action of seawater. To my surprise, I found out that of the eighty-seven kinds, sixty-four germinated after an immersion of twenty-eight days, and a few survived an immersion of one hundred thirty-seven days. It deserves notice that certain orders were far more injured than others. Nine leguminosae were tried, and, with one exception, they resisted the salt water badly. Seven species of the allied orders Hydrocephalae and Polymyceae were all killed by a month's immersion. For convenience sake I chiefly tried small seeds without the capsules or fruit, and as all of these sank in a few days, they could not have floated across wide spaces of the sea, whether or not they were injured by salt water. Afterwards I tried some larger fruits, capsules, etc., and some of these floated for a long time. It is well known what a difference there is in the buoyancy of green and seasoned timber, and it occurred to me that floods would often wash into the sea dried plants or branches with seed capsules or fruit attached to them. Hence I was led to dry the stems and branches of ninety-four plants with ripe fruit, and to place them on seawater. The majority sank quickly, but some which, whilst green, floated for a very short time, when dried, floated much longer. For instance, ripe hazelnuts sank immediately, but when dried they floated for ninety days, and afterwards, when planted, germinated. An asparagus plant with ripe berries floated for twenty-three days. When dried, it floated for eighty-five days, and the seeds afterwards germinated. The ripe seeds of Heliosodum sank in two days. When they dried, they floated for above ninety days, and afterwards germinated. Altogether, out of ninety-four dried plants, eighteen floated for above twenty-eight days, and some of the eighteen floated for a very much longer period so that as sixty-four of eighty-seven kinds of seeds germinated after an immersion of twenty-eight days, and as eighteen of ninety-four distinct species with ripe fruit, but not all the same species as in the foregoing experiment, floated after being dried for above twenty-eight days, we may conclude that as far as anything can be inferred from these scanty facts, that the seeds of fourteen of one hundred kinds of plants of any country might be floated by sea currents during twenty-eight days, and would retain their power of germination. In Johnson's physical atlas, the average rate of these several Atlantic currents is thirty-three miles per diem, some currents running at the rate of sixty miles per diem. On this average, the seeds of fourteen of one hundred plants belonging to one country might be floated across nine hundred twenty-four miles of sea to another country, and, when stranded, if blown inland by a gale to a favorable spot, would germinate. Subsequently to my experiments, M. Martins tried similar ones, but in a much better manner, for he placed the seeds in a box in the actual sea 
so they were alternately wet and exposed to the air like really floating plants. He tried ninety-eight seeds, mostly different from mine, but he chose many large fruits, and likewise seeds, from plants which live near the sea, and this would have favored both the average length of their flotation and their resistance to the injurious action of the salt water. On the other hand, he did not previously dry the plants or branches with the fruit, and this, as we have seen, could have caused some of them to have floated much longer. The result was that eighteen of ninety-eight of his seeds of different kinds floated for forty-two days, and were then capable of germination. But I do not doubt that plants exposed to the waves would float for a less time than those protected from violent movement, as in our experiments. Therefore it would perhaps be safer to assume that the seeds of about ten of one hundred plants of a flora, after having been dried, could be floated across a space of sea nine hundred miles in width, and would then germinate. The fact of the larger fruits often floating longer than the small is interesting, as plants with large seeds or fruit, which as Alphonse de Candolle has shown, generally have restricted ranges, could hardly be transported by any other means. Seeds may be occasionally transported in another manner. Drift timber is thrown up on most islands, even on those in the midst of the widest oceans, and the natives of the coral islands in the Pacific procure stones for their tools solely from the roots of drifted trees, these stones being a valuable royal tax. I find that when irregularly shaped stones are embedded in the roots of trees, small parcels of earth are very frequently enclosed in their interstices behind them, so perfectly that not a particle could be washed away during the longest transport. Out of one small portion of earth, thus completely enclosed by the roots of an oak about fifty years old, three dicotyledonous plants germinated. I am certain of the accuracy of this observation. Again, I can show that the carcasses of birds, when floating on the sea, sometimes escape being immediately devoured, and many kinds of seeds in the crops of floating birds long retain their vitality. Peas and vetches, for instance, are killed by even a few days' immersion in sea water but some, taken out of the crop of the pigeon, which has floated on artificial sea-water for thirty days, to my surprise nearly all germinated. Living birds can hardly fail to be a highly effective agent in the transportation of seeds. I could give many facts, showing how frequently birds of many kinds are blown by gales to vast distances across the ocean. We may safely assume that under such circumstances their rate of flight would often be thirty-five miles an hour, and some authors have given a far higher estimate. I have never seen an instance of nutritious seeds passing through the intestines of a bird, but hard seeds of a fruit pass uninjured through even the digestive organs of a turkey. In the course of two months I picked up in my garden twelve kinds of seeds, out of the excrement of small birds, and these seemed perfect, and some of them, which were tried, germinated. But the following fact is more important. The crops of birds do not secrete gastric juices, and do not, as I know by trial, injure in the least the germination of seeds. Now, after a bird has found and devoured a large supply of food, it is positively asserted that all the grains do not pass into the gizzard for twelve or even eighteen hours. A bird in this interval of flight might easily be blown to the distance of five hundred miles, and hawks are known to look out for tired birds, and the contents of their torn crops might thus readily get scattered. Some hawks and owls bolt their prey whole, and after an interval of from twelve to twenty hours disgorge pellets, which, as I know from experiments made in the zoological gardens, include seeds capable of germination. Some seeds of the oat, wheat, millet, canary, hemp, clover, and beet germinated after having been from 
twelve to twenty-one hours in the stomachs of different birds of prey, and two seeds of meat grew after having been thus retained for two days and fourteen hours. Freshwater fish, I find, eat seeds of many land and water plants. Fish are frequently devoured by birds, and thus the seeds might be transported from place to place. I force many kinds of seeds into the stomachs of dead fish, and then gave their bodies to fishing eagles, storks, and pelicans. These birds, after an interval of many hours, either rejected the seeds in pellets, or passed them in their excrement, and several of these seeds retained the power of germination. Certain seeds, however, were nearly always killed by this process. Locusts are sometimes blown great distances from land. I myself caught one 370 miles from the coast of Africa, and have heard of others caught at greater distances. The Rev. R. T. Lowe informed Sir C. Lyell that in November of 1844 swarms of locusts visited the island of Madeira. They were in countless numbers, as thick as flakes of snow in the heaviest snowstorm, and extended upward as far as could be seen with a telescope. During two or three days they slowly careered round and round in an immense ellipse, at least five or six miles in diameter, and at night alighted on the taller trees, which were completely coated with them. They then disappeared over the sea as suddenly as they had appeared, and have not since visited the island. Now, in parts of Natal it is believed by some farmers, though on insufficient evidence, that injurious seeds are introduced into their grassland in the dung left by the great flights of locusts which often visited that country. In consequence of this belief, Mr. Wheel sent me in a letter a small packet of the dried pellets, out of which I extracted under the microscope several seeds, and raised from them seven grass plants belonging to two species of two genera. Hence a swarm of locusts, such as that which visited Madeira, might readily be the means of introducing several kinds of plants to an island lying far from the mainland. Although the beaks and feet of birds are generally clean, earth sometimes adheres to them. In one case I removed sixty-one grains, in another case twenty-two grains of dry agrilaceous earth from the foot of a partridge, and in the earth there was a pebble as large as the seed of a vetch. Here is a better case. The leg of a woodcock was sent to me by a friend, with a little cake of dry earth attached to the shank, weighing only nine grains, and this contained a seed of the toad-rush, Juncus buffonius, which germinated and flowered. Mr. Swaysland of Brighton, who during the last forty years has paid close attention to our migratory birds, informs me that he has often shot wagtails, mozziliae, wheat ears, and windchats, saxicole, on their first arrival on our shores, before they had alighted, and has several times noticed little cakes of earth attached to their feet. Many facts could be given showing how generally soil is charged with seeds. For instance, Professor Newton sent me the leg of a red-legged partridge, Cacabas rufa, which had been wounded and could not fly, with a ball of hard earth adhering to it and weighing six and a half ounces. The earth had been kept for three years, but, when broken, watered, and placed under a bell-glass, no less than eighty-two plants sprung from it. These consisted of twelve monocotyledons, including the common oat, and at least one kind of grass, and of seventy dicotyledons, which consisted, judging from the young leaves, of at least three distinct species. With such facts before us, can we doubt that the many birds which are annually blown by gales across great spaces of ocean, and which annually migrate, for instance, the millions of quails across the Mediterranean, must occasionally transport a few seeds embedded in dirt adhering to their feet or beaks? But I shall have to recur to this subject. 
As icebergs are known to be sometimes loaded with dirt and stones, and have even carried brushwood, bones, and the nest of a land bird, it can hardly be doubted that they must occasionally, as suggested by Lyell, have transported seeds from one part to another of the Arctic and Antarctic regions, and during the glacial period from one part of the now temperate regions to another. In the Azores, from the large number of plants common to Europe, in comparison with the species of the other islands of the Atlantic, which stand nearer to the mainland, and, as remarked by Mr. H. C. Watson, from their somewhat northern character in comparison with the latitude, I suspected that these islands had been partly stocked by ice-borne seeds during the glacial epoch. At my request, Sir C. Lyell wrote to Monsieur Hartung, to inquire whether he had observed erratic boulders on these islands, and he answered that he had found large fragments of granite and other rocks which do not occur in the archipelago. Hence we may safely infer that the icebergs formerly landed their rocky burdens on the shores of these mid-ocean islands, and it is at least possible that they may have brought thither the seeds of northern plants. Considering that these several means of transport, and that other means which without doubt remain to be discovered, have been in action year after year for tens of thousands of years, it would, I think, be a marvellous fact if many plants had not thus been widely dispersed. These means of transport are sometimes called accidental, but this is not strictly correct. The currents of the sea are not accidental, nor is the direction of prevalent gales of wind. It should be observed that scarcely any means of transport would carry seeds for very great distances, for seeds do not retain their vitality when exposed for a great length of time to the action of sea water, nor could they be long carried in the crops or intestines of birds. These means, however, would suffice for occasional transport across tracts of sea some hundreds of miles in breadth, or from island to island, or from a continent to a neighboring island, but not from one distant continent to another. The floras of distant continents would not by such means become mingled, but would remain as distinct as they now are. The currents, from their course, would never bring seeds from North America to Britain, although they might and do bring seeds from the West Indies to our western shores, where, if not killed by their very long immersion in salt water, they could not endure our climate. Almost every year one or two land birds are blown across the whole Atlantic Ocean, from North America to the western shores of Ireland and England but seeds could be transported by these rare wanderers only by one means, namely, by dirt adhering to their feet or beaks, which is in itself a rare accident. Even in this case, how small would be the chance of a seed falling on favorable soil and coming to maturity? But it would be a great error to argue that, because a well-stocked island like Great Britain has not, as far as is known, and it would be very difficult to prove this, received within the last few centuries through occasional means of transport immigrants from Europe or any other continent, that a poorly stocked island, though standing more remote from the mainland, would not receive colonists by similar means. Out of a hundred kinds of seeds or animals transported to an island, even if far less well stocked than Britain, Perhaps not more than one would be so well fitted to its new home as to become naturalized. But this is no valid argument against what would be effected by occasional means of transport during a long lapse of geologic time, whilst the island was being upheaved, and before it had become fully stocked with inhabitants. On almost bare land, with few or no destructive insects or birds living there, nearly every seed which chanced to arrive, if fitted for the climate, would germinate and survive. So ends the first section of Chapter 12 of The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin.
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on January 26, 2006. The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Sixth London Edition by Charles Darwin. Chapter 12. Second Section. Dispersal During the Glacial Period. The identity of many plants and animals on mountain summits, separated from each other by hundreds of miles of lowlands, where alpine species could not possibly exist, is one of the most striking cases known of the same species living at different points without the apparent possibility of their having migrated from one point to another. It is indeed a remarkable fact to see so many plants of the same species living on the snowy regions of the Alps or Pyrenees, and in the extreme northern parts of Europe. But it is far more remarkable that the plants on the White Mountains in the United States of America are all the same with those of Labrador, and nearly all the same, as we hear from Asa Gray, with those on the loftiest mountains in Europe. Even as long ago as 1747, such facts led Gamelin to conclude that the same species must have been independently created at many distinct points, and we might have remained in this same belief had not Agassiz and others called vivid attention to the glacial period, which, as we shall immediately see, affords a simple explanation of these facts. We have evidence of almost every conceivable kind, organic and inorganic, that within a very recent geological period, Central Europe and North America suffered under an Arctic climate. The ruins of a house burnt by fire do not tell their tale more plainly than do the mountains of Scotland and Wales, with their scoured flanks, polished surfaces, and perched boulders, of the many icy streams with which their valleys were lately filled. So greatly has the climate of Europe changed that in northern Italy gigantic moraines left by old glaciers are now clothed by the vine and maize. Throughout a large part of the United States, erratic boulders and scored rocks plainly reveal a former cold period. The former influence of the glacial climate on the distribution of the inhabitants of Europe, as explained by Edward Forbes, is substantially as follows. But we shall follow the changes more readily by supposing a new glacial period slowly to come on, and then pass away as formerly occurred. As the cold came on, and as each more southern zone became fitted for the inhabitants of the north, these would take the places of the former inhabitants of the temperate regions. The latter, at the same time, would travel further and further southward, unless they were stopped by barriers, in which case they would perish. The mountains would become covered with snow and ice, and their former alpine inhabitants would descend to the plains. By the time that the cold had reached its maximum, we should have an arctic flora and fauna covering the central parts of Europe, as far south as the Alps and the Pyrenees, and even stretching into Spain. The now temperate regions of the United States would likewise be covered by arctic plants and animals and these would be nearly the same as those of Europe, for the present circumpolar inhabitants, which we suppose to have travelled everywhere southward, are remarkably uniform throughout the world. As the warmth returned, the Arctic forms would retreat northward, closely followed up in their retreat by the productions of the more temperate regions, and as the snow melted from the bases of the mountains, the arctic forms would seize on the cleared and thawed ground, always ascending, as the warmth increased and the snow still further disappeared, higher and higher, whilst their brethren were pursuing their northern journey. Hence, when the warmth had fully returned, the same species which had lately lived together on the European and North American lowlands, would again be found in the arctic regions of the old and new worlds, and on many isolated mountain summits far distant from each other. 
Thus we can understand the identity of many plants at points so immensely remote as the mountains of the United States and those of Europe. We can thus also understand the fact that the alpine plants of each mountain range are more especially related to the arctic forms living due north or nearly due north of them. For the first migration, when the cold came on, and the re-migration on the returning warmth, would generally have been due south and north. The alpine plants, for example, of Scotland, as remarked by Mr. H. C. Watson, and those of the Pyrenees, as remarked by Ramond, are more especially allied to the plants of northern Scandinavia, those of the United States to Labrador, those of the mountains of Siberia to the Arctic regions of that country. These views, grounded as they are on the perfectly well-ascertained occurrence of a former glacial period, seem to me to explain in so satisfactory a manner the present distribution of the alpine and arctic productions of Europe and America, that when in other regions we find the same species on distant mountain summits, we may almost conclude without other evidence that a colder climate formerly permitted their migration across the intervening lowlands, now become too warm for their existence. As the arctic forms moved first southward and afterwards backward to the north in unison with the changing climate, they will not have been exposed during their long migrations to any great diversity of temperature, and as they all migrated in a body together their mutual relations will not have been much disturbed. Hence, in accordance with the principles inculcated in this volume, these forms will not have been liable to much modification, but with the alpine productions left isolated from the moment of returning warmth, first at the bases and ultimately on the summits of the mountains, the case will have been somewhat different, for it is not likely that all the same arctic species will have been left on mountain ranges far distant from one another and have survived there ever since. They will also, in all probability, have become mingled with ancient alpine species, which must have existed on the mountains before the commencement of the glacial epoch, and which, during the coldest period, will have been temporarily driven down to the plains. They will also have been subsequently exposed to somewhat different climatical influences. Their mutual relations will have been in some degree disturbed, consequently they will have been liable to modification, and they have been modified. For if we compare the present alpine plants and animals of the several great European mountain ranges with one another, though many of the species remain identically the same, some exist as varieties, some as doubtful forms or subspecies, and some as distinct yet closely allied species, representing each other on several ranges. In the foregoing illustration I have assumed that at the commencement of the imaginary glacial period, the Arctic productions were as uniform round the polar regions as they are at the present day. But it is also necessary to assume that many sub-Arctic and some few temperate forms were the same round the world. For some of the species which now exist on the lower mountain slopes and on the plains of North America and Europe are the same. And it may be asked how I account for this degree of uniformity of the sub-Arctic and temperate forms around the world at the commencement of the real glacial period. At the present day, the sub-Arctic and northern temperate productions of the Old and New Worlds are separated from each other by the whole Atlantic Ocean and by the northern part of the Pacific. During the glacial period, when the inhabitants of the Old and New Worlds lived further southward than they do at the present, they must have been still more completely separated from each other by wider spaces of ocean so that it may well be asked how the same species could then, or previously, have entered the two continents. The explanation, I believe, lies in the nature of the climate before the commencement of the glacial period. At this, the newer Pliocene period, the majority of the inhabitants of the world were specifically the same as now, and we have good reason to believe that the organisms which now live under latitude 60 degrees lived during the Pliocene period further north, under the polar circle, in latitude 66 to 67 degrees. 
and that the present Arctic productions then lived on the broken land still nearer to the pole. Now if we look at a terrestrial globe, we see under the polar circle that there is almost continuous land from western Europe through Siberia to eastern North America, and this continuity of the circumpolar land, with the consequent freedom under a more favorable climate for intermigration, will account for the supposed uniformity of the subarctic and temperate productions of the old and new worlds, at a period anterior to the glacial epoch. Believing, from reasons before alluded to, that our continents have long remained in nearly the same relative position, though subjected to great oscillations of level, I am strongly inclined to extend the above view, and to infer that during some earlier and still warmer period, such as the older Pliocene period, a large number of the same plants and animals inhabited the almost continuous circumpolar land, and that these plants and animals, both in the old and new worlds, began slowly to migrate southwards as the climate became less warm, long before the commencement of the glacial period. We now see, as I believe, their descendants, mostly in a modified condition, in the central parts of Europe and the United States. On this view we can understand the relationship with very little identity between the productions of North America and Europe, a relationship which is highly remarkable considering the distance of the two areas and their separation by the whole Atlantic Ocean. We can further understand the singular fact remarked on by several observers that the productions of Europe and America during the later tertiary stages were more closely related to each other than they are at the present time, for during these warmer periods the northern parts of the old and new worlds will have been almost continuously united by land, serving as a bridge, since rendered impassable by cold for the intermigration of their inhabitants. During the slowly decreasing warmth of the Pliocene period, as soon as the species in common, which inhabited the old and new worlds, migrated south of the polar circle, they will have been completely cut off from each other. This separation, as far as the more temperate productions are concerned, must have taken place long ages ago, as the plants and animals migrated southward. They will have become mingled in the one great region with the Native American productions, and would have had to compete with them, and in the other great region with those of the Old World. Consequently, we have here everything favorable for much modification for far more modification than with the alpine productions. Left isolated, within a much more recent period, on the several mountain ranges and on the arctic lands of Europe and North America. Hence it has come that when we compare the now living productions of the temperate regions of the new and old worlds, we find very few identical species, though Asa Gray has lately shown that more plants are identical than was formerly supposed but we find in every great class many forms, which some naturalists rank as geographical races, and others as distinct species, and a host of closely allied or representative forms, which are ranked by all naturalists as specifically distinct. As on the land, so in the waters of the sea, a slow southern migration of a marine fauna, which, through the Pliocene, or even a somewhat earlier period, was nearly uniform along the continuous shores of the polar circle, will account, on the theory of modification, for many closely allied forms now living in marine areas completely sundered. Thus, I think, we can understand the presence of some closely allied, still existing, and extinct tertiary forms on the eastern and western shores of temperate North America, and the still more striking fact of many closely allied crustaceans, as described in Dana's admirable work, some fishes and other marine animals inhabiting the Mediterranean and the seas of Japan, these two areas being now completely separated by the breadth of a whole continent and by wide expanses of ocean. These cases of close relationship in species either now or formerly inhabiting the seas of the western and eastern shores of North America, the Mediterranean and Japan, and the temperate lands of North America and Europe, 
are inexplicable on the theory of creation. We cannot maintain that such species have been created alike, in correspondence with the nearly similar physical conditions of the areas, for if we compare, for instance, certain parts of South America with parts of South Africa or Australia, we see conditions closely similar in all their physical conditions, yet their inhabitants utterly dissimilar. Alternate Glacial Periods in the North and South But we must return to our more immediate subject. I am convinced that Forbes' view may be largely extended. In Europe we meet with the plainest evidence of the glacial period, from the western shores of Britain to the Ural Range and southward to the Pyrenees. We may infer from the frozen mammals and nature of the mountain vegetation that Siberia was similarly affected. In the Lebanon, according to Dr. Hooker, perpetual snow formerly covered the central axis and fed glaciers which rolled four hundred feet down the valleys. The same observer has recently found great moraines at a low level of the Atlas Range in North Africa. Along the Himalaya, at points nine hundred miles apart, glaciers have left their marks of the former low descent. And in Sikkim, Dr. Hooker saw maize growing on ancient and gigantic moraines. Southward of the Asiatic continent, on the opposite side of the equator, we know from the excellent researches of Dr. J. Haast and Dr. Hector that in New Zealand immense glaciers formerly descended to a low level, and the same plants, found by Dr. Hooker on widely separated mountains in this island, tell the same story of a former cold period. From the facts communicated to me by the Rev. W. B. Clark, it appears also that there are traces of former glacial action on the mountains of the southeastern corner of Australia. Looking to America, in the northern half, ice-borne fragments of rock have been observed on the eastern side of the continent, as far south as latitude 36 and 37 degrees, and on the shores of the Pacific, where the climate is now so different, as far south as latitude 46 degrees. Erratic boulders have also been noticed on the Rocky Mountains. In the Cordillera of South America, nearly under the equator, glaciers once extended far below their present level. In central Chile I have examined a great mound of detritus with vast boulders crossing the Portillo Valley, which there can hardly be a doubt once formed a huge moraine and Mr. D. Forbes informs me that he has found in various parts of the Cordillera, from latitude 13 through 30 degrees south, at about the height of 12,000 feet, deeply furrowed rocks, resembling those with which he was familiar in Norway, and likewise great masses of detritus, including grooved pebbles. Along this whole space of the Cordillera, true glaciers do not now exist, even at much more considerable heights. Further south, on both sides of the continent, from latitude 41 degrees to the southernmost extremity, we have the clearest evidence of formal glacier action in numerous immense boulders transported far from their parent source. From these several facts, namely from the glacial action having extended all around the northern and southern hemispheres, from the period having been, in a geological sense, recent in both hemispheres, from its having lasted in both during a great length of time, as may be inferred from the amount of work affected, and lastly from glaciers having recently descended to a low level along the whole line of the Cordillera. It at one time appeared to me that we could not avoid the conclusion that the temperature of the whole world had been simultaneously lowered during the glacial period. But now Mr. Kroll, in a series of admirable memoirs, has attempted to show that a glacial condition of climate is the result of various physical causes, brought into operation by an increase in the eccentricity of the Earth's orbit. All of these causes tend toward the same end, but the most powerful appears to be the indirect influence of the eccentricity of the orbit upon oceanic currents. 
According to Mr. Kroll, cold periods regularly recur every ten to fifteen thousand years, and these at long intervals are extremely severe, owing to certain contingencies, of which the most important, as Sir C. Lyell has shown, is the relative position of the land and water. Mr. Kroll believes that the last great glacial period occurred about 240,000 years ago, and endured, with slight alterations of climate, for about 160,000 years. With respect to more ancient glacial periods, several geologists are convinced from direct evidence that such occurred during the Miocene and Eocene formations, not to mention still more ancient formations. But the most important result for us arrived at by Mr. Cole is that whenever the northern hemisphere passes through a cold period, the temperature of the southern hemisphere is actually raised, with the winters rendered much milder, chiefly through changes in the direction of the ocean currents. So conversely it will be with the northern hemisphere, while the southern passes through a glacial period. This conclusion throws so much light on geographical distribution that I am strongly inclined to trust in it, but I will first give the facts which demand explanation. In South America, Dr. Hooker has shown that besides many closely allied species, between forty and fifty of the flowering plants of Tierra del Fuego, forming no inconsiderable part of its scanty flora, are common to North America and Europe, enormously remote, as these areas in opposite hemispheres are from each other. On the lofty mountains of equatorial America, a host of peculiar species belonging to European genera occur. On the Oregon mountains of Brazil, some few temperate European, some Antarctic, and some Andean genera were found by Gardner, which do not exist in the low intervening hot countries. On the Scylla of Caracas, the illustrious Humboldt long ago found species belonging to the genera characteristic of the Cordillera. In Africa, several forms characteristic of Europe, and some few representatives of the flora of the Cape of Good Hope, occur on the mountains of Abyssinia. At the Cape of Good Hope, a very few European species believed not to have been introduced by man, and on the mountains several representative European forms are found which have not been discovered in the intertropical parts of Africa. Dr. Hooker has also lately shown that several of the plants, living in the upper parts of the lofty island of Fernando Po, and on the neighboring Cameroon Mountains in the Gulf of Guinea, are closely related to those on the mountains of Abyssinia, and likewise to those of temperate Europe. It also now appears, as I hear from Dr. Hooker, that some of these same temperate plants have been discovered by the Rev. R. T. Lowe on the mountains of the Cape Verde Islands. This extension of the same temperate forms, almost under the equator, across the whole continent of Africa and to the mountains of the Cape Verde archipelago, is one of the most astonishing facts ever recorded in the distribution of plants. On the Himalaya, and on the certain isolated mountain ranges of the peninsula of India, on the heights of Ceylon, and on the volcanic cones of Java, many plants occur either identically the same, or representing each other, and at the same time representing plants of Europe not found in the intervening hot lowlands. A list of the genera of plants collected on the loftier peaks of Java raises a picture of a collection made on a hillock in Europe. Still more striking is the fact that peculiar Australian forms are represented by certain plants growing on the summits of the mountains of Borneo. Some of these Australian forms, as I hear from Dr. Hooker, extend along the heights of the peninsula of Malacca, and are thinly scattered on the one hand over India, and on the other hand as far north as Japan. On the southern mountains of Australia, Dr. F. Muller has discovered several European species, other species not introduced by man, occur on the lowlands, and a long list can be given, as I am informed by Dr. Hooker, of European genera found in Australia, but not in the intermediate torrid regions. In the admirable 
Introduction to the Flora of New Zealand by Dr. Hooker, analogous and striking facts are given in regards to the plants of that large island. Hence we see that certain plants growing on the temperate plains of the north and south are either the same species or varieties of the same species. It should, however, be observed that these plants are not strictly arctic forms, for, as Mr. H. C. Watson has remarked, in receding from polar toward equatorial latitudes, the alpine or mountain flora really become less and less arctic. Besides these identical and closely allied forms, many species inhabiting the same widely sundered areas, belonging to genera not found in the intermediate tropical lowlands. These brief remarks apply to plants alone, but some few analogous facts could still be given in regards to terrestrial animals. In marine productions, similar cases likewise occur. As an example, I may quote a statement by that highest authority, Professor Dana, that it is certainly a wonderful fact that New Zealand should have a closer resemblance in its crustacea to Great Britain, its antipode, than to any other part of the world. Sir J. Richardson also speaks of the reappearance on the shores of New Zealand, Tasmania, etc., of northern forms of fish. Dr. Hooker informs me that twenty-five species of algae are common to New Zealand and to Europe, but they have not been found in the intermediate tropical seas. From the foregoing facts, namely the presence of temperate forms on the highlands across the whole of equatorial Africa, and along the peninsula of India to Ceylon and the Malay archipelago, and in less well-marked manners across the wide expanse of tropical South America, it appears almost certain at some former period, no doubt during the most severe part of a glacial period, that the lowlands of these great continents were everywhere tenanted under the equator by a considerable number of temperate forms. At this period, the equatorial climate at that level of the sea was probably about the same with what is now experienced at a height of from five to six thousand feet under the same latitude, or perhaps even rather cooler. During this, the coldest period, the lowlands under the equator must have been clothed with a mingled tropical and temperate vegetation, like that described by Hooker as growing luxuriantly at the height of from four to five thousand feet on the lower slopes of the Himalaya, but with perhaps a still greater preponderance of temperate forms. So again, in the mountainous island of Fernando Po, in the Gulf of Guinea, Mr. Mann found temperate European forms beginning to appear at the height of about 5,000 feet. On the mountains of Panama, at the height of only 2,000 feet, Dr. Seaman found the vegetation like that of Mexico, with forms of the torrid zone harmoniously blended with those of the temperate. Now, let us see whether Mr. Cole's conclusion that the northern hemisphere suffered from the extreme cold of the great glacial period, the southern hemisphere was actually warmer, throws any clear light on the present apparently inexplicable distribution of various organisms in the temperate parts of both hemispheres, and on the mountains of the tropics. The glacial period, as measured by years, must have been very long and when we remember over what vast spaces some naturalized plants and animals have spread within a few centuries, this period will have been ample for any amount of migration. As the cold became more and more intense, we know that arctic forms invaded the temperate regions, and, from the facts just given, there can hardly be a doubt that some of the more vigorous, dominant, and widest spreading temperate forms invaded the equatorial lowlands. The inhabitants of these hot lowlands would have at the same time migrated to the tropical and subtropical regions of the south, for the southern hemisphere was at this period warmer. On the decline of the glacial period, as both hemispheres gradually recovered their former temperature, the northern temperate forms living on the lowlands under the equator would have been driven from their former homes, or have been destroyed. 
being replaced by the equatorial forms returning from the south. Some, however, of the northern temperate forms would almost certainly have ascended any adjoining high land where, if sufficiently lofty, they would have long survived, like the arctic forms on the mountains of Europe. They might have survived even if the climate were not perfectly fitted for them, for the change of temperature must have been very slow, and plants undoubtedly possess a certain capacity for acclimatization, as shown by their transmitting to their offspring different constitutional powers of resisting heat and cold. In the regular course of events, the southern hemisphere would in its turn be subjected to a severe glacial period, with the northern hemisphere rendered warmer, and then the southern temperate forms would invade the equatorial lowlands. The northern forms, which had before been left on the mountains, would now descend and mingle with the southern forms. The latter, when the warmth returned, would return to their former homes, leaving some few species on the mountains, and carrying southward with them some of the northern temperate forms, which had descended from their mountain fastness. Thus we should have some few species identically the same in the northern and southern temperate zones, and on the mountains of the intermediate tropical regions. But the species left during a long time on these mountains, or in opposite hemispheres, would have to compete with many new forms, and would be exposed to somewhat different physical conditions. Hence they would be eminently liable to modification, and would generally now exist as varieties, or as representative species, and this is the case. We must also bear in mind the occurrence in both hemispheres of former glacial periods, for these will account, in accordance with the same principles, for the many quite distinct species inhabiting the same widely separated areas, and belonging to genera not now found in the intermediate torrid zones. It is a remarkable fact, strongly insisted on by Hooker in regard to America, and by Alphonse de Candolle in regard to Australia, that many more identical or slightly modified species have migrated from the north to the south than in a reversed direction. We see, however, a few southern forms on the mountains of Borneo and Abyssinia. I suspect that this preponderant migration from the north to the south is due to the greater extent of land in the north, and to the northern forms having existed in their own homes in greater numbers, and having consequently been advanced through natural selection and competition to a higher stage of perfection or dominating power than the southern forms. And thus, when the two sets became commingled in the equatorial regions during the alternations of the glacial periods, the northern forms were the more powerful, and were able to hold their places on the mountains, and afterwards migrate southwards with the southern forms, but not so the southern in regard to the northern forms. In the same manner, at the present day, we see that very many European productions cover the ground in La Plata, New Zealand, and, to a lesser degree, in Australia, and have beaten the natives, whereas extremely few southern forms have become naturalized in any part of the northern clemisphere, though hides, wool, and other objects likely to carry seeds have been largely imported to Europe during the last two or three centuries from La Plata, and during the last forty or fifty years from Australia. The Nilgiri Mountains in India, however, offer a partial exception, for here, as I hear from Dr. Hooker, Australian forms are rapidly sowing themselves and becoming naturalized. Before the last great glacial period, no doubt the intertropical mountains were stocked with more endemic alpine forms, but these have almost everywhere yielded to the more dominant forms generated in the larger areas and more efficient workshops of the north. In many islands the native productions are nearly equaled or even outnumbered by those which have become naturalized, and this is the first step toward their extinction. Mountains are islands on the land, and their inhabitants have yielded to those produced within the larger areas of the north, just in the same way as the inhabitants of real islands have everywhere yielded, and are still yielding, 
to continental forms naturalized through man's agency. The same principles apply to the distribution of terrestrial animals and to marine productions. In the northern and southern temperate zones, and on the intertropical mountains. When, during the height of the glacial period, the ocean currents were widely different from what they are now, some of the inhabitants of the temperate seas might have reached the equator. Of these, a few would, perhaps, at once be able to migrate southwards, by keeping to the cooler currents, while others might remain and survive in the colder depths, until the southern hemisphere was in its turn subjected to a glacial climate and permitted their further progress, in nearly the same manner as, according to Forbes, isolated species inhabited by Arctic productions exist to the present day in the deeper parts of the northern temperate seas. I am far from supposing that all the difficulties in regard to the distribution and affinities of the identical and allied species, which now live so widely separated in the north and south, and sometimes on the intermediate mountain ranges, are removed on the views above given. The exact lines of migration cannot be indicated. We cannot say why certain species and not others have migrated, why certain species have been modified and have given rise to new forms, while others have remained unaltered. We cannot hope to explain such facts until we can say why one species and not another becomes naturalized by man's agency in a foreign land, why one species ranges twice or thrice as far, and is twice or thrice as common as other species within their own homes. Various special difficulties also remain to be solved. For instance, the occurrence, as shown by Dr. Hooker, of the same plants so enormously remote as Kerguelen Land in New Zealand and Fuegia, but icebergs, as suggested by Lyell, might have been concerned in their dispersal. The existence at these and other distant points of the southern hemisphere of species which, though distinct, belong to genera exclusively confined to the south, is a more remarkable case. Some of these species are so distinct that we cannot suppose that there has been a time since the commencement of the last glacial period for their migration and subsequent modification to the necessary degree. These facts seem to indicate that distinct species belonging to the same genera have migrated in radiating lines from a common center, and I am inclined to look in the southern as in the northern hemisphere to a former and warmer period, before the commencement of the last glacial period, when the Antarctic lands, now covered with ice, supported a highly peculiar and isolated flora. It may be suspected that before this flora was exterminated during the last glacial epoch, a few forms had been already widely dispersed to various points of the southern hemisphere by occasional means of transport, and by the aid as halting places of now sunken islands. Thus the southern shores of America, Australia, and New Zealand might have become slightly tinted by the same peculiar forms of life. Sir C. Lyell, in a striking passage, has speculated, in language almost identical with mine, on the effects of great alternations of climate throughout the world on geographic distribution. And we have now seen that Mr. Kroll's conclusion that successive glacial periods in the one hemisphere coincide with warmer periods in the opposite hemisphere, together with the admission of the slow modification of species, explains a multitude of facts in the distribution of the same and of allied forms of life in all parts of the globe. The living waters have flowed during one period from the north and during another from the south, and in both cases have reached the equator. But the stream of life has flowed with greater force from the north than in the opposite direction, and has consequently more freely inundated the south. As the tide leaves its drift in horizontal lines, rising higher on the shores where the tide rises highest, 
so have the living waters left their living drift on our mountain summits, in a line gently rising from the Arctic lowlands to a great latitude under the equator. The various beings thus left stranded may be compared with savage races of man, driven up and surviving in the mountain fastness of almost every land, which serves as a record, full of interest to us, of the former inhabitants of the surrounding lowlands. So ends chapter 12 of The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin.